the Mabbott Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will the wisps and danger signals, rows of grimy houses with gaping doors, rare lamps with faint rainbow fins, round Rabbiotti's halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coral and copper snow. Sucking, they scatter slowly. Children, the swan comb of the gondola, high-reared, forges on through the mark, white and blue under a lighthouse. Whistles call and answer. The calls, wait, my love, and I'll be with you. The answers, round behind the stable. A deaf-mute idiot with goggle eyes, his shapeless mouth dribbling, jerks past, shaken in St. Vitus' dance. A chain of children's hands imprisons him. The children, Catog, salute. The idiot lifts a palsied left arm and gurgles, Grout. The children, where's the great light? The idiot, gobbing, Gagahest. They release him. He jerks on. A pygmy woman swings on a rope, slung between two railings, counting. A form sprawled against a dustbin and muffled by its arm and hat snores, groans, grinding, growling teeth, and snores again. On a step, a gnome, totting among a rubbish tip, crouches to shoulder a sack of rags and bones. A crone standing by with a smoky oil lamp rams her last bottle in the maw of his sack. He heaves his booty, tugs askew his peaked cap, and hobbles off mutely. The crone makes back for her lair, swaying her lamp. A bandy child, a squat on the doorstep with a paper shuttlecock, crawls sidling after her in spots, clutches her skirt, scrambles up. A drunken navvy grips with both hands the railings of an area, lurching heavily. At a comer, two night watch in shoulder capes, their hands upon their staff holsters, loom tall. A plate crashes. A woman screams, a child wails. Oaths of a man roar, mutter, cease. Figures wander, lurk, peer from warrens. In a room lit by a candle stuck in a bottleneck, a slut combs out the tats on the hair of a scrofulous child. Sissy Caffrey's voice, still young, sings shrill from a lane. Sissy Caffrey, I gave it to Molly because she was jolly, the leg of the dock, the leg of the dock. Private Care and Private Compton, swagger sticks tight in their oxters as they march unsteadily right about face and burst together from their mouths a volley fart. Laughter of men from the lane. A horse virago retorts. The virago. Signs on you, hairy arse. More power the cavern, girl. Sissy Caffrey. More look to me. Cavern, Cootill and Bell Turbot. She sings. I gave it to Nelly to stick in her belly, the leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Private Care and Private Compton turn and counter-retort, their tunics blood-bright in a lamp glow, black sockets of caps on their blonde cropped poles. Stephen Dedalus and Lynch pass through the crowd close to the redcoats. Private Compton jerks his finger. Way for the parson, Private Care, turns and calls. What ho, parson? Sissy Caffrey, her voice soaring higher. She has it, she got it, wherever she put it, the leg of the duck. Stephen, flourishing the ash plant in his left hand, chants with joy the introit for Pascal time. Lynch, his jockey cap low on his brow, attends him, a sneer of discontent wrinkling his face. Stephen, vidi aquam egredientem de templo alatere dextro, alleluia! The famished snaggle tusks of an elderly bard protrude from a doorway. The board, her voice whispering huskily, Sst, come here till I tell you. Maidenhead inside. Sst. Stephen, altius aliquantulum, et omnes ad quos prevened aqua ista. The board spits in their trail her jets of venom. Trinity medicals, fallopian tube, all prick and no pence. Edie Boardman, sniffing, crouched with Bertha Supple, draws her shawl across her nostrils. Edie Boardman, bickering, and says the one, I seen you up faithful place with your square pusher, the greaser off the railway, in his come-to-bed hat. 
Did you, says I? That's not for you to say, says I. You've never seen me in the man trap with the married Highlander, says I. The likes of her! Stag, that one is! Stubborn as a mule! And her walking with two fellas the one time, Kilbride the engine driver and Lance Carpel Oliphant. Stephen, triumphalator, salvi facti sunt. He flourishes his ash plant, shivering the lamp image, shattering light over the world. A liver and white spaniel on the prowl slinks after him, growling. Lynch scares it with a kick. Lynch. So that. Stephen looks behind, so that gesture, not music, not odor, would be a universal language, the gift of tongues rendering visible not the lay sense, but the first entelechy, the structural rhythm. Lynch. Pornosophical philotheology, metaphysics in Mecklenburg Street. Stephen, we have shrew written Shakespeare and hen pecked Socrates. Even the all wisest staggerite was bittered, bridled, and mounted by a light of love. Lynch, bah. Stephen, anyway. Who wants two gestures to illustrate a loaf and a jug? This movement illustrates the loaf and jug of bread or wine in Omar. Hold my stick. Lynch, damn your yellow stick. Where are we going? Stephen, lecherous links to la belle dame sans merci. Georgina Johnson, a damn queen letificat juventutum meum. Stephen thrusts the ash plant on him and slowly holds out his hands, his head going back till both hands are a span from his breast, down in planes intersecting, the fingers about to part, the left being higher. Lynch, which is the jug of bread? It skills not. That or the custom house. Illustrate thou. Here, take your crutch and walk. They pass. Tommy Caffrey scrambles to a gas lamp and, clasping, climbs in spasms. From the top spar he slides down. Jack Caffrey clasps to climb. The navvy lurches against the lamp. The twins scuttle off in the dark. The navvy, swaying, presses a forefinger against a wing of his nose and ejects from the father nostril a long liquid jet of snot. Shouldering the lamp, he staggers away through the crowd with his flaring cresses. Snakes of river fog creep slowly. From drains, clefts, cesspools, middens... Arise on all sides stagnant fumes. A glow leaps in the south beyond the seaward reaches of the river. The navvy, staggering forward, cleaves the crowd and lurches towards the tram siding on the farther side. Under the railway bridge, Bloom appears, flushed, panting, cramming bread and chocolate into a side pocket. From Gillen's hairdresser's window, a composite portrait shows him gallant Nelson's image. A concave mirror at the side presents to him love lorn, long lost, lugu bru bu lu hoom. Grave Gladstone sees him level, bloom for bloom. He passes, struck by the stare of truculent Wellington, but in the convex mirror, grin unstruck the bonomize and fat chuck cheek chops of jolly Paldi the rick stick staldi. At Antonio Pabayotti's door, bloom halts, sweated under the bright arc lamp. He disappears. In a moment he reappears and hurries on. Bloom. Fish and theatres. N. G. Ah! He disappears into Allhausen's, the pork butchers, under the downcoming roll shutter. A few moments later he emerges from under the shutter, puffing Paldi, blowing blue whom. In each hand he holds a parcel, one containing a lukewarm pig's crubine, the other a cold sheep's trotter sprinkled with whole pepper. He gasps, standing upright. Then, bending to one side, he presses a parcel against his ribs and groans. Bloom, stitch in my side. Why did I run? He takes breath with care and goes forward slowly towards the lamp-set siding. The glow leaps again. Bloom, what is that? A flasher? Such light. He stands at Cormac's corner watching. Bloom, aurora borealis, or a steel foundry, at the brigade, of course. South side, anyhow. Big blaze. Might be his house. Beggar's bush. We're safe. He hums cheerfully. London's burning, London's burning. On fire, on fire. He catches sight of the navvy lurching through the crowd at the farther side of Talbot Street. I'll miss him. Run. Quick. Better cross here. He darts to cross the road. 
urchins shout. The urchins, Mind out, mister! Two cyclists, with lighted paper lanterns a-swing, swim by him, grazing him, their bells rattling. The bells, Halt, yalt, yalt, yalt! Bloom, halts erect, stung by a spasm. Oh! He looks round, darts forward suddenly, through rising fog, a dragon sand strewer, travelling at caution, slews heavily down upon him, its huge red headlight winking, its trolley hissing on the wire. The motorman bangs his foot gong. The gong, bang, bang, blah, back, blood, bug, blue. The brake cracks violently. Bloom, raising a policeman's white-gloved hand, blunders stiff-legged out of the track. The motorman, thrown forward, pug-nosed on the guide wheel, yells as he slides past over chains and keys. The motorman, hey, shit, bitches, are you down the hat trick? Bloom, Bloom, trick leaps to the corpstone and halts again. He brushes a mud flake from his cheek with a parceled hand. No thoroughfare. Close shaved that, but cured the stitch. Must take up Sandow's exercises again. On the hands down, insure against street accident too. The providential, he feels his trouser pocket. Poor mamma's panacea. He'll easily catch in track or bootlace in a cog. Day the wheel of the black Maria peeled off my shoe at Leonard's corner. Third time is the charm. Shoe trick. Insolent driver. I ought to report him. Tension makes them nervous. Might be the fellow balked me this morning with that horsey woman. Same style of beauty. Quick of him all the same. The stiff walk. Through words spoken in jest. That awful cramp in Lad Lane. Something poisonous I ate. Emblem of luck. Why? Probably lost cattle. Mark of the beast. He closes his eyes an instant. Bit light in the head. Monthly are effect of the other. Brain fog fag. That tired feeling. Too much for me now. Oh! A sinister figure leans on plaited legs against O'Burden's wall. A visage unknown, injected with dark mercury. From under a wide-leaved sombrero, the figure regards him with evil eye. Bloom. Buenas noches, senorita Blanca. Que calle es esta? The figure, impassive, raises a signal arm. Password. Stride, Mabbot. Bloom. Ha ha. Merci. Esperanto. Slanlat. He mutters. Gaelic League spy sent by that fire eater. He steps forward. A sack shouldered ragman bars his path. He steps left. Rag sack man left. Bloom. I beg. He swerves, sidles, step aside, slips past, and on. Bloom. Keep to the right, right, right. If there is a signpost planted by the touring club, but step aside, who procured that public boon? I who lost my way and contributed to the columns of the Irish cyclist, the letter headed, in darkest step aside. Keep, keep, keep to the right. Rags and bones at midnight. A fence, more likely. First place or makes for... Wash off his sins of the world. Jackie Caffrey, hunted by Tommy Caffrey, runs full tilt against Bloom. Bloom? Oh! Shocked on weak hams, he halts. Tommy and Jackie vanish there, there. Bloom pats with parceled hands, watch, fob pocket, book pocket, purse pocket, sweets of sin, potato soap. Bloom, beware of pickpockets. Old thieves dodge, collide, then snatch your purse. The retriever approaches, sniffing, nose to the ground. A sprawled form sneezes. A stooped, bearded figure appears garbed in the long caftan of an elder in Zion, and a smoking cap with magenta tassels. Horn spectacles hang down at the wings of the nose. Yellow poison streaks are on the drawn face. Rudolph. Second half crown waste money today. I told you not to go with drunken guy ever. So you catch no money? Bloom hides the crubeen and trother behind his back, and crestfallen feels warm and cold feet meet. Ja, ich weiß, Papachi. Rudolph, what you making down this place? Have you no soul? With feeble vulture talons he feels the silent face of Bloom. Are you not my son Leopold, the grandson of Leopold? Are you not my dear son Leopold, who left the house of his father and left the god of his fathers, Abraham and Jacob? Bloom, with precaution. I suppose so, father. 
Mosenthal. All that's left of him. Rudolph, severely. One night they bring you home drunk as dog after spend your good money. What you call them running chaps? Bloom, in youth's smart blue Oxford suit with white vest slips, narrow shouldered in brown alpine hat, wearing gents sterling silver waterbury, keyless watch, and double carb albert with seal attached, one side of him coated with stiffening mud. Harriers, father. Only that once. Rudolph, once? Mud head to foot. Cut your hand open, lock jaw, they make you kaput, Leop, old Leban. You watch them chaps. Bloom, weakly. They challenged me to a sprint. It was muddy. I slipped. Rudolph, with contempt. Goyim notches. Nice spectacles for your poor mother. Bloom. Mama. Ellen Bloom. In pantomime dame stringed mob cap, widow twankies crinoline and bustle, blouse with mutton leg sleeves, buttoned behind, grey mittens and cameo brooch, her plaited hair in a crispy net, appears over the staircase banisters, a slanted candlestick in her hand, and cries out in shrill alarm, Oh, blessed Redeemer, what have they done to him? My smelling salts! She hauls up a reef of skirt and ransacks the pouch of her striped blay petticoat. A file, an Agnus Dei, a shriveled potato, and a celluloid doll fall out. Sacred heart of Mary, where were you at all at all? Bloom, mumbling, his eyes downcast, begins to bestow his parcels in his filled pockets, but desists, muttering. A voice, sharply, Paldi! Bloom, who? He ducks and wards off a blow clumsily. At your service. He looks up. Beside her mirage of date palms, a handsome woman in Turkish costume stands before him. Opulent curves fill out her scarlet trousers and jacket, slashed with gold. A wide yellow cummerbund girdles her. A white yashmak, violet in the night, covers her face, leaving free only her large dark eyes and raven hair. Bloom. Molly. Marion. Welly. Mrs. Marion, from this out, my dear man, when you speak to me, satirically, has poor little hobby cold feet waiting so long. Bloom shifts from foot to foot. No, no, not the least little bit. He breathes in deep agitation, swallowing gulps of air, questions, hopes, crubines for her supper, things to tell her, excuse, desire, spellbound. A coin gleams on her foreheads. On her feet are jewelled toe-rings. Her ankles are linked by a slender feather chain. Beside her a camel, hooded with a turreting turban, waits. A silk ladder of innumerable rungs climbs to his bobbing howdah. He ambles near with disgruntled hind quarters. Fiercely she slaps his haunch, her gold curb wrist bangles, angrilling, scolding him in Moorish. Marion, the bracketa, femininum. The camel, lifting a foreleg, plucks from a tree a large mango fruit, offers it to his mistress, blinking in his cloven hoof, then droops his head and, grunting with uplifted neck, fumbles to kneel. Bloom stoops his back for leapfrog. Bloom, I can give you... I mean as your business manager, Mrs. Marion, if you... Marion, so you notice some change... Her hands passing slowly over her trinketed stomacher, a slow, friendly mockery in her eyes. Oh, Paldi, Paldi, you are a poor old stick in the mud. Go and see life. See the wide world. Bloom, I was just going back for that lotion white wax, orange flower water. Shop closes early on Thursday, but the first thing in the morning. He pats divers' pockets. This moving kidney. Ah! Oh! He pints to the south, then to the east. A cake of new, clean lemon soap arises, diffusing light and perfume. The soap. Where a capital couple are bloom and I, he brightens the earth, I polish the sky. The freckled face of Sweeney, the druggist, appears in the disc of the soap sun. Sweeney, three and a penny, please. Bloom, yes, for my wife. Mrs. Marion, special recipe. Marion, softly. Poldy. Bloom, yes, ma'am. Marion. Ti tremo un poco il cuore. In disdain she saunters away, plump as a pampered powder pigeon, humming the duet from Don Giovanni. Bloom, are you sure about that voglio? I mean the pronunciation. 
He follows, followed by the sniffing terrier. The elderly bawd seizes his sleeve, the bristles of her chin mole glittering. The bawd, ten shillings a maidenhead, fresh thing was never touched, fifteen. There's no one in it, only her old father that's dead drunk. She points. In the gap of her dark den, furtive, rain-bedraggled, Brady Kelly stands. Brady, Hatch Street, any good in your mind? With a squeak she flaps her bat shawl and runs. A burly rough pursues with booted strides. He stumbles on the steps, recovers, plunges into gloom. Weak squeaks of laughter are heard weaker. The bawd, her wolf eyes shining, he's getting his pleasure. You won't get a virgin in the flash, houses. Ten shillings. Don't be all night before the polis in plain clothes sees us. Sixty-seven is a bitch. Leering, Gertie McDowell limps forward. She draws from behind, ogling, and shows coyly her bloodied clout. Gertie, with all my worldly goods I thee and thou, she murmurs, You did that. I hate you. Bloom, I? When? You're dreaming. I never saw you. The bawd, leave the gentleman alone, you cheat. Writing the gentleman false letters, street walking and soliciting. Better for your mother take the strap to you at the bedpost, hussy like you. Gertie, to Bloom, when you saw all the secrets of my bottom drawer. She paws his sleeve, slobbering. Thirty married man, I love you for doing that to me. She glides away, crookedly. Mrs. Breen, in man's frieze overcoat with loose bellows pockets, stands in the causeway, her roguish eyes wide open, smiling in all her herbiferous buck teeth. Mrs. Breen, Mr. Bloom, coughs gravely. Madam, when we last had this pleasure by letter dated the sixteenth instant, Mrs. Breen, Mr. Bloom, you down here in the haunts of sin, I caught you nicely, scamp. Bloom, horridly, not so loud my name. Whatever do you think of me? Don't give me away. Walls have ears. How do you do? It's ages since I... You're looking splendid. Absolutely it. Seasonable weather we are having this time of year. Black refracts heat. Short cut home here. Interesting quarter. Rescue of fallen women. Magdalen Asylum. I am the secretary. Mrs. Breen holds up a finger. Now don't tell a big fib. I know somebody won't like that. Or oh, just wait till I see Molly. Slyly. Account for yourself this very sminish or woe betide you. Bloom looks behind. She often said she'd like to visit. Slumming, the exotic, you see. Negro servants in livery, too, if she had money. Othello, black brute. Eugene Stratton. Even the Bones and Corner Man at the Livermore Christie's. Bohe brothers sweep, for that matter. Tom and Sam Bohe, coloured coons in white duck suits, scarlet socks, upstart Sambo chokers and large scarlet astros in their buttonholes leap out. Each has his banjo slung. Their paler, smaller, negroid hands jingle the twing-twang wires. Flashing white kaffir eyes and tusks, they rattle through a breakdown in clumsy clogs, twinging, singing, back-to-back, toe-heel-heel-toe, with smack-fat clacking nigger lips. Tom and Sam, there's someone in the house with Dinah, there's someone in the house I know, there's someone in the house with Dinah, playing on the old banjo. They whisk black masks from raw, babby faces, then chuckling, chortling, thrumming, twanging, they diddle, diddle, cakewalk, dance away. Bloom, with a sour, tenderish smile, a little frivol, shall we, if you are so inclined? Would you like me perhaps to embrace you just for a fraction of a second? Mrs. Breen screams gaily. Oh, you rook! You ought to see yourself. Bloom, for old sake's sake. I only meant a square party, a mixed marriage mingling of our different little conjugials. You know I had a soft corner for you. Gloomily, twas I sent you that valentine of the dear gazelle. Mrs. Breen, glory, Alice, you do look a holy show. Killing simply. She puts out her hand inquisitively. What are you hiding behind your back? Tell us, there's a dear. Bloom seizes her wrist with his free hand. Josie Powell that was, prettiest Deb in Dublin. How time flies by. Do you remember harking back in a retrospective arrangement, old Christmas night, Georgina Simpson's housewarming while they were playing the Irving Bishop game, finding the pin blindfold and through treading? 
Subject, what is in this snuff-box? Mrs. Breen, you were the lion of the night with your serio-comic recitation, and you looked the part. You were always a favourite with the ladies. Bloom, squire of dames, in dinner jacket with wathered silk facings, blue masonic badge in his buttonhole, black bow and mother of pearl studs, a prismatic champagne glass tilted in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ireland, home and beauty. Mrs. Breen, the dear dead days beyond recall, love's old sweet song. Bloom, meaningfully dropping his voice, I confess I'm teapot with curiosity to find out whether some person something is a little teapot at present. Mrs. Breen, gushingly, tremendously teapot, London's teapot, and I'm simply teapot all over me. She rubbed sides with them. After the pallor mystery games and the crackers from the tree, we sat on the staircase ottoman, under the mistletoe. Two is company. Bloom, wearing a purple Napoleon hat with an amber half-moon, his fingers and thumb passing slowly down to her soft, moist, meaty palm, which she surrenders gently. The witching hour of night. I took the splinter out of this hand, carefully, slowly, tenderly as he slips on her finger a ruby ring. La ci darem la mano. Mrs. Breen, in a one-piece evening frock executed in moonlight blue, a tinsel sylph's diadem on her brow with her dance card fallen beside her moon-blue satin slipper, curves her palm softly, breathing quickly. Voglio e non. You're hot, you're scalding, the left hand nearest the heart. Bloom, when you made your present choice, they said it was beauty and the beast. I can never forgive you for that. His clenched fist at his brow. Think what it means. All you meant to me then. Hoarsely. Woman, it's breaking me. Dennis Breen, white, tall, hatted, with Wisdom Healy's sandwich boards, shuffles past them in carpet slippers, his dull beard thrust out, muttering to right and left. Little Alf Bergen, cloaked in the pall of the ace of spades, dogs him to left and right, doubled in laughter. Alf Bergen, Pints jeering at the sandwich boards. You pee up. Mrs. Breen to Bloom. High jinks below stairs. She gives him the glad eye. Why didn't you kiss the spot to make it well? You wanted to. Bloom, shocked. Molly's best friend. Could you? Mrs. Breen, her pulpy tongue between her lips, offers a pigeon kiss. Mm-hmm. The answer is a lemon. Have you a little present for me there? Bloom, off-handedly, kosher. A snack for supper. The home without potted meat is incomplete. I was at Leia, Mrs. Bandman Palmer, trenchant exponent of Shakespeare. Unfortunately threw away the program, rattling good place round there for pig's feet. Feel. Richie Goulding, three ladies' hats pinned on his head, appears weighted to one side by the black legal bag of Collis and Ward, on which a skull and crossbones are painted in white lime wash. He opens it and shows it full of polonies, kippered herrings, Findon haddies, and tight-packed pills. Richie, best value in dub. Bald Pat, bothered beetle, stands on the corpstone, folding his napkin, waiting to wait. Pat, advances with a tilted dish of spill-spilling gravy. Steak and kidney, bottle of lager. <laughs> wait till I wait. Richie, good God, in Everett in all. With hanging head, he marches doggedly forward. The navvy, lurching by, gores him with his flaming pronghorn. Richie, with a cry of pain, his hand to his cheek. Ah, oh, brights, lights. Bloom points to the navvy, a spy. Don't attract attention. I hate stupid crowds. I am not on pleasure bent. I am in a grave predicament. Mrs. Breen. Humbugging and deluthering as per usual with your cock and bull story. Bloom, I want to tell you a little secret about how I came to be here. But you must never tell. Not even Molly. I have a most particular reason. Mrs. Breen, all agog. Oh, not for worlds. Bloom, let's walk on. Shall us? Mrs. Breen, let's. The board makes an unheeded sign. Bloom walks on with Mrs. Breen. The terrier follows, whining piteously, wagging his tail. The board, Jew man's melt. Bloom, in an oatmeal sporting suit, a sprig of woodbine in the lapel, 
Tony, buff, short, shepherds, plaids and andrews, cross, scarf tie, white spats, fawn dust coat on his arm, tawny red brogues, field glasses in bandolier and a grey billycock hat. Do you remember a long, long time, years and years ago, just after Millie, Marionette, we called her, was weaned, when we all went together to fairy house races, was it? Mrs. Breen, in smart sacks, tailor-made, white velours, hat, and spider veil, Leopardstown, Bloom, I mean Leopardstown, and Molly won seven shillings on a three-year-old named Never Tell, and coming home along by Fox Rock in that old five-seater shanderadden of a wagonette you were in your heyday then, and you had on that new hat of white velours with a surround of mole for that Mr. Hayes advised you to buy, because it was marked down to nineteen and eleven, a bit of wire and an old rag of velveteen, and I'll lay you what you like, she did it on purpose. Mrs. Breen, she did, of course, the cat. Don't tell me. Nice adviser. Bloom, because it didn't suit you one quarter as well as the other ducky little tammy toque with the bird of paradise wing in it that I admired on you, and you honestly looked just too fetching in it, though it was a pity to kill it, you cruel naughty creature, little mite of a thing with a heart the size of a full stop. Mrs. Breen squeezes his arm, simpers, naughty cruel I was. Bloom, low, secretly, ever more rapidly, and Molly was eating a sandwich of spiced beef out of Mrs. Joe Gallagher's lunch basket. Frankly, though she had her advisers or admirers, I never cared much for her style. She was, Mrs. Breen, too, Bloom, yes. And Molly was laughing because Rogers and Maggot O'Reilly were mimicking a cock as we passed a farmhouse, and Marcus Tertius Moses, the tea merchant, drove past us in a gig with his daughter, Dancer, Moses was her name, and the poodle in her lap bridled up, and you asked me if I ever heard or read or knew or came across. Mrs. Breen, eagerly, yes, 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 yes. She fades from his side. Followed by the whining dog, he walks on towards Hell's gates. In an archway, a standing woman, bent forward, her feet apart, pisses cowily. Outside a shuttered pub, a bunch of loiterers listen to a tale which their broken-snouted gaffer rasps out with raucous humour. An armless pair of them flop, wrestling, growling in maimed, sodden play-fight. The gaffer crouches, his voice twisted in his snout. And when Cairns came down from the scaffolding in Beaver Street, what was he after doing it into only into the bucket of porter that was there waiting on the shavings for Darwin's plasterers? The lighterers guffaw with cleft pallets. Oh, jeez! Their paint-speckled hats wag, spattered with size and lime of their lodges they frisk limblessly about him. Bloom. Coincidence, too. They think it funny. Anything but that. Broad daylight, trying to walk. Lucky no woman. The loiterers. Jeez, that's a good one. Glober salts. Oh, jeez, into the men's pauper. Bloom passes. Cheap whores, singly, coupled, shawled, disheveled, call from lanes, doors, corners. The whores. Are you going far, queer fella? How's your middle leg? Got a match on you? Eh, hey, come here till I stiffen it for you. He plodges through their sump towards the lighted street beyond. From a bulge of window curtains, a gramophone rears a battered brazen trunk. In the shadow, a shabine keeper haggles with the navvy and the two redcoats. The navvy, belching. Where's the bloody house? The shabine keeper, Porton Street, shilling a bottle of stout, respectable woman. The navvy, gripping the two redcoats, staggers forward with them. Come on, you British army! Private car, behind his back. He ain't half balmy. Private Compton, laughs. What ho? Private car, to the navvy. Portobello Barracks Canteen, you ask for car. Just car. The navvy, shouts. We are the boys of Wexford. Private Compton, say, what price the sergeant major? Private car, Bennett, he's my pal. I love old Bennett. The navvy, shouts. The galling chain, and free our native land. He staggers forward, dragging them with him. Bloom stops at fault. The dog approaches, his tongue out lolling, panting. Bloom. Wild goose chase this. 
disorderly houses, Lord knows where they are gone. Drunks cover distance double quick, nice mix up, seen at Westland Row. Then jump in first class with third ticket, then too far, train with engine behind. Might have taken me to Malahide or a siding for the night or collision. Second drink does it, once is a dose. What am I following him for? Still, he's the best of that lot. If I hadn't heard about Mrs. Bowfy Purefy, I wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have met. Kismet. He'll lose that cash. Relieving office here. Good biz for cheap jacks. Organs. What do ye lack? Soon got, soon gone. Might have lost my life, too, with that man-gong, wheel track trolley glare juggernaut only for presence of mind. Can't always save you, though. If I had passed through Locke's window that day, two minutes later would have been shot. Absence of body. Still, if bullet only went through my coat, get damages for shock, five hundred pounds. What was he? Kildare Street Club Tough. God help his gamekeeper. He gazes ahead, reading on the wall a scrawled chalk legend, wet dream, and a phallic design. Odd. Molly drawing on the frosted carriage pane at Kingstown. What's that like? Gaudy, dull women lull in the lighted doorways, in window embrasures, smoking bird's-eye cigarettes. The odour of the sick sweet weed floats towards him in slow round ovaling reeds. The reeds, sweet are the sweets, sweets of sin. Bloom, my spine's a bit limp. Go, or pardon. And this food? Eat it and get all pigs sticky. Absurd I am, waste of money. One and eightpence too much. The retriever drives a cold, snivelling muzzle against his hand, wagging his tail. Strange how they take to me. Even that brute today. Better speak to him first. Like women, they like rencontre. Stinks like a polecat. Chacon, son go. He might be mad. Dog days. Uncertain in his movements. Good fellow. Fido, good fellow. Carry on. The wolf-dog sprawls on his back, wriggling obscenely with begging paws, his long black tongue lolling out. Influence of his surroundings. Give and have done with it, provided nobody... Calling encouraging words, he shambles back with a furtive poacher's tread, dogged by the setter into a dark, stale, stunk corner. He unrolls one parcel and goes to dump the crubeen softly, but holds back and feels the trotter. Sizable for thruppence. But then I have it in my left hand. Calls for more effort. Why? Smaller from want of use. Oh, let it slide. Two and six. With regret he lets the unrolled crubeen and throtter slide. The mastiff mauls the bundle clumsily and glots himself with growling greed, crunching the bones. Two rain-capped watch approach, silent, vigilant. They murmur together. The watch. Bloom, of bloom. For Bloom, Bloom. Each lays hand on Bloom's shoulder. First watch. Caught in the act. Commit no nuisance. Bloom stammers. I am doing good to others. A covey of gulls, storm petrels, rises hungrily from liffy slime with banbury cakes in their beaks. The gulls. Caw cave, cankery cake. Bloom, the friend of man, trained by kindness. He points. Bob Dorden, toppling from a high bar stool, sways over the munching spaniel. Bob Dorden, Towser, give us the paw, give the paw. The bulldog growls, his scruff standing, a gobbet of pig's knuckle between his molars, through which rabid scum spittle dribbles. Bob Dorden fills silently into an area. Second watch, prevention of cruelty to animals. Bloom. Enthusiastically, a noble work. I scolded that tram driver on Harold's Crossbridge for ill using the poor horse with his harness scab. Bad French I got for my pains. Of course, it was frosty and the last tram. All tales of circus life are highly demoralizing. Signor Maffei, passion pale, in lion tamer's costume with diamond studs in his shirt front, steps forward, holding a circus paper hoop, a curling carriage whip and the revolver with which he covers the gorging boar-hound. Signor Maffei, with a sinister smile. Ladies and gentlemen, my educated greyhound. 
It was I broke in the bucking bronco, Ajax with my patent spiked saddle for carnivores. Lash under the belly with a knotted thong. Block, tackle, and a strangling pulley will bring your lion to heel, no matter how fractious. Even Leo Ferox there, the Libyan man-eater. A red-hot crowbar and some liniment rubbing on the burning part produced fits of Amsterdam, the thinking hyena. He glares. I possess the Indian sign. The glint of my eye does it with these breast sparklers. With a bewitching smile, I now introduce Mademoiselle Ruby, the bride of the ring. First watch. Come. Name and address. Bloom. I have forgotten for the moment. Ah, yes. He takes off his high-grade hat, saluting. Dr. Bloom, Leopold, dental surgeon. You have heard of Von Bloom Pasha? Umpteen millions? Donna Werther? Owns half Austria. Egypt. Cousin. First watch. Proof. A card falls from inside the leather headband of Bloom's hat. Bloom, in red fez, Cardi's dress coat with broad green sash, wearing a false badge of the Legion of Honor, picks up the card hastily and offers it. Allow me. My club is the Junior Army and Navy. Solicitors Messrs. John Henry Menton, 27 Bachelors Walk. First watch reads, Henry Flower, no fixed abode, unlawfully watching and besetting. Second watch, an alibi. You are cautioned. Bloom produces from his heart pocket a crumpled yellow flower. This is the flower in question. It was given me by a man I don't know his name. Plausibly, you know that old joke, Rose of Castile. Bloom, the change of name, Virag. He murmurs privately and confidentially, We are engaged, you see, Sergeant, lady in the case, love entanglement. He shoulders the second watch gently, dash it all. It's a way we gallants have in the Navy, uniform that does it. He turns gravely to the first watch. Still, of course, you do get your Waterloo sometimes. Drop in some evening and have a glass of old Burgundy. To the second watch, gaily, I'll introduce you, Inspector. She's game. Do it in the shake of a lamb's tail. A dark, mercurialized face appears, leading a veiled figure. The dark mercury. The castle is looking for him. He was drummed out of the army. Martha, thick-veiled, a crimson halter round her neck, a copy of the Irish Times in her hand, in tone of reproach, pointing. Henry! Leopold! Lionel! Thou lost one! Clear my name! First watch, sternly, come to the station. Bloom, scared, hats himself, steps back, then, plucking at his heart and lifting his right forearm on the square, he gives the sign and due guard of fellowcraft. No, no, worshipful master, light of love, mistaken identity. The lion's mail, le sourc and de basque. You remembered the child's fratricide case, we medical men, by striking him dead with the hatchet. I am wrongfully accused. Better one guilty escape than ninety-nine wrongfully condemned. Martha, sobbing behind her veil. Breach of promise. My real name is Peggy Griffin. He wrote to me that he was miserable. I'll tell my brother, the bective rugger, full back on you, heartless flirt. Bloom, behind his hand. She's drunk. The woman is inebriated. He murmurs vaguely, the pass of Ephraim, shit brolit. Second watch, tears in his eyes to Bloom. You ought to be thoroughly well ashamed of yourself. Bloom, gentlemen of the jury, let me explain. A pure mare's nest. I am a man misunderstood. I am being made a scapegoat of. I am a respectable married man without a stain on my character. I live in Eccles Street. My wife, I am the daughter of a most distinguished commander, a gallant upstanding gentleman, what do you call him, Major General Diane Tweedy, one of Britain's fighting men who helped to win our battles, got his majority for the heroic defence of Rourke's Drift. First watch. Regiment. Bloom turns to the gallery. The Royal Dublin's boys, the salt of the earth, known the world over. I think I see some old comrades in arms up there among you. The RDF, with our own metropolitan police, guardians of our homes, the pluckiest lads and the finest body of men, as physique in the service of our sovereign. A voice. Turncoat! Up the boars! Who booed Joe Chamberlain? Bloom, his hand on the shoulder of the first watch. My old dad, too, was a J.P. I'm as staunch a Britisher as you are, sir.
I fought with the colors for king and country in the absent-minded war under General Goff in the park, and was disabled at Spion Cop and Bloemfontein, was mentioned in dispatches. I did all a white man could. With quiet feeling, Jim Bloodsoe, hold her nozzle again the bank. First watch. Professional trade? Bloom. Well, I follow a literary occupation, author, journalist. In fact, we are just bringing out a collection of prize stories of which I am the inventor, something that is an entirely new departure. I am connected with the British and Irish press. If you ring up, Miles Crawford strides out jerkily, a quill between his teeth. His scarlet beak blazes within the aureole of his straw hat. He dangles a hank of Spanish onions in one hand, and holds with the other hand a telephone receiver nozzle to his ear. Miles Crawford, his cock's wattles wagging, Hello, 7784, hello, Freeman's urinal and weekly arsewipe here. Paralyze Europe. You which? Blue bags? Who writes? Is it Bloom? Mr. Philip Bofoy, pale-faced, stands in the witness box, in accurate morning dress, outbreast pocket with peak of handkerchief showing, creased lavender trousers and patent boots. He carries a large portfolio labelled Matcham's Master Strokes. Bofoy draws. No, you aren't. Not by a long shot, if I know it. I don't see it, that's all. No born gentleman, no one with the most rudimentary promptings of a gentleman would stoop to such particularly loathsome conduct. One of those, my lord, a plagiarist, a soapy sneak masquerading as a literateur. It's perfectly obvious that with the most inherent baseness he has cribbed some of my best-selling copy. Really gorgeous stuff. A perfect gem. The love passages in which are beneath suspicion. The Bofoy books of love and great possessions, with which your lordship is doubtless familiar, are a household word throughout the kingdom. Bloom murmurs with hangdog meekness, glum, that bit about the laughing which hand in hand I take exception to, if I may. Bofoy, his lips up, cuddled, smiles superciliously on the court. You funny ass, you. You're too beastly, awfully weird for words. I don't think you need over-excessively disincommodate yourself in that regard. My literary agent, Mr. J.B. Pinker, is in attendance. I presume, my lord, we shall receive the usual witnesses' fees, shan't we? We are considerably out of pocket over this belly pressman, Johnny, this jackdaw of Reims, who has not even been to a university. Bloom, indistinctly, University of Life, bad art. Bofoy shouts, It's a damnably foul lie, showing the moral rottenness of the man. He extends his portfolio. We have here jamming evidence, the corpus delicti, my lord, a specimen of my maturer work disfigured by the hornack of the beast. A voice from the gallery, Moses, Moses, king of the Jews, wiped his ass in the daily news. Bloom, bravely, overdrawn. Bofoy, you low cad, you ought to be docked in the horse pond, you rotter. To the court, why, look at the man's private life, leading a quadruple existence, street angel and house devil, not fit to be mentioned in mixed society, the arch-conspirator of the age. Bloom to the court, and he, a bachelor, how? First watch, the king versus Bloom, called the woman Driscoll. The crier, Mary Driscoll, scullery maid. Mary Driscoll, a slipshod servant girl, approaches. She has a bucket on the crook of her arm and a scouring brush in her hand. Second watch. Another. Are you of the unfortunate class? Mary Driscoll, indignantly. I'm not a bad one. I bear a respectable character and was four months in my last place. I was in a situation, six pounds a year and my chances with Friday's out, and I had to leave, owing to his carryings on. First watch. What do you tax him with? Mary Driscoll. He made a certain suggestion, but I thought more of myself as poor as I am. Bloom, in house jacket of rippled cloth, flannel trousers, heelless slippers, unshaven, his hair rumpled, softly. I treated you white. I gave you mementos, smart emerald garters far above your station. Incautiously I took your part when you were accused of pilfering. There is a medium in all things. Play cricket. Mary Driscoll, excitedly, as 
God is looking down on me this night if ever I laid a hand to them oysters. First watch. The offence complained of? Did something happen? Mary Driscoll. He surprised me in the rear of the premises. Your Honour, when the missus was out shopping one morning with a request for a safety pin, he held me and I was discoloured in four places as a result. And he interfered twicked with my clothing. Bloom, she counter-assaulted. Mary Driscoll, scornfully. I had more respect for the scouring brush, so I had. I remonstrated with him, your lord, and he remarked, Keep it quiet. General laughter. George Fothrell, clerk of the crown and peace, resonantly, Order in court. The accused will now make a bogus statement. Bloom, pleading not guilty and holding a full-blown water lily, begins a long, unintelligible speech. They would hear what counsel had to say in his stirring address to the grand jury. He was down and out, but, though branded as a black sheep, if he might say so, he meant to reform, to retrieve the memory of the past in a purely sisterly way and return to nature as a purely domestic animal. A seven-month's child, he had been carefully brought up and nurtured by an aged, bedridden parent. There might have been lapses of an erring father, but he wanted to turn over a new leaf. And now, when at long last, in sight of the whipping post, to lead a homely life in the evening of his days, permeated by the affectionate surroundings of the heaving bosom of the family, an acclimatized Britisher, he had seen that summer eve from the footplate of an engine cab of the Loop Line Railway Company, while the rain refrained from falling, glimpses, as it were, through the windows of loveful households in Dublin City and urban district, of scenes truly rural, of happiness of the better land, with dockerels wallpaper at one and ninepence a dozen, innocent British-born bairns lisping prayers to the sacred infant, youthful scholars grappling with their pensums, or model young ladies playing on the pianoforte, or anon all with fervour reciting the family rosary round the crackling yule log, while in the boreens and green lanes the colleens with their swains strolled what times the strains of the organ-toned melodian Britannia metal-bound with four acting stops and a twelve-fold bellows, a sacrifice, greatest bargain ever. Renewed laughter. He mumbles incoherently. Reporters complain that they cannot hear. Long hand and short hand, without looking up from their notebooks, Lowson is boats. Professor McHugh, from the press table, coughs and calls, Cough it up, man. Get it out in bits. The cross-examination proceeds, Re Bloom and the bucket, a large bucket. Bloom himself, bowel trouble, in Beaver Street, gripe, yes, quite bad, a plasterer's bucket, by walking stiff-legged, suffered untold misery, deadly agony, about noon. Love or burgundy? Yes, some spinach. Crucial moment. He did not look in the bucket, nobody. Rather a mess, not completely. A titbit's back number. Uproar and catcalls. Bloom in a torn frock coat stained with whitewash. Dinged silk hat sideways on his head. A strip of sticking plaster across his nose. Talks inaudibly. J. J. O'Malloy, in barrister's grey wig and stuff gown, speaking with the voice of pained protest. This is no place for indecent levity at the expense of an erring mortal disguised in liquor. We are not in a bear garden, nor at an Oxford rag, nor is this a travesty of justice. My client is an infant, a poor foreign immigrant who started scratch as a stowaway, and is now trying to turn an honest penny. The trumped-up misdemeanor was due to a momentary aberration of heredity, brought on by hallucination, such familiarities as the alleged guilty occurrence being quite permitted in my client's native place, the land of the pharaoh. Prima facie, I put it to you that there was no attempt at carnally knowing. Intimacy did not occur, and the offence complained of by Driscoll, that her virtue was solicited, was not repeated. I would deal in especial with atavism. There have been cases of shipwreck and somnambulism in my client's family. If the accused could speak, he could a tale unfold. One of the strangest that have ever been narrated between the covers of a book. He himself, my lord, is a physical wreck from cobbler's weak chest. His submission is that he is of Mongolian extraction and irresponsible for his actions. Not all there, in fact. Bloom, barefoot, pigeon-breasted, in Lascar's vest and trousers, apologetic toes toddened in, opens his tiny mole's eyes and looks about him dazedly, passing a slow hand across his forehead. 
Then he hitches his belt sailor fashion, and with a shrug of oriental obeisance salutes the court, pointing one thumb heavenward. Him makey veli muchy fine night. He begins to lilt, simply, Lily poo lil chilly, blingy pigfoot every night, pay to shilly. He is howled down. J.G. O'Malley, hotly to the populace, this is a lone hand fight. By Hades, I will not have any client of mine ganged and badgered in this fashion by a pack of chorus and laughing hyenas. The Mosaic Code has superseded the law of the jungle. I say it, and I say it emphatically, without wishing for one moment to defeat the ends of justice. Accused was not accessory before the act, and prosecutrix has not been tampered with. The young person was treated by defendant as if she were his his very own daughter. Bloom takes J. J. O'Malley's hand and raises it to his lips. I shall call rebutting evidence to prove up to the hilt that the hidden hand is again at its old game. When in doubt, persecute Bloom. My client, an innately bashful man, would be the last man in the world to do anything ungentlemanly which injured modesty could object to, or cast a stone at a girl who took the wrong turning when some dastard, responsible for her condition, had worked his own sweet will on her. He wants to go straight. I regard him as the whitest man I know. He is down on his luck at present, owing to the mortgaging of his extensive property at Agandath Netaim in faraway Asia Minor, slides of which will now be shown. To Bloom, I suggest that you will do the handsome thing. Bloom, a penny in the pound. The image of the Lake of Kinnereth, with blurred cattle cropping in silver haze, is projected on the wall. Moses Dlugach. Ferretide albino, in blue dungarees, stands up in the gallery, holding in each hand an orange citron and a pork kidney. Dlugach, hoarsely. Bleibtreustrasse, Berlin W13. J. J. O'Malloy steps onto a low plinth, and holds the lapel of his coat with solemnity. His face lengthens, grows pale and bearded with sunken eyes, the blotches of phthisis and hectic cheekbones of John F. Taylor. He applies his handkerchief to his mouth and scrutinizes the galloping tide of rose-pink blood. J. J. O'Malley, almost voicelessly, Excuse me, I am suffering from a severe chill, have recently come from a sickbed. A few well-chosen words. He assumes the avine head, foxy moustache, and proboscidal eloquence of Seymour Bush. When the angel's book comes to be opened, if aught that the pensive bosom has inaugurated of soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, I say accord the prisoner at the bar the sacred benefit of the doubt. A paper with something written on it is handed into court. Bloom, in court dress, can give best references, Messrs. Callan Coleman, Mr. Wisdom Healy, J.P., my old chief, Joe Cough, Mr. V. B. Dillon, ex-Lord Mayor of Dublin, I have moved in the charmed circle of the highest Queens of Dublin society. Carelessly, I was just chatting this afternoon at the Vice-Regal Lodge to my old pals, Sir Robert and Lady Ball, Astronomer Royal at the Levy. Sir Bob, I said. Mrs. Yelverton Barry, in low-corsaged opal ball dress and elbow-length ivory gloves, wearing a sable-trimmed, brick-quilted dolman, a comb of brilliance and panache of osprey in her hair. Arrest him, constable. He wrote me an anonymous letter in Prentice backhand when my husband was in the north riding of Tipperary on the Munster circuit, signed James Lovebarch. He said that he had seen from the gods my peerless globes as I sat in a box of the Theatre Royal at a command performance of La Cigale. I deeply inflamed him, he said. He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself at half past four p.m. on the following Thursday. Done sink time. He offered to send me through the post a work of fiction by Monsieur Paul de Coq, entitled The Girl with the Three Pairs of Stays. Mrs. Bellingham, in cap and seal coney mantle, wrapped up to the nose, steps out of her brougham and scans through tortoiseshell quizzing glasses, which she takes from inside her huge opossum muff. 
also to me. Yes, I believe it is the same objectionable person, because he closed my carriage door outside Sir Thornley Stoker's one sleety day, during the cold snap of February 93, when even the grid of the waste pipe and the ball stop in my bath cistern were frozen. Subsequently, he enclosed a bloom of edelweiss, culled on the heights, as he said, in my honor. I had it examined by a botanical expert, and elicited the information that it was a blossom of of the home-grown potato plant purloined from a forcing case of the model farm. Mrs. Yelverton Barry, shame on him! A crowd of sluts and ragamuffins surges forward. The sluts and ragamuffins, screaming, Stop, thief! Hurrah there, Bluebeard! Three cheers for Ikey Bow! Second watch produces handcuffs. Here are the derbies. Mrs. Bellingham, he addressed me in several handwritings with fulsome compliments as a Venus in furs, and alleged profound pity for my frost-bound coachman Palmer, while in the same breath he expressed himself as envious of his ear-flaps and fleecy sheepskins, and of his fortunate proximity to my person, when standing behind my chair wearing my livery and the armorial bearings of the Bellingham escutcheon, garnished sable, a buck's head cooped or. He lauded almost extravagantly my nether extremities, my swelling calves in silk hose drawn up to the limit, and eulogized glowingly my other hidden treasures in priceless lace, which, he said, he could conjure up. He urged me, stating that he felt it his mission in life to urge me to defile the marriage bed, to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, in Amazon costume, hard hat, jack boots, cockspurred, vermilion waistcoat, fawn musketeer gauntlets with braided drums, long train held up, and hunting crop with which she strikes her welt constantly. Also me, because he saw me on the polo ground of the Phoenix Park at the match, all Ireland versus the rest of Ireland. My eyes I now shone divinely as I watched Captain Slugger Dennehy of the Inner Skillings win the final chuckle on his darling cob centaur. This plebeian Don Juan observed me from behind a hackney car, and sent me in double envelopes an obscene photograph, such as are sold after dark on Paris boulevards, insulting to any lady. I have it still. It represents a partially nude senorita, frail and lovely, his wife, as he solemnly assured me, taken by him from nature, practicing illicit intercourse with the muscular Torero, evidently a blackguard. He urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to sin with officers of the garrison. He implored me to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner, to chastise him as he richly deserves, to bestride and ride him, to give him a most vicious horse-whipping. Mrs. Bellingham, me too. Mrs. Yelverton Barry, me too. Several highly respectable Dublin ladies hold up improper letters received from Bloom. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys stamps her jingling spurs in a sudden paroxysm of fury. I will, by the God above me, I'll scourge the pigeon-livered cur as long as I can stand over him. I'll flay him alive. Bloom, his eyes closing, quails expectantly. Here? He squirms. Again, he pants, cringing. I love the danger. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys? Very much so. I'll make it hot for you. I'll make you dance Jack Latin for that. Mrs. Bellingham? Tan his breech well, the upstart. Write the stars and stripes on it. Mrs. Yelverton Barry? Disgraceful. There's no excuse for him. A married man. Bloom? All these people... I meant only the spanking idea, a warm tingling glow without effusion, refined birching to stimulate the circulation. The Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys laughs derisively. Oh, did you, my fine fellow? Well, by the living God, you'll get the surprise of your life now, believe me, the most unmerciful hiding a man ever bargained for. You have lashed the dormant tigress in my nature into fury. Mrs. Bellingham shakes her muff and quizzing glasses vindictively. Make him smart, Hannah dear. Give him ginger. Thrash the mongrel within an inch of his life. The cat-o'-nine-tails. Geld him. Vivisect him. 
Bloom, shuddering, shrinking, joins his hands with hang-dog mean. Oh, cold, oh, shivery, it was your ambrosial beauty. Forget, forgive, kismet, let me off this once. He offers the other cheek. Mrs. Yelverton, Barry, severely, don't do so on my account, Mrs. Talboys. He should be soundly trounced. The Honourable Mrs. Marvin Talboys, unbuttoning her gauntlet violently, I'll do no such thing. Pig dog and always was, ever since he was popped, to dare address me. I'll flog him black and blue in the public streets. I'll dig my spurs in him up to the roll. He is a well-known cuckold. She swishes her hunting crop savagely in the air. Take down his tosses without loss of time. Come here, sir. Quick. Ready? Bloom, trembling, beginning to obey. The weather has been so warm. Davy Stevens, ringleted, passes with a bevy of barefoot newsboys. Davy Stevens, messenger of the Sacred Heart and Evening Telegraph with St. Patrick's Day Supplement, containing the new addresses of all the cuckolds in Dublin. The very Reverend Canon O'Hanlon, in cloth of gold cope, elevates and exposes a marble timepiece. Before him, Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes, S.J. bend low. The timepiece, unportaling, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. The brass quites of a bed are heard to jingle. The quites, jig jag, jigga jigga, jig jag. A panel of fog rolls back rapidly, revealing rapidly in the jury box the faces of Martin Cunningham, Foreman, Silk Hatted, Jack Power, Simon Dedalus, Tom Kernan, Ned Lambert, John Henry Menton, Miles Crawford, Lennon. Paddy Leonard, Nosy Flynn, Mackay, and the featureless face of a nameless one. The nameless one. Bare back riding, wait for age, gob he organized har. The jurors, all their heads turned to his voice. Really? The nameless one. Snarls. Arse over tip, hundred shillings to five. The jurors, all their heads lowered in assent. Most of us thought as much. First watch. He is a marked man. Another girl's plat caught. Wanted, Jack the Ripper, a thousand pounds reward. Second watch, awed, whispers, and in black, a Mormon, anarchist. The crier, loudly, whereas Leopold Bloom of now fixed abode is a well-known dynamite-haired forger, bigamist, bawd, and cuckold, and a public nuisance to the citizens of Dublin, and whereas at this commission of assizes the most honourable, his honour, Sir Frederick Falconer, recorder of Dublin, in judicial garb of grey stone, rises from the bench, stone-bearded. He bears in his arms an umbrella scepter. From his forehead arise starkly the mosaic ram's horns. The recorder. I will put an end to this white slave traffic, and rid Dublin of this odious pest. Scandalous. He dons the black cap. Let him be taken, Mr. Sub-Sheriff, from the dock where he now stands and detained in custody in Mountjoy Prison during His Majesty's pleasure, and there be hanged by the neck until he is dead, and therein fail not at your peril, or may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Remove him. A black skull cap descends upon his head. The Sub-Sheriff, Long John Fanning, appears, smoking a pungent Henry Clay. Long John Fanning, scowls and calls with rich rolling utterance, Who'll hang Judas Iscariot? H. Rumbold, Master Barber, in a blood-coloured jerkin and tanner's apron, a rope coiled over his shoulder, mounts the block. A life-preserver and a nail-studded bludgeon are stuck in his belt. He rubs grimly his grappling hands, knobbed with knuckle-dusters. Rumbold, to the recorder with sinister familiarity, Hang on, Harry, your majesty, the mare's eat terror. Five guineas a jugular, neck or nothing. The bells of George's church toll slowly, load dark iron. The bells, hey ho, hey ho, bloom desperately. Wait, stop. Gulls, good heart, I saw. Innocence, girl in the monkey house. Zoo, lewd chimpanzee. Breathlessly, pelvic basin, her artless blush unmanned me. Overcome with emotion, I left the precincts. He turns to a figure in the crowd, appealing, Hines, may I speak to you? You know me! That three shillings you can keep, if you want a little more. Hines, coldly, you are a perfect stranger. Second watch, points to the corner. The bomb is here. First watch, infernal machine with a time fuse. 
Bloom. No, no, pig's feet. I was at a funeral. First watch draws his truncheon. Liar! The beagle lifts his snout, showing the grey, scorbutic face of Paddy Dynam. He has gnawed all. He exhales a putrid carcass-fed breath. He grows to human size and shape. His dachshund coat becomes a brown mortuary habit. His green eye flashes bloodshot. Half of one ear, all the nose, and both thumbs are ghoul-eaten. Paddy Dignam, in a hollow voice, It is true. It was my funeral. Dr. Fenelkin pronounced life extinct when I succumbed to the disease from natural causes. He lifts his mutilated ashen face moonwards and bays lugubriously. Bloom, in triumph, You hear? Paddy Dynam. Bloom, I am Paddy Dynam, spirit. List, list, oh, list. Bloom, the voice is the voice of Esau. Second watch blesses himself. How is that possible? First watch. It is not in the penny catechism. Paddy Dynam. By metempsychosis. Spooks. A voice. Oh, rocks. Paddy Dynam. Earnestly. Once I was in the employ of Mr. J. H. Menton, solicitor, commissioner for oaths and affidavits of twenty-seven bachelors walk. Now I am defunct, the wall of the heart, hypertrophied, hard lines. The poor wife was awfully cut up. How is she bearing it? Keep her off that bottle of sherry. He looks round him. A lamp. I must satisfy an animal need. That buttermilk didn't agree with me. The portly figure of John O'Connell, caretaker, stands forth, holding a bunch of keys tied with crepe. Beside him stands Father Coffee, chaplain, toad-bellied, wry-necked, in a surplus and bandana nightcap, holding sleepily a staff, twisted poppies. Father Coffee yawns, then chants with a hoarse croak, Namine, Jechems, Vobiscuits, Amen. John O'Connell, foghorn stormily through his megaphone, Dignam, Patrick T. Deceased. Paddy Dignam, with pricked up ears, winces, overtones. He wriggles forward and places an ear to the ground. My master's voice. John O'Connell, burial docket letter number U, P. 85,000, field 17, house of keys, plot 101. Paddy Dynam listens with visible effort, thinking, his tail stiff pointed, his ears cocked. Paddy Dynam, pray for the repose of a soul. He warms down through a coal hole, his brown habit trailing its tether over rattling pebbles. After him toddles an obese grandfather rat on fungus turtle paws under a grey carapace. Dynam's voice, muffled, is heard baying underground. Dynam's dead and gone below. Tom Rochford, Robin red-breasted, in cap and breeches, jumps from his two-columned machine. Tom Rochford, a hand to his breastbone, bows. Reuben J. A florin I find him. He fixes the manhole with a resolute stare. My turn now. Follow me up to Carlo. He executes a daredevil salmon leap in the air and is engulfed in the coal hole. Two discs on the columns wobble, eyes of naught. All recedes, Bloom plodges forward again through the sump. Kisses chirp amid the rifts of fog a piano sounds. He stands before a lighted house, listening. The kisses, winging from their bowers, fly about him, twittering, warbling, cooing. The kisses, warbling, Leo twittering, Icky, licky, Mickey, sticky for Leo, cooing, coo, 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 yummy, yum, whim, whim, warbling, big cum, pig, pirouette, Leo, popold, twittering, Leo, lee, warbling, oh, Leo, they rustle, flutter upon his garments, a light, bright, giddy flecks, silvery sequins, bloom, a man's touch, Sad music, church music, perhaps here. Zoe Higgins, a young whore in a sapphire slip, closed with three bronze buckles, a slim black velvet fillet round her throat, nods, trips down the steps and accosts him. Zoe, are you looking for someone? He's inside with his friend. Bloom, is this Mrs. Max? Zoe, no, 81, Mrs. Cowens. You might go farther and fare worse. Mother Slipper Slapper.
Familiarly, she's on the job herself tonight with the vet, her tipster, that gives her all the winners and pays for her son in Oxford, working overtime, but her looks turned today. Suspiciously. You're not his father, are you? Bloom. Not I. Zoe. You're both in black. Has little Mousy any tickles tonight? His skin, alert, feels her fingertips approach. A hand glides over his left thigh. Zoe. How's the nuts? Bloom. Offside. Curiously, they are on the right. Heavier, I suppose. One in a million, my tailor messiah says. Zoe, in sudden alarm. You've a hard chanker. Bloom, not likely. Zoe, I feel it. Her hand slides into his left trouser pocket and brings out a hard, black, shriveled potato. She regards it and Bloom with dumb, moist lips. Bloom, a talisman. Heirloom. Zoe, for Zoe? For keeps? For being so nice, eh? She puts the potato greedily into a pocket, then links his arm, cuddling him with supple warmth. He smiles uneasily. Slowly, note by note, oriental music is played. He gazes in the tawny crystal of her eyes, ringed with coal. His smile softens. Zoe, you'll know me the next time. Bloom, forlornly, I never loved a dear gazelle, but it was sure to. Gazelles are leaping, feeding on the mountains, near our lakes, round their shores file shadows black of cedar groves. Aroma rises, a strong hair growth of resin. It burns, the Orient, a sky of sapphire, cleft by the bronze flight of eagles. Under it lies the woman's city nude, white, still, cool, in luxury. A fountain murmurs among damask roses, mammoth roses murmur of scarlet wine grapes. A wine of shame, lust, blood, exudes, strangely murmuring. Zoe, murmuring sing-song with the music, her odorless lips lusciously smeared with salve of swine-fatted rose water. Shura ani wena wach, banait, hayarushalayim. Bloom, fascinated. I thought you were of good stock by your accent. Zoe, and you know what thought did? She bites his ear gently with little gold-stopped teeth, sending on him a cloying breath of stale garlic. The roses draw apart, disclose a sepulchre of the gold of kings and their mouldering bones. Bloom draws back, mechanically caressing her right bob with a flat awkward hand. Are you a Dublin geddle? Zoe catches a stray hair deftly and twists it to her coil. No bloody fear, I'm English. Have you a swagger root? Bloom, as before, rarely smoke, dear. Cigar now and then. Childish device. Lewdly, the mouth can be better engaged than with a cylinder of rank weed. Zoe, go on, make a stump speech out of it. Bloom, in workman's corduroy overalls, black gansey with red floating tie and Apache cap. Mankind is incorrigible. Sir Walter Raleigh brought from the new world that potato and that weed, the one a killer of pestilence by absorption, the other a poisoner of the ear, eye, heart, memory, will, understanding, all. That is to say, he brought the poison a hundred years before another person, whose name I forget, brought the food. Suicide, lies, all our habits, why, look at our public life. Midnight chimes from distant steeples. The chimes. Turn again, Leopold, Lord Mayor of Dublin. Bloom, in alderman's gown and chain. Electors of Arn Key, Inns Key, Rotunda, Mount Joy and North Dock. Better run a tram line, I say, from the cattle market to the river. That's the music of the future. That's my program. Cui bono? But our buccaneering van der Deccans in their phantom ship of finance. An elector. Three times three for our future chief magistrate. The aurora borealis of the torchlight procession leaps. The torch bearers. Hooray! Several well-known burgesses, city magnates and freemen of the city, shake hands with Bloom and congratulate him. Timothy Harrington, late thrice Lord Mayor of Dublin, imposing in mayoral scarlet, gold chain and white silk tie, confers with Councillor Larkin Sherlock, locum tenens. They nod vigorously in agreement. Late Lord Mayor Harrington, in scarlet robe with mace, gold mayoral chain and large white silk scarf. 
That alderman Sir Leo Bloom's speech be printed at the expense of the ratepayers, that the house in which he was born be ornamented with a commemorative tablet, and that the thoroughfare hitherto known as Cow Pallor off Cork Street be henceforth designated Boulevard Bloom. Councillor Larkin Sherlock, carried unanimously. Bloom, impassionedly. These flying Dutchmen or lying Dutchmen, as they recline in their upholstered poop, casting dice, what wreck they? Machines, is their cry, their chimera, their panacea. Labor-saving apparatuses, supplanters, bugbears, manufactured monsters for mutual mother, hideous hobgoblins produced by a horde of capitalistic lusts upon our prostituted labor. The poor man starves while they are grassing their royal mountain stags, or shooting peasants and fathridges in their poor blind pomp of pelf and power, but their reign is rover forever and ever and ever. Prolonged applause. Venetian masts, maples, and festal arches spring up, a streamer bearing the legends, Kaj Mila Falcha and Ma Tob Melek Israel spans the street. All the windows are thronged with sightseers, chiefly ladies. Along the route, the regiments of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Cameron Highlanders, and the Welsh Fusiliers, standing to attention, keep back the crowd. Boys from high school are perched on the lampposts, telegraph poles, window sills, cornices, gutters, chimney pots, railings, rain spouts, whistling and cheering, the pillar of the cloud appears. A fife and drum band is heard in the distance playing the Col Nidre. The beaters approach with imperial eagles hoisted, trailing banners and waving oriental palms. The Chryselephantine papal standard rises high, surrounded by pennons of the civic flag. The van of the procession appears headed by John Howard Parnell, city marshal, in a chessboard tabard. The Athlone, poor Suivant, and Ulster King of Arms. They are followed by the Right Honourable Joseph Hutchinson, Lord Mayor of Dublin, His Lordship, the Lord Mayor of Cork, their warships, the Mayors of Limerick, Galway, Sligo, and Waterford, Twenty-eight Irish representative peers, sirdars, grandees, and maharajas, bearing the cloth of a state, the Dublin Metropolitan Fire Brigade, the chapter of the Saints of Finance in their plutocratic order of precedence, the Bishop of Down and Connor, His Eminence Michael Cardinal Logue, Archbishop of Armagh, Primate of All Ireland, His Grace the Most Reverend Dr. William Alexander, Archbishop of Armagh, Primate of All Ireland, the chief rabbi, the Presbyterian moderator, the heads of the Baptist, Anabaptist, Methodist, and Moravian chapels, and the honorary secretary of the Society of Friends. After them march the guilds and trades and train bands with flying colors, coopers, bird fanciers, millwrights, newspaper canvassers, law scriveners, masseurs, vintners, thrust makers, chimney sweeps, lard refiners, Tabernet and poplin weavers, farriers, Italian warehousemen, church decorators, boot jack manufacturers, undertakers, silk mercers, lapidaries, sales masters, cork cutters, assessors of fire losses, dyers and cleaners, export bottlers, fellmongers, ticket writers, heraldic seal engravers, horse repository hands. Bullion brokers, cricket and archery outfitters, riddle makers, egg and potato factors, hosiers and glovers, plumbing contractors. After them match gentlemen of the bedchamber, black rod, deputy garter, gold stick, the master of horse, the lord great chamberlain, the earl marshal, the high constable, carrying the sword of state, St. Stephen's iron crown, the chalice and bible. Four buglers on foot blow a senate, beef-eaters reply, winding clarions of welcome. Under an arch of triumph, Bloom appears, bare-headed, in a crimson velvet mantle trimmed with ermine, bearing St. Edward's staff, the orb and scepter with the dove, the cortana. He is seated on a milk-white horse with long flowing crimson tail, richly caparisoned, with golden headstall. Wild excitement, the ladies from their balconies throw down rose petals. The air is perfumed with essences. The men cheer. Bloom's boys run amid the bystanders with branches of hawthorn and wren bushes. Bloom's boys. The wren, the wren, the king of all birds, since Stevens's day was caught in the furs. 
a blacksmith, murmurs, for the honour of God, and is that bloom? He scarcely looks thirty-one. A pay of urine flagger, that's the famous bloom now, the world's greatest reformer, hats off! All uncover their heads, women whisper eagerly. A millionaireess, richly, isn't he simply wonderful? A noblewoman, nobly, all that man has seen. A feminist, masculinely, and done. A bell-hanger, a classic face, he has the forehead of a thinker. Bloom's weather, a sunburst appears in the northwest. The Bishop of Down and Connor, I here present your undoubted Emperor, President and King Chairman, the most serene and potent and very puissant ruler of this realm. God save Leopold the First. All. God save Leopold the First. Bloom, in Dalmatic and purple mantle, to the Bishop of Down and Connor, with dignity, thanks, somewhat eminent, sir. William, Archbishop of Armagh, in purple stock and shovel hat, will you to your power cause law and mercy to be executed in all your judgments in Ireland and territories thereunto belonging? Bloom, placing his right hand on his testicles, swears, so may the Creator deal with me, all this I promise to do. Michael, Archbishop of Armagh, pours a cruise of hair oil over Bloom's head. Gerium magnum annuncio vobis habemus carneficium, Leopold Patrick Andrew David George be thou anointed. Bloom assumes a mantle of cloth of gold and puts on a ruby ring. He ascends and stands on the stone of destiny. The representative peers put on, at the same time, their twenty-eight crowns. Joy bells ring in Christ's church, St. Patrick's, George's, and Gay Malahide. Myra's Bazaar fireworks go up from all sides with symbolical fallow pyrotechnic designs. The peers do homage, one by one, approaching and genuflecting. The peers, I do become your liege man of life and limb to earthly worship. Bloom holds up his right hand, on which sparkles the Koenor diamond. His palfrey neighs. Immediate silence. Wireless intercontinental and interplanetary transmitters are set for reception of message. Bloom, my subjects, we hereby nominate our faithful charger, Copula Felix, hereditary Grand Vizier, and announce that we have this day repudiated our former spouse, and have bestowed our royal hand upon the Princess Selene, the splendour of night. The former morganatic spouse of Bloom is hastily removed in the Black Maria. The Princess Selene, in moon-blue robes, a silver crescent on her head, descends from a sedan chair, borne by two giants, an outburst of cheering. John Howard Parnell raises the royal standard. Illustrious Bloom, successor to my famous brother! Bloom embraces John Howard Parnell. We thank you from our heart, John, for this right royal welcome to Green Eden, the promised land of our common ancestors. The freedom of the city is presented to him embodied in a chatter. The keys of Dublin, crossed on a crimson cushion, are given to him. He shows all that he is wearing green socks. Tom Kernan, you deserve it, your honour. Bloom, on this day twenty years ago, we overcame the hereditary enemy at Ladysmith. Our howitzers and camel swivel guns played on his lines with telling effect. Half a league onward, they charge. All is lost now. Do we yield? No! We drive them headlong. No! We charge. Deploying to the left, our light horse swept across the heights of Plevna and, uttering their war cry, Bona fide sabot, sabred the Saracen gunners to a man. The chapel of free men, typesetters. Here, here! John Wise Nolan. There's the man that's got away, James Stevens. A blue coat schoolboy. Bravo! An old resident. You're a credit to your country, sir, that's what you are. An apple woman. He's a man like Ireland once. Bloom, my beloved subjects, a new era is about to dawn. I, Bloom, tell you verily it is even now at hand. Yea, on the word of a Bloom, ye shall ere long enter into the golden city which is to be the new Bloomusilum in the Nova Hibernia of the future. Thirty-two workmen, wearing rosettes, from all the counties of Ireland, under the guidance of Darwin the Builder, construct the new Blumusilum. It is a colossal edifice with crystal roof, built in the shape of a huge pork kidney, 
containing 40,000 rooms. In the course of its extension, several buildings and monuments are demolished. Government offices are temporarily transferred to railway sheds. Numerous houses are raised to the ground. The inhabitants are lodged in barrels and boxes, all marked in red with the letters L.B. Several paupers fill from a ladder. A part of the walls of Dublin crowded with loyal sightseers collapses. The sightseers, dying, Moratori te salutant, they die. A man in a brown Macintosh springs up through a trapdoor. He points an elongated finger at Bloom. The man in the Macintosh, Don't you believe a word, he says. That man is Leopold Mintosh, the notorious fire-raiser. His real name is Higgins. Bloom, shoot him, dog of a Christian. So much for Mintosh. A cannon shot. The man in the Macintosh disappears. Bloom with his scepter strikes down poppies. The instantaneous deaths of many powerful enemies, graziers, members of parliament, members of standing committees are reported. Bloom's bodyguard distribute Monday money, commemoration medals, loaves and fishes, temperance badges, expensive Henry Clay cigars, free cow bones for soup, rubber preservatives in sealed envelopes tied with gold thread, butterscotch, pineapple rock, billet doux in the form of cocked hats, ready-made suits, Porringers of toad in the hole, bottles of jay's fluid, purchase stamps, forty days indulgences, spurious coins, dairy-fed pork sausages, theatre passes, season tickets available for all tramlines, coupons of the Royal and Privileged Hungarian Lottery, penny dinner counters, cheap reprints of the Waddle's Twelve Worst Books, Froggy and Fritz, Politic, Care of the Baby, Infantilic, Fifty Meals for Seven and Six, Culinic, was Jesus a sun myth, historic, expel that pain, medic, infant's compendium of the universe, cosmic, let's all chortle, hilaric, canvassers vade mecum, journalic, love letters of mother assistant, erotic, who's who in space, asterisk, songs that reached our heart, melodic, Pennywise's way to wealth, parsimonic, a general rush and scramble, women press forward to touch the hem of Bloom's robe. The Lady Gwendolyn Dubedat bursts through the throng, leaps on his horse and kisses him on both cheeks amid great acclamation. A magnesium flashlight photograph is taken, babes and sucklings are held up. The women, little father, little father. The babes and sucklings, clap, clap, hands till Paldi comes home, cakes in his pocket for Leo alone. Bloom, bending down, pokes Baby Boardman gently in the stomach. Baby Boardman hiccups, curdled milk flowing from his mouth. ha cha cha, -cha. Bloom, shaking hands with the blind stripling, my more than brother, placing his arms around the shoulders of an old couple, dear old friends. He plays pussy four corners with ragged boys and gettles. Peep, bo oh, peep he wheels twins in a perambulator. Tick-tack-two, would you set a shoe? He performs juggler's tricks, draws red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet silk handkerchiefs from his mouth. Rig biv thirty-two feet per second. He consoles a widow. Absence makes the heart grow younger. He dances the highland fling with grotesque antics. Legged ye devils! He kisses the bed sores of a palsied veteran. Honorable wounds. He trips up a fit policeman. You pee up, you pee up. He whispers in the ear of a blushing waitress and laughs kindly. Ah, naughty, naughty. He eats a raw turnip offered him by Morris Butterley, farmer. Fine, splendid. He refuses to accept three shillings offered him by Joseph Hines, journalist. My dear fellow, not at all. He gives his coat to a beggar. Please accept. He takes part in a stomach race with elderly male and female cripples. Come on, boys. Wriggle it, girls. The citizen... Choked with emotion, brushes aside a tear in his emerald muffler. May the good God bless him. The ram's horn sound for silence. The standard of Zion is hoisted. Bloom uncloaks impressively, revealing obesity, unrolls a paper and reads solemnly, Aleph bet gimel dalet hagada tefilim kosher yom kippur hanukkah rosh hashanah Benai Brit Bar Mitzvah Matz Ashkenazim Sugar Talit. An official translation is read by Jimmy Henry, Assistant Town Clerk. Jimmy Henry, the Court of Conscience is now open. 
His Most Catholic Majesty will now administer open-air justice, free medical and legal advice, solution of doubles and other problems, all cordially invited, given at this our loyal city of Dublin in the year one of the paradisiacal era. Paddy Leonard, what am I to do about my rates and taxes? Bloom, pay them, my friend. Paddy Leonard, thank you. Nosy Flynn, can I raise a mortgage on my fire insurance? Bloom, obdurately. Sirs, take notice that by the law of torts, you are bound over in your own recognizances for six months in the sum of five pounds. J.J. O'Malley. A Daniel, did I say? Nay, a Peter O'Brien. Nosy Flynn. Where do I draw the five pounds? Piss or bark. For blather trouble? Bloom. Acid. Nits. Hydrochlor. Dill. Twenty minims. Tinct. Nux vam. Five minims. Extra taraxel lick thirty minims ac dis ter in die. Chris Callanan, what is the parallax of the subsolar ecliptic of Aldebaran? Bloom, pleased to hear from you, Chris K. the second. Joe Hines, why aren't you in uniform? Bloom, when my progenitor of sainted memory wore the uniform of the Austrian despot in a dank prison, where was yours? Ben Dollard, pansies? Bloom, Embellish, beautify, suburban gardens. Ben Dollard, when twins arrive? Bloom, father, pater, dad, starts thinking. Larry O'Rourke, an eight-day license for my new premises. You remember me, Sir Leo, when you were in number seven. I'm sending around a dozen of stout for the missus. Bloom, coldly, you have the advantage of me. Lady Bloom accepts no presents. Crofton, this is indeed a festivity. Bloom, solemnly. You call it a festivity. I call it a sacrament. Alexander Keyes. When will we have our own house of keys? Bloom. I stand for the reform of municipal models and the plain Ten Commandments. New worlds for old. Union of all, Jew, Muslim, and Gentile. Three acres and a cow for all children of nature. Saloon motor horses. Compulsory manual labor for all. All parks open to the public day and night. Electric dish scrubbers, tuberculosis, lunacy, war, and mendicancy must now cease. General amnesty, weekly carnival with masked license, bonuses for all, Esperanto the universal language with universal brotherhood, no more patriotism of bar spongers and dropsical impostors. Free money, free rent, free love, and a free lay church in a free lay state. O'Madden Burke, free fox in a free hen roost. Davy Bodden, yawning. <sighs> Bloom, mixed races and mixed marriage. Lenehan, what about mixed bathing? Bloom explains to those near him his schemes for social regeneration. All agree with him. The keeper of the Kildare Street Museum appears dragging a lorry on which are the shaking statues of several naked goddesses. Venus Calipige, Venus Pandemos, Venus Metempsychosis, and plaster figures, also naked, representing the new nine muses. Commerce, operatic music, amour, publicity, manufacture, liberty of speech, plural voting, gastronomy, private hygiene, seaside concert entertainments, painless obstetrics, and astronomy for the people. Father Farley, he is an Episcopalian, an agnostic, an anything-garian seeking to overthrow our holy faith. Mrs. Riordan tears up her will. I'm disappointed in you, you bad man. Mother Grogan removes her boot to throw it at Bloom. Ya beast, ya abominable person. Nosy Flynn, give us a tune, Bloom. One of the old sweet songs. Bloom, with rollicking humour, I vowed that I never would leave her. She turned out a cruel deceiver. With my toodaloom, 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 toodaloom. Hoppy Hollahan. Good old Bloom, there's nobody like him after all. Paddy Leonard, stage Irishman. Bloom. What railway opera is like a tram line in Gibraltar? The Rose of Castile. Laughter. Lenehan, plagiarist, down with Bloom. The veiled Sibyl, enthusiastically. I'm a Bloomite and I glory in it. I believe in him in spite of all. I'd give my life for him, the funniest man on earth. Bloom, winks at the bystanders. I bet she's a bonny lassie. Theodore Purify, in fishing cap and oilskin jacket. He implies a mechanical device to frustrate the sacred ends of nature. The veiled Sibyl stabs herself. 
my hero god, she dies. Many most attractive and enthusiastic women also commit suicide by stabbing, drowning, drinking prussic acid, aconite, arsenic, opening their veins, refusing food, casting themselves under steam rollers from the top of Nelson's pillar into the great vat of Guinness's brewery, asphyxiating themselves by placing their heads in gas ovens, hanging themselves in stylish gathers, leaping from windows of different stories. Alexander J. Dowie violently. Fellow Christians and anti-Bloomites, the man called Bloom is from the roots of hell, a disgrace to Christian men. A fiendish libertine from his earliest years, the stinking goat of Mendes gave precocious signs of infantile debauchery, recalling the cities of the plain with a dissolute grandam. This vile hypocrite, bronzed with infamy, is the white bull mentioned in the apocalypse, a worshipper of the scarlet woman. Intrigue is the very breath of his nostrils. The steak, faggots, and the a cauldron of boiling oil are for him. Caliban! The mob. Lynch him! Roast him! He's as bad as Parnell was. Mr. Fox! Mother Grogan throws her boot at Bloom. Several shopkeepers from Upper and Lower Dorset Street throw objects of little or no commercial value. Ham bones, condensed milk tins, unsaleable cabbage, stale bread, sheep's tails, odd pieces of fat. Bloom, excitedly. This is midsummer madness. Some ghastly joke again. By heaven, I am guiltless as the unsunned snow. It was my brother Henry. He is my double. He lives in number two Dolphin's Barn. Slander, the viper, has wrongfully accused me. Fellow countrymen, Scanlon Ben Batter cost again cabal. I call on my old friend Dr. Malachy Mulligan, sex specialist, to give medical testimony on my behalf. Dr. Mulligan, in motor jerkin, green motor goggles on his brow. Dr. Bloom is bisexually abnormal. He has recently escaped from Dr. Eustace's private asylum for demented gentlemen. Born out of bedlock, hereditary epilepsy is present, the consequence of unbridled lust. Traces of elephantiasis have been discovered among his ascendants. There are marked symptoms of chronic exhibitionism. Ambidexterity is also latent. He is prematurely bored from self-abuse, perversely idealistic in consequence, a reformed rake, and has metal teeth. In consequence of a family complex, he has temporarily lost his memory, and I believe him to be more sinned against than sinning. I have made a pervaginal examination and, after application of the acid test to 5,427 anal, axillary, pectoral, and pubic hairs, I declare him to be Virgo Intacta. Bloom holds his high-grade hat over his genital organs. Dr. Madden. Hypsospadia is also marked. In the interest of coming generations, I suggest that the parts affected should be preserved in spirits of wine in the National Teratological Museum. Dr. Crothers. I have examined the patient's urine. It is albuminide. Salivation is insufficient. The patellar reflex intermittent. Dr. Punch Costello. The fetor eudeicus is most perceptible. Dr. Dixon reads a bill of health. Professor Bloom is a finished example of the new womanly man. His moral nature is simple and lovable. Many have found him a dear man, a dear person. He is a rather quaint fellow on the whole, coy though not feeble-minded in the medical sense. He has written a really beautiful letter, a poem in itself, to the court missionary of the Reformed Priests Protection Society, which clears up everything. He is practically a total abstainer, and I can affirm that he sleeps on a straw litter and eats the most spartan food, cold, dried grocer's peas. He wears a hair shirt of pure Irish manufacture, winter and summer, and scourges himself every Saturday. He was, I understand, at one time a first-class misdemeanant in Glencree Reformatory. Another report states that he was a very posthumous child. I appeal for clemency in the name of the most sacred word our vocal organs have ever been called upon to speak. He is about to have a baby. General commotion and compassion. Women faint. A wealthy American makes a street collection for Bloom. Gold and silver coins, blank checks, banknotes, jewels, treasury bonds, maturing bills of exchange, IOUs, wedding rings, watch chains, lockets, necklaces, and bracelets are rapidly collected. Bloom. Oh, I so want to be a mother. Mrs. Tarnton, in nurse tender's gown, embrace me tight, dear.
You'll be soon over it. Tight, dear. Bloom embraces her tightly and bears eight male yellow and white children. They appear on a red carpeted staircase adorned with expensive plants. All the octuplets are handsome, with valuable metallic faces, well made, respectably dressed and well conducted, speaking five modern languages fluently and interested in various arts and sciences. Each has his name printed in legible letters on his shot front. Nassaudero, Goldfinger, Chrysostomus, Mandary, Silver Smile, Silver Selber, Vifargent, Panargeros. They are immediately appointed to positions of high public trust in several different countries as managing directors of banks, traffic managers of railways, chairman of limited liability companies, vice chairman of hotel syndicates. A voice. Bloom, are you the Messiah Ben Joseph or Ben David? Bloom, darkly, you have said it. Brother Buzz, then perform a miracle like Father Charles. Phantom Lions, prophesy who will win the St. Ledger. Bloom walks on a net, covers his left eye with his left ear, passes through several walls, climbs Nelson's pillar, hangs from the top ledge by his eyelids, eats twelve dozen oysters, shells included, heals several sufferers from King's evil, contracts his face so as to resemble many historical personages, Lord Beaconsfield, Lord Byron, Watt Tyler, Moses of Egypt, Moses Maimonides, Moses Mendelssohn, Henry Irving, Rip Van Winkle, Kossuth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baron Leopold Rothschild, Robinson Crusoe, Sherlock Holmes, Pasteur, turns each foot simultaneously in different directions, bids the tide totten back, eclipses the sun by extending his little finger. Brini, papal nuncio, in papal zouave's uniform, steel cuirasses as breastplate, armplates, tieplates, legplates, large profane moustaches and brown paper mitre. Leopoldi autem generatio. Moses begat Noah, and Noah begat Eunuch, and Eunuch begat O'Halloran, and O'Halloran begat Guggenheim, and Guggenheim begat Agandath, and Agandath begat Netaim, and Netaim begat Lehersh, and Lehersh begat Yesurum, and Yesurum begat Mackay, and Mackay begat Ostrolopsky, and Ostrolopsky begat Smerdos, and Smerdos begat Weiss, and Weiss begat Schwartz, and Schwartz begat Adrianopoli, and Adrianopoli begat Aranjuez, and Aranjuez begat Louis Lawson, and Louis Lawson begat Ichabodonosaur, and Ichabodonosaur begat O'Donnell Magnus, and O'Donnell Magnus begat Christbaum, and Christbaum begat Ben Maimon, and Ben Maimon begat Dusty Rhodes, and Dusty Rhodes begat Benamore, and Benamore begat Joan Smith, and Joan Smith begat Savarnyanovich, and Savarnyanovich begat Jasperstone, and Jasperstone begat Vant it Unyem, and Vant it Unyem begat Shombatali, and Shombatali begat Virag, and Virag begat Bloom, et vocabit or nomen eius Emmanuel. A dead hand writes on the wall, Bloom is a cod. Crab in Bush Ranger's kit. What did you do when the cattle creep behind Kilbarrick? A female infant shakes a rattle. And under Ballybow Bridge? A holly bush and in the Devil's Glen. Bloom blushes furiously all over from fronds to nets, three tears filling from his left eye. Spare my past. The Irish evicted tenants, in bodycoats, knee breeches, with Donnybrook fair shillelies. Siambok him! Bloom, with ass's ear, seats himself in the pillory with crossed arms, his feet protruding. He whistles Don Giovanni Acenarteco. Artain orphans, joining hands, caper round him. Girls of the prison gate mission, joining hands, caper round in the opposite direction. The Artain orphans, ye hig, ye hog, ye dirty dog, ye think the ladies love you. The prison gate gettles, if you see K, tell him he may, see you in T, tell him from me. Hornblower, in ephod and hunting cap, announces, And he shall carry the sins of the people to Azazel, the spirit which is in the wilderness, and to Lilith, the night hag, and they shall stone him and defile him, yea, all from Agandat, Netaim, and from Mizraim, the land of Ham. All the people cast soft pantomime stones at Bloom. Many bona fide travellers and ownerless dogs come near him and defile him. Nastiansky and Citron approach in gabardines, wearing long earlocks. They wag their beards at Bloom. Nastiansky and Citron, Belial, Lamelin of Istria, the false messiah, Amulafia, recant! 
George R. Messias, Bloom's tailor, appears, a tailor's goose under his arm, presenting a bill. Messias, to alteration one pair throws those eleven shillings. Bloom rubs his hands cheerfully, just like old times. Poor Bloom. Reuben J. Dodd, black-bearded discariot, bad shepherd, bearing on his shoulders the droned corpse of his son, approaches the pillory. Reuben J. whispers hoarsely, the squeak is out. A split is gone for the flatties. Nip the first rattler. The fire brigade. Flap! Brother Buzz invests Bloom in a yellow habit with embroidery of painted flames and high-pointed hat. He places a bag of gunpowder round his neck and hands him over to the civil power, saying, Forgive him his trespasses. Lieutenant Myers of the Dublin Fire Brigade, by general request, sets fire to Bloom. Lamentations. The citizen. Thank heaven. Bloom, in a seamless garment marked I.H.S., stands upright amid phoenix flames. Weep not for me, O daughters of Eden. He exhibits to Dublin reporters traces of burning. The daughters of Eden, in black garments, with large prayer books and long lighted candles in their hands, kneel down and pray. The daughters of Eden. Kidney of Bloom, pray for us. Flower of the bath, pray for us. Mentor of Menton, pray for us. Canvasser for the Freeman, pray for us. Charitable Mason, pray for us. Wandering Soap, pray for us. Sweets of Sin, pray for us. Music without words, pray for us. Reprover of the Citizen, pray for us. Friend of all frillies, pray for us. Midwife most merciful, pray for us. Potato preservative against plague and pestilence, pray for us. A choir of six hundred voices, conducted by Vincent O'Brien, sings the chorus from Handel's Messiah, Alleluia, for the Lord God Omnipotent reigneth, accompanied on the organ by Joseph Clinn. Bloom becomes mute, shrunken, carbonized. Zoe, talk away till you're black in the face. Bloom, in carbine with clay pipes stuck in the band, dusty brogues, an emigrant's red handkerchief bundle in his hand, leading a black bog oak pig by a cigar, with a smile in his eye. Let me be going now, woman of the house, for by all the goats in Connemara I'm after having the father and mother of a baiting. With a tear in his eye, all insanity, patriotism, sorrow for the dead, music, future of the race, to be or not to be, life's dream is o'er. End it peacefully. They can live on. He gazes far away mournfully. I am ruined. A few pastilles of aconite. The blinds drawn. A leather. Then lie back to rest. He breathes softly. No more. I have lived. Fair. Farewell. Zoe, stiffly, her finger in her neck fillet. Honest. Till the next time. She sneers. Suppose you got up the wrong side of the bed, or came too quick with your best girl. Oh, I can read your thoughts. Bloom, bitterly. Man and woman, love, what is it? A cork and bottle? I'm sick of it. Let everything rip. Zoe, in sudden sulks. I hate a rotter that's insincere. Give a bleeding whore a chance. Bloom, repentantly. I am very disagreeable. You are a necessary evil. Where are you from? London? Zoe, glibly, Hogs Norton, where the pigs play the organs. I'm Yorkshire-born. She holds his hand, which is feeling for her nipple. I say, Tommy Tittlemouse, stop that and begin worse. Have you cash for a short time? Ten shillings. Bloom, smiles, nods slowly. More, hurry, more. Zoe, and more's mother? She pats him off-handedly with velvet paws. Are you coming into the music room to see our new pianola? Come and I'll peel off. Bloom, feeling his occiput dubiously with the unparalleled embarrassment of a harassed peddler gauging the symmetry of her peeled pears. Somebody would be dreadfully jealous if she knew. The green-eyed monster. Earnestly, you know how difficult it is. I needn't tell you. Zoe, flattered. What the eye can't see, the heart can't grieve for. She pats him. Come. Bloom, laughing witch. The hand that rocks the cradle. Zoe, babby. Bloom, in baby linen and pelisse, big-headed, with a call of dark hair, fixes big eyes on her fluid slip and counts its bronze buckles with a chubby finger, his moist tongue lolling and lisping. One, two, three, three, two, one. The buckles. Love me. Love me not. Love me. Zoe. Silent means consent. 
With little parted talons she captures his hand, her forefinger giving to his palm the past touch of secret monitor, luring him to doom. Hot hands, cold gizzard. He hesitates amid scents, music, temptations. She leads him towards the steps, drawing him by the odor of her armpits, the vice of her painted eyes, the rustle of her slip in whose sinuous folds locks the lion reek of all the male brutes that have possessed her. The male brutes, exhaling sulphur of rot and dung, and ramping in their loose box, faintly roaring, their drugged heads swaying to and fro. Good! Zoe and Bloom reach the doorway where two sister whores are seated. They examine him curiously from under their penciled brows, and smile to his hasty bow. He trips awkwardly. Zoe, her lucky hand instantly saving him. Oops, uh, don't fall upstairs! Bloom, the just man, falls seven times. He stands aside at the threshold. After you is good manners. Zoe, ladies first, gentlemen after. She crosses the threshold. He hesitates. She toddens and, holding out her hands, draws him over. He hops. On the antlered rack of the hall hang a man's hat and waterproof. Bloom uncovers himself, but seeing them, frowns, then smiles, preoccupied. A door on the return landing is flung open. A man in purple shirt and grey trousers, brown-socked, passes with an ape's gait, his bald head and goatee beard upheld, hugging a full water jug jar, his two-tailed black braces dangling at heels. Averting his face quickly, Bloom bends to examine on the hall table the spaniel eyes of a running fox. Then, his lifted head sniffing, follows Zoe into the music room. A shade of mauve tissue paper dims the light of the chandelier. Round and round a moth flies, colliding, escaping. The floor is covered with an oilcloth mosaic of jade and azure and cinnabar rhomboids. Footmarks are stamped over it in all senses, heel to heel, heel to hollow, toe to toe. Feet locked, a morris of shuffling feet without body phantoms, all in a scrimmage higgledy piggledy. The walls are tapestried with a paper of euphrons and clear glades. In the grate is spread a screen of peacock feathers. Lynch squats cross legged on the hearth rug of matted hair, his cap back to the front. With a wand he beats time slowly. Kitty Ricketts, a bony pallid whore in navy costume, doe-skin gloves rolled back from a coral wristlet, a chain purse in her hand, sits perched on the edge of the table swinging her leg and glancing at herself in the gilt mirror over the mantelpiece. A tag of her corset lace hangs slightly below her jacket. Lynch indicates mockingly the couple at the piano. Kitty coughs behind her hand. She's a bit imbecilic. She signs with a waggling forefinger, blem blem. Lynch lifts up her skirt and white petticoat with his wand. She settles them down quickly. Respect yourself. She hiccups, then bends quickly her sailor hat under which her hair glows, red with henna. Oh, excuse. Zoe, more limelight, Charlie. She goes to the chandelier and turns the gas full cock. Kitty peers at the gas jet. What ails it tonight? Lynch, deeply, enter a ghost and hobgoblins. Zoe, clap on the back for Zoe. The wand in Lynch's hand flashes, a brass poker. Stephen stands at the pianola on which sprawl his hat and ash plant. With two fingers he repeats once more the series of empty fifths. Flurry Talbot, a blonde, feeble, goose-fat whore in a tattered Amalian gown of mildewed strawberry, lolls spread-eagle in the sofa corner, her limp forearm pendant over the bolster, listening. A heavy sty droops over her sleepy eyelid. Kitty hiccups again with the kick of her horsed foot. Oh, excuse. Zoe, promptly. Your boy's thinking of you. Tie a knot on your shift. Kitty Ricketts spins her head. Her boa uncoils, slides, glides over her shoulder, back, arm, chair to the ground. Lynch lifts the cuddled caterpillar on his wand. She snakes her neck, nestling. Stephen glances behind at the squatted figure with its cap back to the front. Stephen, as a matter of fact, it is of no importance whether Benedetto Marcello found it or made it. The right is the poet's rest. It may be an old hymn to Demeter, or also illustrate, 
Cela en arant gloriam domini. It is susceptible of nodes, or modes, as far apart as hyperphrygian and mixolydian, and of texts so divergent as priests high hooping round David's, that is, Circe's, or what am I saying, Ceres' altar, and David's tip from the stable to his chief bassoonist about the all rightness of his almightiness. Me nom de nom, that is another pair of trousers. Jeter la gourme, faut que je ne se passe. He stops, points at Lynch's cap, smiles, laughs. Which side is your knowledge, bump? The cap with saturnine spleen. There, it is because it is. Women's reason. Jew, Greek is Greek, Jew. Extremes meet. That is the highest form of life. There. Stephen, you remember fairly accurately all my errors, boasts, mistakes. How long shall I continue to close my eyes to disloyalty? Whetstone? The cap. There. Stephen, here's another for you. He frowns. The reason is because the fundamental and the dominant are separated by the greatest possible interval, which... The cap. Which? Finish. You can't. Stephen, with an effort. Interval, which... Is the greatest possible ellipse, consistent with... The ultimate return. The octave. Which? The cap. Which? Outside, the gramophone begins to blare. The holy city. Stephen, abruptly... What went forth to the ends of the world to traverse not itself? God, the Son, Shakespeare, a commercial traveller, having itself traversed in reality itself, becomes that self. Wait a moment. Wait a second. Damn that fellow's noise in the street. Self which it itself was ineluctably preconditioned to become. Echo. Lynch, with the mocking whinny of laughter, grins at Bloom and Zoe Higgins. What a learned speech, eh? Huh? Zoe, briskly, God help your head, he knows more than you have forgotten. With obese stupidity, Flory Talbot regards Stephen. Flory, they say the last day is coming this summer. Kitty, no. Zoe explodes in laughter. Great unjust God. Flory, offended. Well, it was in the papers about Antichrist. Oh, my foot's tickling. Ragged barefoot newsboys, jogging a wagtail kite, patter past, yelling. The news buys. Stop press edition. Result of the rock and horse races. Sea serpent in the Royal Canal. Save arrival of Antichrist. Stephen toddens and sees Bloom. Stephen. A time. Times and half a time. Reuben I. Antichrist. Wandering Jew. A clutching hand open on his spine. Stumps forward. Across his lines is slung a pilgrim's wallet from which protrude promissory notes and dishonoured bills. Aloft over his shoulder he bears a long boat pole, from the hook of which the sudden huddled mass of his only son, saved from liffy waters, hangs from the slack of its breeches. A hobgoblin in the image of Punch Costello, hip-shot, crook-backed, hydrocephalic, prognathic, with receding forehead and alley-sloper nose, tumbles in somersaults through the gathering darkness. All. What? The hobgoblin, his jaws chattering, capers to and fro, goggling his eyes, squeaking, kangaroo hopping with outstretched clutching arms, then all at once thrusts his lipless face through the fork of his thighs. Il vient, c'est moi, l'homme qui rit, l'homme primigène. He whirls round and round with dervish howls. Sieur et dame, faites vos jeux. He crouches, juggling. Tiny roulette planets fly from his hands. Le jeu sont fait. The planets rush together, uttering crepitant cracks. Rien va plus. The planets, buoyant balloons, sail swollen up and away. He springs off into vacuum. Flory, sinking into torpor, crossing herself secretly. The end of the world. A female tepid effluvium leaks out from her. Nebulous obscurity occupies space. Through the drifting fog, without, the gramophone blares over cuffs and feet shuffling. The gramophone. Jerusalem, open your gates and sing. Hosanna! A rocket rushes up the sky and bursts. A white star fills from it, proclaiming the consummation of all things and second coming of Elijah. Along an infinite invisible tightrope taut from Zenith to Nadir, the end of the world, a two-headed octopus in gillies kilts, busby and tartan filibegs, whirls through the mark, head over heels, in the form of the three legs of man. The end of the world, with a Scotch accent, I'll dance the keel row, the keel row, the keel row.
Over the passing drift and choking breath coughs, Elijah's voice, harsh as a corn crakes, jars on high. Perspiring in a loose lawn, surplus with funnel sleeves he is seen, verger faced, above a rostrum about which the banner of old glory is draped. He thumps the parapet. Elijah, now yapping, if you please, in this booth. Jake Crane, Creole Sue, Dove Campbell, Abe Kirshner, do your coughing with your mouths shut. Say, I am operating all this trunk line. Boys, do it now. God's time is twelve twenty-five. Tell mother you'll be there. Rush your other and you play a slick ace. Join on right here. Book through to Eternity Junction, the non-stop run. Just one word more. Are you a god or a doggone clod? If the second advent came to Coney Island, are we ready? Flurry Christ, Stephen Christ, Zoe Christ, Bloom Christ, Kitty Christ, Lynch Christ. It's up to you to sense that cosmic force. Have we called feed about the cosmos? No. Beyond the side of the angels, be a prism. You have that something within the higher self. You can rub shoulders with a Jesus, a Gautama, an Ingersoll. Are you all in this vibration? I say you are. You once nobble that congregation, and a buck gyroid to heaven becomes a back number. You got me? It's a life brightener, sure. The hottest stuff ever was. It's the whole pie with jam in. It's just the cutest, snappiest line out. It is immense, super sumptuous. It restores. It vibrates. I know, and I am some vibrator. Joking apart and getting down to bedrock. A.J. Christ Dowie and the Harmonial Philosophy. Have you got that? Okay. 77 West 69th Street. Got me? That's it. You call me up by sun phone any old time. Bumboozer, save your stamps. He shouts, Now then our glory song. I'll join heartily in the singing. Encore! He sings, Jero! The gramophone drowning his voice. Warusalam in your hi-yo. The disc rasps gratingly against the needle. The three whores, covering their ears, squawk. Oh! Elijah, in rolled up shirt sleeves, black in the face, shouts at the top of his voice, his arms uplifted. Big brother up there, Mr. President, you hear what I've done just been saying to you? Certainly, I sort of believe, strong in you. Mr. President, I certainly am thinking now Miss Higgins and Miss Ricketts got religion way inside them. Certainly seems to me I don't never see no wusser scared female than the way you been, Miss Flurry. Just now as I done seed you, Mr. President, you come long and help me save our sisters, dear... He winks at his audience. Oh, Mr. President, he twigged the whole lot and he ain't saying nothing. Kitty Kate, I forgot myself. In a weak moment I erred and did what I did on Constitution Hill. I was confirmed by the bishop and enrolled in the brown scapular. My mother's sister married a Montmorency. It was a working plumber was my ruination when I was pure. Zoe Fanny, I let him ladder put into me for the fun of it. Flory Teresa. It was in consequence of a port wine beverage on top of Hennessy's three star. I was guilty with Valen when he slipped into the bed. Stephen, in the beginning was the word, in the end the world without end. Blessed be the eight Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, Dixon, Madden, Crothers, Costello, Lenahan, Bannon, Mulligan and Lynch, in white surgical students' gowns, four abreast, goose-stepping, tramp, fist, passed, in noisy marching. The Beatitudes, incoherently, they are the battle dog, Bible, Bussinum Burnham, Buckerum Bishop. Lister, in Quaker grey knee breeches and broad brimmed hat, says discreetly, He is our friend. I need not mention names. Seek thou the light. He corantos by, best enters in hairdresser's attire, shinily laundered, his locks in curl papers. He leads John Eglinton, who wears a mandarin's kimono of nankin yellow. Lizard lettered, and a high pagoda hat. Best, smiling, lifts the hat and displays a shaven poll from the crown of which bristles a pigtail toupee tied with an orange topknot. I was just beautifying him, don't you know? A thing of beauty, don't you know? Yates says, or I mean, Keats says. John Eglinton produces a green-capped dark lantern and flashes it towards a corner, with carping accent. 
Aesthetics and cosmetics are for the boudoir. I am out for truth, plain truth for a plain man. Tandaraji wants the facts and means to get them. In the cone of the searchlight behind the coal scuttle, Olive, holy-eyed, the bearded figure of Mananon MacLear broods, chin on knees. He rises slowly. A cold sea wind blows from his druid mouth. About his head writhe eels and elvers. He is encrusted with weeds and shells. His right hand holds a bicycle pump. His left hand grasps a huge crayfish by its two talons. Mananon MacLear, with the voice of waves, White Jochen of the gods, a cult commander of Hermes Trismegistus, with the voice of whistling sea wind, Ponarjanam Patsipun Job, I won't have my leg pulled. It has been said by one, Beware the left, the cult of Shakti, with the cry of storm birds, Shakti, Shiva, Darkhead, and Father. He smites with his bicycle pump the crayfish in his left hand. On its cooperative dial glow the twelve signs of the zodiac. He wails with the vehemence of the ocean. Om, bom, pajam. I am the light of the homestead. I am the dreamery, creamery butter. A skeleton, Judas' hand, strangles the light. The green light wanes to mauve. The gas jet wails, whistling. The gas jet. Four, four. Zoe runs to the chandelier and, crooking her leg, adjusts the mantle. Zoe, who has a fag as I'm here? Lynch, tossing a cigarette onto the table. Here. Zoe, her head perched aside in mock pride. Is that the way to hand the pot to a lady? She stretches up to light the cigarette over the flame, twirling it slowly, showing the brown tufts of her armpits. Lynch, with his poker, lifts boldly a side of her slip, bare from her Gartles up, her flesh appears under the sapphire and Nixie's green. She puffs calmly at her cigarette. Can you see the beauty spot of my behind? Lynch, I'm not looking. Zoe makes sheep's eyes. No, you wouldn't do a less thing. Would you suck a lemon? Squinting in mock shame, she glances with sidelong meaning at Bloom, then twists round towards him, pulling her slip free of the poker. Blue fluid again flows over her flesh. Bloom stands, smiling desirously, twirling his thumbs. Kitty Ricketts licks her middle finger with her spittle, and gazing in the mirror, smooths both eyebrows. Lepoti Virag, Basilico Gramit, shoots rapidly down through the chimney flue and struts two steps to the left on gawky pink stints. He is sausaged into several overcoats and wears a brown Macintosh, under which he holds a roll of parchment. In his left eye flashes the monocle of Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell. On his head is perched an Egyptian pshent. Two quills project over his ears. Virag, heels together, bows. My name is Virag Lepoti of Shambatali, he coughs thoughtfully, dryly. Promiscuous nakedness is much in evidence hereabouts, eh? Inadvertently, her back view revealed the fact that she is not wearing those rather intimate garments of which you are a particular devotee. The injection mark on the thigh, I hope, you perceived. Good. Bloom. Grandpapachi. But... Virag, number two, on the other hand, she of the cherry rouge and coiffers white, whose hair owes not a little to our tribal elixir of gopherwood, is in walking costume, and tightly stazed by her sit, I should opine, backbone in front, so to say. Correct me, but I always understood that the act so performed by skittish humans, with glimpses of lingerie, appealed to you in virtue of its exhibitionistist essicity, in a word, hippogriff, am I right? Bloom, she is rather lean. Virag, not unpleasantly. Absolutely. Well observed, and those pannier pockets of the skirt and slightly peg-top effect are devised to suggest bunchiness of hip, a new purchase at some monster sale for which a gull has been mulcted. Meretricious finery to deceive the eye. Observe the attention to detail of dust specks. Never put on you tomorrow what you can wear today. Parallax! with a nervous twitch of his head. Did you hear my brain go snap? Polly Syllabax! Bloom, an elbow resting in a hand, a forefinger against his cheek. She seems sad. Virag, cynically, his weasel teeth bared yellow, draws down his left eye with a finger and backs hoarsely. Hoax! Beware of the flapper and bogus mournful, lily of the alley, all possess bachelor's button discovered by Rualdus Columbus. Tumble her! Columble her! Chameleon! 
More genially? Well then, permit me to draw your attention to item number three. There is plenty of her visible to the naked eye. Observe the mass of oxygenated vegetable matter on her skull. What ho, she bumps! The ugly duckling of the party, long-casted and deep in keel. Bloom, regretfully, when you come out without your gun. Virag, we can do you all brands, mild, medium, and strong. Pay your money, take your choice. How happy could you be with either? Bloom, with Virag, his tongue up, curling. Liam, look, her beam is broad. She is coated with quite a considerable layer of fat. Obviously, mammalian weight of bosom, you remark, that she has in front, well to the fore, two protuberances of very respectable dimensions. Inclined to fall in the noonday soup plate, while on her rear, lower down, are two additional protuberances suggestive of potent rectum and tumescent for palpation, which leave nothing to be desired save compactness. Such fleshy parts are the product of careful nurture. When coop fattened, their livers reach an elephantine size. Pellets of new bread with fenugreek and gumbon jamon, swamped down by portions of green tea, endowed them during their brief existence with natural pincushions of quite colossal blubber. That suits your book, eh? Flesh hot pots of Egypt to hanker after, wallow in it, like a podium. His throat twitches, slap bang, there he goes again. Bloom, the sty I dislike. Virag arches his eyebrows. Contact with the gold ring, they say, argumentum ad feminam, as we said in old Rome and ancient Greece in the consulship of Diplodocus and Ichthyosaurus. For the rest, Eve's sovereign remedy, not for sale, hire only, you know. He twitches. It is a funny sound. He coughs encouragingly, but possibly it is only a wart. I presume you shall have remembered what I will have taught you on that head. Wheaten meal with honey and nutmeg. Bloom, reflecting. Wheaten meal with lake of podium and syllabax. This searching ordeal. It has been an unusually fatiguing day, a chapter of accidents. Wait, I mean, warts, blood spreads warts, you said. Virag. Severely, his nose hard humped, his side eye winking. Stop twirling your thumbs and have a good old thunk. See, you have forgotten. Exercise your mnemotechnic. La causa es santa. Ta-ra, ta-ra. Aside, he will surely remember. Bloom. Rosemary also did I understand you to say, or willpower over parasitic tissues? Then, nay, no, I have an inkling. The touch of a dead hand cures. Nemo? Virag, excitedly, I say so, I say so, in so, technic, he taps his parchment roll energetically, this book tells you how to act with all descriptive particulars, consult index for agitated fear of aconite, melancholy of muriatic, priapic pulsatilla, Virag is going to talk about amputation, our old friend caustic, they must be starved, snip off with horse hair under the denned neck, but, to change the venue to the Bulgar and the Basque, have you made up your mind whether you like or dislike women in male habiliments? With a dry snigger, you intended to devote an entire year to the study of the religious problem and the summer months of 1886 to square the circle and win that million. Pomegranate! From the sublime to the ridiculous is but a step. Pajamas, let us say? Or stocking get? Gusseted knickers closed? Or... Put we the case, those complicated combinations, cami knickers. He crows derisively. Kik, here, he. Bloom surveys uncertainly the three whores, then gazes at the veiled mauve light, hearing the ever flying moth. Bloom, I wanted then to have now concluded. Night dress was never, hence this. But tomorrow is a new day, will be. Past was is today. What now is, will, then morrow as now was be past yester. Virag prompts in a pig's whisper. Insects of the day spend their brief existence in reiterated coition, lured by the smell of the inferiorly pulchritudinous female, possessing extendified pudendal nerve in dorsal region. Pretty Paul! His yellow parrot beak gabbles nasally. They had a proverb in the Carpathians in or about the year 5,550 of our era. One tablespoonful of honey will attract friend Bruin more than half a dozen barrels of first-choice malt vinegar. Bears buzz bothers bees. But of this apart, at another time we may resume. 
We were very pleased, we others. He coughs, and bending his brow, rubs his nose thoughtfully with a scooping hand. You shall find that these night insects follow the light, an illusion, for remember their complex, unadjustable eye. For all these naughty points, see the seventeenth book of my Fundamentals of Sexology, or the Love Passion, which Dr. L.B. says is the book sensation of the year. Some, to example, there are again whose movements are automatic. Perceive. That is his appropriate son, night bird, night sun, night town. Chase me, Charlie. He blows into Bloom's ear. Buzz. Bloom, be your blue bottle, two other day, butting shadow on wall, dazed self, then me, wander days down shot. Good job, I... Virag, his face impassive, laughs in a rich feminine key. Splendid. Spanish fly in his fly or mustard plaster on his dibble. He gobbles gluttonously with turkey wattles. Bubbly jock, bubbly jock, where are we? Open sesame, cometh forth. He unrolls his parchment rapidly and reads, his glow warum's nose running backwards over the letters which he claws. Stay, good friend, I bring thee thy answer. Red bank oysters will shortly be upon us. I'm the best a cook. Those succulent bivalves may help us, and the truffles of Perigord, tubers dislodged through Mr. Omnivorous Porker, were unsurpassed in cases of nervous debility or varagitis. Though they stink, yet they sting. He wags his head with cackling raillery. Jocular, with my eyeglass in my ocular. He sneezes. Amen. Bloom, absently. Ocularly, woman's bivalve case is worse. Always open, sesame. The cloven sex, why they fear vermin, creeping things, yet even the serpent contradicts. Not a historical fact, obvious analogy to my idea. Serpents, too, are gluttons for woman's milk, wind their way through miles of omnivorous forest to suck succulent her breast dry. Like those bubbly jocular Roman matrons one reads of in Elephantuliasis, Virag, his mouth projected in hard wrinkles, eyes stonily, forlornly closed, sounds in outlandish monotone, that the cows with their those distended others, that they have been the the known. Bloom, I am going to scream. I beg your pardon. Ah, huh? so, he repeats, spontaneously to seek out the Saurian's lair in order to entrust their teats to his avid suction. Ant milks aphis, profoundly, instinct rules the waddled, in life, in death. Virag, head askew, arches his back and hunched wing shoulders, peers at the moth out of blear-bulged eyes, points a horning claw and cries, Who's moth, moth? Who's dear Gerald? Dear Gerald, that's you. Oh, dear, he is Gerald. Oh, I much fear he shall be most badly burdened. Will some please person, not now impediment so catastrophic smit agitation of first-class table numkin? He mews, Puss, 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 puss. He sighs, draws back, and stares sideways down with dropping under jaw. Well, well, he does rest anon. He snaps his jaw suddenly on the air. The moth, I'm a tiny, tiny thing, ever flying in the spring, round and round a ring a ring. Long ago I was a king, now I do this kind of thing, on the wing, on the wing, bing. He rushes against the mauve shade, flapping noisily. Pretty, 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 pretty petticoats. From left upper entrance, with two gliding steps, Henry Flower comes forward to left front centre. He wears a dark mantle and drooping plumed sombrero. He carries a silver-stringed inlaid dulcimer and a long-stemmed bamboo Jacob's pipe, its clay bowl fashioned as a female head. He wears dark velvet hose and silver buckled pumps. He has the romantic saviour's face with flowing locks, thin beard and moustache. His spindle legs and sparrow feet are those of the tenor Mario, Prince of Candia. He settles down his goffered ruffs and moistens his lips with the passage of his amorous tongue. Henry, in a low dulcet voice, touching the strings of his guitar. There is a flower that bloometh. Virag, truculent, his jowls set, stares at the lamp. Grave Bloom regards Zoe's neck. Henry, gallant, turns with pendant dewlap to the piano. Stephen, to himself, play with your eyes shut. Imitate Pa, filling my belly with husks of swine. Too much of this. I will arise and go to my... Expect this is the... 
Steve, thou art in a perilous way, must visit old DC or Telegraph. Our interview of this morning has left on me a deep impression. Though our ages will write fully tomorrow. I'm partially drunk, by the way. He touches the keys again. Minor chord comes now. Yes, not much, however. Almadano Artifoni holds out a baton roll of music with vigorous mustache work. Artifoni. Cheery fletta. Lero vina tutto. Flori. Sing us something. Love's old sweet song. Stephen. No voice. I am a most finished artist. Lynch. Did I show you the letter about the loot? Flory, smirking, the bird that can sing and won't sing. The Siamese twins, Philip drunk and Philip sober, two Oxford duns with lawn mowers, appear in the window embrasure. Both are masked with Matthew Arnold's face. Philip sober, take a fool's advice. All is not well. Work it out with the butt end of a pencil, like a good young idiot. Three pounds twelve you got, two notes, one sovereign, two crowns, if youth but new. Money's on veal, money's sore mare, the Myra, Larchets, Holly Street Hospital, Burks. Eh? I am watching you. Philip drunk, impatiently. Ah, bosh, man, go to hell. I paid my way. If I could only find out about Oxhaves. Reduplication of personality. Who was it told me his name? His lawnmower begins to purr. Ah, yes. Zoe Mu Sasagapo. Have a notion I was here before. When was it not Atkinson, his card I have somewhere? Mac, somebody. Unmac, I have it. He told me about, hold on, Swinburne, was it, no? Flory, and the song? Stephen, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Flory, are you out of me, Nooth? You're like someone I knew once. Stephen, out of it now? To himself, clever. Philip drunk and Philip sober. Their lawnmowers purring with a rigadoon of grass halms. Clever ever! Out of it, out of it! By the by, have you the book, the thing, the ash plant? Yes, there it, yes! Clever ever, out of it now! Keep in condition, do like us. Zoe, there was a priest down here two nights ago to do his bit of business with his coat buttoned up. You needn't try to hide, I says to him. I know you've a Roman collar. Virag, perfectly logical from his standpoint, fall of man, harshly, his pupils waxing, to hell with the Pope, nothing new under the sun, I am the Virag who disclosed the sex secrets of monks and maidens, why I left the Church of Rome, read the priest, the woman, and the confessional, Penrose, flipperty jippert, he wriggles, woman undoing with sweet pudor her belt of rush rope, offers her all moist yoni to man's lingam. Short time after man presents woman with pieces of jungle meat, woman shows joy and covers herself with feather skins. Man loves her yoni fiercely with big lingam, the stiff one. He cries, Coactus volui! Then giddy woman will run about. Strong man grapses woman's wrist. Woman squeals, bites, spucks. Man, now fierce angry, strikes woman's fat yet gana. He chases his tail. Piff, paff, po po. He stops, sneezes. Chip! He worries his butt. Prrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Kitty unpins her hat and sets it down calmly, patting her henna hair, and a prettier, a daintier head of winsome cuddles was never seen on a whore's shoulders. Lynch puts on her hat. She whips it off. Lynch laughs, and to such delights has Mechnikov inoculated anthropoid apes. Flurry nods. Locomotor ataxy. Zoe, gaily, oh, my dictionary. Lynch, three wise virgins. Virag, Ague shaken, profuse yellow spawn foaming over his bony epileptic lips. She sold love filters, white wax, orange flower. Panther, the Roman centurion, polluted her with his genitories. He sticks out a flickering, phosphorescent scorpion tongue, his hand on his fork. Messiah! He bust her tympanum! With gibbering baboons cries, he jocks his hips in the cynical spasm. Hick, hick, hack, hock, hook, cock, cock! Then Jumbo Dollard, rubicund, muscle-bound, hairy-nostrilled, huge-bearded, cabbage-eared, shaggy-chested, shock-maned, fat-papped, stands forth, his lines and gentles tightened into a pair of black bathing bag slops. Ben Dollard, knackering castanet bones in his huge padded paws, yodels jovially in bass barrel tone, when love absorbs my ardent soul. The virgins Nurse Callan and Nurse Quigley burst through the ringkeepers and the ropes and mop him with open arms. The virgins, gushingly, Big Ben, Ben, my tree! A voice, Hold that fellow with the bad breeches! Ben Dollard smites his thigh in abundant laughter. Hold him now! Henry, caressing on his breast a severed female head, murmurs, Thine heart, mine love. He plucks his lute strings. When first I saw... Virag, sloughing his skins, his multitudinous plumage molting, rats, he yawns, showing a cold black throat, and closes his jaws by an upward push of his parchment roll, after having said which I took my departure. Farewell, fare thee well, drech. Henry Flower combs his moustache and beard rapidly with a pocket comb, and gives a cow's lick to his hair. Steered by his rapier, he glides to the door, his wild harp slung behind him. Virag reaches the door in two ungainly stilt hops, his tail cocked, and deftly claps sideways on the wall a pussy yellow flybill, butting it with his head. The flybill. K. 2. Paul Snow Bills. Strictly confidential. Dr. High Franks. Henry. All is lost now. Virag unscrews his head in a trice and holds it under his arm. Virag's head, quack, exeunt severally. Stephen, over his shoulder to Zoe, you would have preferred the fighting parson who founded the Protestant error, but beware Antisthenes, the dog sage, and the last end of Arius Heresiarchus, the agony in the closet. Lynch, all one and the same god to her. Stephen, devoutly, and sovereign lord of all things. Flory, to Stephen, I'm sure you're a spoiled priest or a monk. Lynch, he is, a cardinal's son. Stephen, cardinal sin, monks of the screw. His eminence, Simon Stephen Cardinal Dedalus, primate of all Ireland, appears in the doorway, dressed in red soutane, sandals and socks. Seven dwarf simian acolytes, also in red, cardinal sins, uphold his train, peeping under it. He wears a battered silk hat sideways on his head. His thumbs are stuck in his armpits and his palms outspread. Round his neck hangs a rosary of corks, ending on his breast in a corkscrew cross. Releasing his thumbs, he invokes grace from on high with large wave gestures, and proclaims with bloated pomp, the cardinal, Conservio lies captured, he lies in the lowest dungeon, with the manacles and chains around his limbs, weighing upwards of three tons. He looks at all for a moment, his right eye closed tight, his left cheek puffed out. Then, unable to repress his merriment, he rocks to and fro, arms akimbo, and sings with broad, rollicking humour, Oh, the poor little fellow! He, 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 his legs, they were yellow. He was plump, fat and heavy, and brisk as a snake. But some bloody savage, to graze his white cabbage, he murdered Nell Flaherty's duck-loving drake. A multitude of midges swarms white over his robe. He scratches himself with crossed arms at his ribs, grimacing, and exclaims, I'm suffering the agony of the damned by the hokey fiddle. Thanks be to Jesus, those funny little chaps are not unanimous. If they were, they'd walk me off the face of the bloody globe. 
His head is slant, he blesses courtly with fore and middle fingers, imparts the Easter kiss, and double shuffles off comically, swaying his hat from side to side, shrinking quickly to the size of his train bearers. The dwarf acolytes, giggling, peeping, nudging, ogling, Easter kissing, zigzag behind him. His voice is heard mellow from afar, merciful male, melodious. Shall carry my heart to thee, shall carry my heart to thee, and the breath of the balmy night shall carry my heart to thee. The trick door handle toddens. The door handle, see? Zoe, the devil is in that door. A male form passes down the creaking staircase, and is heard taking the waterproof and hat from the rack. Bloom starts forward involuntarily, and half closing the door as he passes, takes the chocolate from his pocket and offers it nervously to Zoe. Zoe sniffs his hair briskly. Hmm, thank your mother for the rabbits. I'm very fond of what I like. Bloom, hearing a male voice and talk with the whores on the doorstep, pricks his ears. If it were he, after, or because not, or the double event. Zoe tears open the silver foil. Fingers was made before forks. She breaks off and nibbles a piece, gives a piece to Kitty Ricketts, and then toddens kittenishly to Lynch. No objection to French lozenges. He nods. She taunts him. Have it now, or wait till you get it. He opens his mouth, his head cocked. She whirls the prize in left circle. His head follows. She whirls it back in right circle. He eyes her. Catch! She tosses a piece. With an adroit snap he catches it and bites it through with a crack. Kitty! chewing. The engineer I was with at the bazaar does have lovely ones, full of the best liqueurs, and the viceroy was there with his lady. The gas we had on the Tufts hobby horses. I'm giddy still. Bloom, in Svengali's fur overcoat, with folded arms and Napoleonic forelock, frowns in ventriloquial exorcism, with piercing eagle glance towards the door. Then rigid with left foot advanced, he makes a swift pass with impelling fingers and gives the sign of past master, drawing his right arm downwards from his left shoulder. Go, 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 I conjure you, whoever you are. A male cough and thread are heard passing through the mist outside. Bloom's features relax. He places a hand in his waistcoat, posing calmly. Zoe offers him chocolate. Bloom, solemnly. Thanks. Zoe, do as your bid. Here. A firm heel clacking thread is heard on the stairs. Bloom takes the chocolate. Aphrodisiac. Tansy and Penny Royal. But I bought it. Vanilla, calms, or Nemo. Confused light confuses memory. Red influences lupus. Colors affect women's characters, any they have. This black makes me sad. Eat and be merry for tomorrow. He eats. Influence taste, too. Mauve. But it is so long since I... Seems new. Afro. That priest. Must come. Better late than never. Try truffles at Andrews. The door opens. Bella Cohen, a massive whore mistress enters. She is dressed in a three-quarter ivory gown, fringed round the hem with tasseled selvage, and cools herself, fluttering a black horn fan like Minnie Hawk in Carmen. On her left hand are wedding and keeper rings. Her eyes are deeply carboned. She has a sprouting moustache. Her olive face is heavy, slightly sweated and full-nosed, with orange-tainted nostrils. She has large pendant beryllia drops. Bella, my word, I'm all of a muck sweat. She glances round her at the couples. Then her eyes rest on Bloom with hard insistence. Her large fan winnows wind towards her heated face, neck, and embon point. Her falcon eyes glitter. The fan, flirting quickly, then slowly. Married. I see. Bloom, yes. Partly I have mislaid the fan, half opening, then closing, and the missus's master. Petticoat government. Bloom looks down with a sheepish grin. That is so. The fan, folding together, rests against her left eardrop. Have you forgotten me? Bloom, yes. Yo. The fan, folded akimbo against her waist. Is me her was you dreamed before? Was then she him you was since knew? Am all them and the same now we? Bella approaches, gently tapping with the fan. Bloom, wincing, powerful being, in my eyes read that slumber which women love. The fan, tapping, we have met, you are mine, it is fate. Bloom, cowed, 
exuberant female. Enormously I desiderate your domination. I am exhausted, abandoned, no more young. I stand, so to speak, with an unposted letter bearing the extra regulation fee before the too late box of the General Post Office of Human Life. The door and window open at a right angle, cause a draft of thirty-two feet per second, according to the law of falling bodies. I have felt this instant a twinge of sciatica in my left gluteal muscle. It runs in our family. Poor dear papa, a widower, was a regular barometer from it. He believed in animal heat. A skin of tabby lined his winter waistcoat. Near the end, remembering King David and the Sunamite, he shared his bed with Athos, faithful after death. A dog spittle, as you probably... He winces. Ah! Richie Goulding, bag-weighted, passes the door. Mocking his catch! Best value in dob! Fit for a prince's! Liver and kidney! The fan, tapping. All things end. Be mine. Now. Bloom, undecided. All now? I should not have parted with my talisman. Rain, exposure at due fall on the sea rocks, a peccadillo at my time of life. Every phenomenon has a natural cause. The fan points downward slowly. You may. Bloom looks downwards and perceives her unfastened bootlace. We are observed. The fan points downwards quickly. You must. Bloom, with desire, with reluctance. I can make a true black knot. Learned when I served my time and worked the mail order line for Kellett's. Experienced hand. Every knot says a lot. Let me. In courtesy. I knelt once before today. Ah. Bella raises her gown slightly and, steadying her pose, lifts to the edge of a chair a plump buskind hoof and a full pastern, silk socked. Bloom, stiff legged, aging, bends over her hoof and with gentle fingers draws out and in her laces. Bloom. Murmurs lovingly, to be a shoe fitter in Manfield's was my love's young dream, the darling joys of sweet button hooking, to lace up criss crossed to knee length, the dressy kid footwear satin lined, so incredibly impossibly small of Clyde Road ladies, even their wax model Raymond I visited daily to admire her cobweb hose and stick of rhubarb toe, as worn in Paris. The hoof smell my hot goat hide. Feel my royal weight. Bloom, cross-lacing. Too tight. The hoof, if you bungle, handy, Andy, I'll kick your football for you. Bloom, not to lace the wrong eyelet as I did the night of the bizarre dance. Bad luck. Hook in wrong tash of her. Person, you mentioned. That night she met. Now. He knots the lace. Bella places her foot on the floor. Bloom raises his head. Her heavy face, her eyes, strike him in mid-brow. His eyes grow dull, darker and pouched. His nose thickens. Bloom mumbles, awaiting your further orders, we remain, gentlemen. Bellow, with a hard basilisk stare in a baritone voice. Hound of dishonor! Bloom, infatuated. Empress! Bellow, his heavy cheek chops sagging. Adorer of the adulterous rump! Bloom, plaintively. Hugeness! Bellow, dung devourer! Bloom, with sinew semi-flexed. Mag-magnificence. Bellow, down. He taps her on the shoulder with his fan. Incline feet forward. Slide left foot one pace back. You will fall. You are falling. On the hands down. Bloom, her eyes upturned in the sign of admiration. Closing yaps. Truffles. With a piercing epileptic cry she sinks on all fours. Grunting, snuffling, rooting at his feet. Then lies, shamming dead, with eyes shut tight, trembling eyelids, bowed upon the ground in the attitude of most excellent master. Bellow, with bobbed hair, purple gills, fit moustache rings round his shaven mouth, in mountaineer's puttees, green silver-buttoned coat, sports skirt and alpine hat with more cock's feather, his hand stuck deep in his breeches' pockets, places his heel on her neck and grinds it in. Footstool! Feel my entire weight! Bow, bond slave, before the throne of your despot's glorious heels, so glistening in their proud erectness! Bloom, enthralled, bleats, I promise never to disobey. Bello laughs loudly. Holy smoke! You little know what's in store for you. I'm the Tartar to settle your little lot and break you in. I'll bet Kentucky cocktails all round I shame it out of you, old son. Cheek me, I dare you, if you do tremble in anticipation of heel discipline to be inflicted in gym costume. 
Bloom creeps under the sofa and peers out through the fringe. Zoe, widening her slip to screen her. She's not here. Bloom, closing her eyes. She's not here. Flory, hiding her with her gown. She didn't mean it, Mr. Bellow. She'll be good, sir. Kitty, don't be too hard on her, Mr. Bellow. Sure you won't, ma'am, sir. Bellow, coaxingly. Come, ducky dear, I want a word with you, darling, just to administer correction. Just a little heart-to-heart -heart talk, sweetie. Bloom puts out her timid head. There's a good girlie now. Bellow grabs her hair violently and drags her forward. I only want to correct you for your own good on a soft, safe spot. How's that tender behind? Oh, ever so gently, pet. Begin to get ready. Bloom, fainting. Don't tear my... Bellow, savagely. The nose ring, the pliers, the bastinado, the hanging hook, the knout. I'll make you kiss while the flutes play like the Nubian slave of old. You're in for it this time. I'll make you remember me for the balance of your natural life. His forehead vein swollen, his face congested. I shall sit on your ottoman saddle back every morning after my thumping good breakfast of Matterson's fat ham rashers and a bottle of Guinness's porter. He belches and suck my thumping good stock exchange cigar while I read the licensed Vittler's Gazette. Very possibly I shall have you slaughtered and skewered in my stables and enjoy a slice of you with crisp crackling from the baking tin, basted and baked like socking pig with rice and lemon or currant sauce. It will hurt you. He twists her arm. Bloom squeals, turning turtle. Bloom, don't be cruel, nurse. Don't. Bellow, twisting, another. Bloom screams, Oh, it's hell itself. Every nerve in my body aches like mad. Bellow shouts, Good, by the rumping, jumping general, that's the best bit of news I heard these six weeks. Here, don't keep me waiting, damn you. He slaps her face. Bloom whimpers, They're after hitting me, I'll tell. Bellow, hold him down, girls, till I squat on him. Zoe, yes. Walk on him. I will. Flory, I will. Don't be greedy. Kitty, no, me. Lend him to me. The brothel cook, Mrs. Keogh, wrinkled, grey-bearded, in a greasy bib, men's grey and green socks and brogues, flour smeared, a rolling pin stuck with raw pastry in her bare red arm and hand, appears at the door. Mrs. Keogh, ferociously, can I help? They hold and pinion bloom. Bellow, Squats with a grunt on Bloom's uptodden face, puffing cigar smoke, nursing a fat leg. I see Keating Clay is elected vice chairman of the Richmond Asylum. And by the by, Guinness's preference shares are at sixteen three quaffers. Curse me for a foe that didn't buy that lot Craig and Gardner told me about. Just my infernal luck, curse it, and that goddamned outsider throw away at twenty to one. He quenches his cigar angrily on Bloom's ear. Where's that goddamned cursed ashtray? Bloom, goaded, buttock smothered. Oh, oh, monsters, cruel one. Bellow, ask for that every ten minutes. Beg, pray for it as you never prayed before. He thrusts out a figged fist and foul cigar. Here, kiss that, both, kiss. He throws a leg astride and, pressing with horseman's knees, calls in a hard voice, Yep, a cock horse to Banbury Cross. I'll ride him for the eclipse sticks. He bends sideways and squeezes his mount's testicles roughly, shouting, Oh, off we pop! I'll nurse you in proper fashion. He horse rides cock horse, leaping in the saddle. The lady goes a pace a pace, and the coachman goes a trot a trot, and the gentleman goes a gallop a gallop a gallop a gallop. Flory pulls at Bellow. Let me on him now. You had enough. I asked before you. Zoe pulling at Flory. Me, me, are you not finished with them yet, succorous? Bloom, stifling. Can't. Bellow, well, I'm not. Wait. He holds in his breath. Curse it. Here, this bung's about bust. He uncorks himself behind, then, contorting his features, farts loudly. Take that. He recorks himself. Yes, by jingo, sixteen three quarters. Bloom, a sweat breaking out over him. Not man. He sniffs. Woman. Bellow stands up. No more blow hot and cold. What you longed for has come to pass. Henceforth you are unmanned and mine in earnest, a thing under the yoke. Now for your punishment, frock. You will shed your male garments, you understand, Ruby Cohen, and don the shot silk luxuriously rustling over head and shoulders, and quickly too. Bloom shrinks. Silk? 
mistress said, or crinkly, scrapey, must I tip-touch it with my nails? Bellow points to his whores. As they are now, so will you be, wigged, singed, perfume-sprayed, rice-powdered, with smooth, shaven armpits. Tape measurements will be taken next your skin. You will be laced with cruel force into vice-like corsets of soft dove coutile, with whalebone busk to the diamond-trimmed pelvis, the absolute outside edge, while your figure, plumper than when at large, will be restrained in net tight frocks, pretty two-ounce petticoats, and fringes and things stamped, of course, with my house flag. Creations of lovely lingerie for Alice and nice scent for Alice. Alice will feel the pull-pull. Martha and Mary will be a little chilly at first in such delicate tie-casing, but the frilly flimsiness of lace round your bare knees will remind you. Bloom, a charming soubrette with dauby cheeks, mustard hair and large male hands and nose, leering mouth. I tried her things on only twice, a small prank in Hollis Street. When we were hard up, I washed them to save the laundry bill. My own shirts, I toddled. It was the purest thrift. Bellow, jeers, little jobs that make mother pleased, eh? And showed off coquettishly in your domino at the mirror behind close-drawn blinds, your unskirted thighs and he-goats others in various poses of surrender, eh? Ho, oh, ho, I have to laugh. That second-hand black opera top shift and short trunk leg naughties all split up the stitches at her last rape that Mrs. Miriam Dandred sold you from the Shelburne Hotel, eh? Bloom, Miriam, black, demi-mundane, bellow, guffaws. Christ almighty, it's too tickling, this. You are a nice-looking Miriam when you clipped off your back-gate hairs and lay swooning in the thing across the bed as Mrs. Dandrade, about to be violated by Lieutenant Smythe Smythe, Mr. Philip Augustus Blockwell, M.P., Signor Lachi Daremo, the robust tenor, blue-eyed Bert, the lift-by, Henri Fleury of Gordon Bennett fame, Sheridan the quadroon Croesus, the varsity wet Bob Eight from Old Trinity, Ponto, her splendid Newfoundland, and Bob's, Dowager Duchess of Manor Hamilton, he guffaws again, Christ, wouldn't it make a Siamese cat laugh? Bloom, her hands and features working, it was Gerald converted me to be a true corset lover when I was female impersonator in the high school play, vice versa. It was dear Gerald. He got that kink, fascinated by sister's stays. Now dearest Gerald uses pinky grease paint and gilds his eyelids. Cult of the beautiful. Bellow, with wicked glee. Beautiful. Give us a breather. When you took your seat with womanish care, lifting your billowy flounces on the smooth, worn throne. Bloom, science, to compare the various joys we each enjoy. Earnestly, and really it's better at the position, because often I used to wet. Bellow, sternly, no insubordination. The sawdust is there in the corner for you. I gave you strict instructions, didn't I? Do it standing, sir. I'll teach you to behave like a gentleman. If I catch a trace on your swaddles, aha, by the ass of the Dordans, you'll find I'm a martinet. The sins of your past are rising against you. Many, hundreds. The sins of the past in a medley of voices. He went through a form of clandestine marriage with at least one woman in the shadow of the black church. Unspeakable messages he telephoned mentally to Miss Dunn at an address in Dolier Street, while he presented himself indecently to the instrument in the call box. By word and deed, he frankly encouraged a nocturnal strumpet to deposit fecal and other matter in an unsanitary outhouse attached to empty premises, in five public conveniences, he wrote penciled messages offering his nuptial partner to all strong-membered males. And by the offensively smelling vitriol works, did he not pass night after night by loving courting couples, to see if and what and how much he could see? Did he not lie in bed, the gross bore, gloating over a nauseous fragment of well-used toilet paper presented to him by a nasty harlot, stimulated by gingerbread and a postal order? Bellow whistles loudly. Say! What was the most revolting piece of obscenity in all your career of crime? Go the whole hog! Puke it out! Be candid for once. Mute in human faces throng forward, leering, vanishing, gibbering, Booloohoom, Paldy Cock, Bootlaces, A Penny, Cassidy's Hag, Blind Stripling, Larry Rhinoceros, The Gettle, The Woman, The Whore, The Other, The Bloom. Don't ask me! Our mutual fate, Pleasant Street. I only thought the half of the... I swear on my sacred oath. Bellow peremptorily. Answer. Repugnant wretch. 
I insist on knowing. Tell me something to amuse me. Smut or a bloody good ghost story or a line of poetry. Quick, quick, quick. Where? How? What time? With how many? I give you just three seconds. One, two, th- Bloom. Docile. Gargles. I re re repugnosed in re 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 repugnant. Bellow imperiously. Oh, get out, you skunk. Hold your tongue. Speak when you're spoken to. Bloom bows. Master, mistress, man tamer. He lifts his arms. His bangle bracelets fill. Bellow satirically. By day you will souse and bat our smelling underclothes also when we ladies are unwell, and swab out our latrines with dress pinned up and a dishclout tied to your tail. Won't that be nice? He places a ruby ring on her finger. And there now, with this ring I the own. Say, thank you, mistress. Bloom, thank you, mistress. Bellow, you will make the beds, get my tub ready, empty the piss-pots in the different rooms, including old Mrs. Keogh's the cooks, a sandy one. Aye, and rinse the seven of them well, mind, or lap it up like champagne. Drink me piping hot. Hop! You will dance attendance, or I'll lecture you on your misdeeds, Miss Ruby, and spank your bare butt right well, miss, with the hairbrush. You'll be taught the error of your ways. At night your well-creamed braceleted hands will wear forty-three button gloves, new powdered with talc, and having delicately scented fingertips. For such favours knights of old lay down their lives. He chuckles. My boys will be no end charmed to see you so ladylike, the colonel above all, when they come here the night before the wedding to fondle my new attraction in gilded heels. First I'll have a go at you myself. A man I know on the turf named Charles Alberta Marsh. I was in bed with him just now, and another gentleman out of the Hanaper and Petty Bag Office is on the lookout for a maid of all work at a short knock. Swell the bust, smile, droop shoulders. What offers? He points. For that lot, trained by owner to fetch and carry, basket in mouth. He bears his arm and plunges it elbow deep in Bloom's vulva. There's fine depth for you. What, boys? That give you a hard on? He shoves his arm in a bidder's face. Here, wet the deck and wipe it round. A bidder. A florin. Dylan's lackey rings his handbell. The lackey. Bang! A voice. One and eightpence too much. Charles Alberta Marsh. Must be virgin. Good breath. Clean. Bellow. Gives a rap with his gavel. Too bare. Rock bottom figure and cheap at the price. Fourteen hands high. Touch and examine his points. Handle him. This downy skin, these soft muscles, this tender flesh. If I had only my gold piercer here, and quite easy to milk. Three new laid gallons a day, a pure stock getter due to lay within the hour. His sire's milk record was a thousand gallons of whole milk in forty weeks. Whoa, my jewel! Beg up! Whoa! He brands his initial C on Bloom's croup. So... Warranted Cohen. What advance on two bob, gentlemen? A dark-visaged man, in disguised accent. Hindut punt starlink. Voices, subdued. For the caliph, Harun al-Rashid. Bellow, gaily. Right, let them all come. The scanty, daringly short skirt, riding up at the knee to show a peep of white pantalette, is a potent weapon and transparent stockings, emerald gartered, with a long straight seam trailing up beyond the knee, appeal to the better instincts of the blasé man about town. Learn the smooth, mincing walk on four-inch Louis Can's heels, the Grecian bend with provoking croup, the thighs fluorescent, knees modestly kissing, bring all your powers of fascination to bear on them. Pander to their Gomorrah vices. Bloom bends his blushing face into his armpit and simpers with forefinger in mouth. Oh, I know what you're hinting at now. Bellow, what else are you good for, an impotent thing like you? He stoops and, peering, pokes with his fan rudely under the fat suet folds of Bloom's haunches. Up, up, Manx cat! What have we here? Where's your curly teapot gone to? Or who docked it on you, cock yally? Sing, birdie, sing. It's as limp as a boy of sixes doing his pooly behind a cart. Buy a bucket or sell your pump. Loudly. Can you do a man's job? Bloom. Eccles Street. Bellow, sarcastically. I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world. But there's a man of brawn in possession there. The tables are turned, my gay young fellow. He is something like a full-grown outdoor man. Well for you, you muff, if you had that weapon with knobs and lumps and warts all over it. He shot his bolt, I can tell you. 
foot to foot, knee to knee, belly to belly, bobs to breast. He's no eunuch, a shock of red hair he has sticking out of him behind like a furze bush. Wait for nine months, my lad. Holy ginger, it's kicking and coughing up and down in her guts already. That makes you wild, don't it? Touches the spot. He spits in contempt. Spittoon! Bloom, I was indecently treated. I informed the police. Hundred pounds. Unmentionable. I... Bellow. What if you could, lame duck? A downpour we want, not your drizzle. Bloom, to drive me mad. Mull, I forgot. Forgive. Mull, we still... Bellow, ruthlessly. No, Leopold Bloom. All is changed by woman's will since you slept horizontal in Sleepy Hollow your night of twenty years. Return and see. Old Sleepy Hollow calls over the world. Sleepy Hollow. Rip Van Wink. Rip Van Winkle. Bloom, in tattered moccasins with a rusty fowling piece, tiptoeing, finger-tipping, his haggard, bony, bearded face, peering through the diamond panes, cries out, I see her, it's she, the first night at Matt Dillon's, but that dress, the green, and her hair is dyed gold, and he... Bellow laughs mockingly, that's your daughter, you owl, with a Mullingar student. Millie Bloom, fair-haired, green-vested, slim-sandaled, her blue scarf in the sea-wind simply swirling, breaks from the arms of her lover and calls, her young eyes wonder wide. Millie, my, it's Papley, but oh, Papley, how old you've grown! Bello, changed, eh? Our what-not, our writing table, where we never wrote, Aunt Hegarty's armchair, our classic reprints of old masters. A man and his men friends are living there in clover. The cuckoo's rest, why not? How many women had you, eh? Following them up, dark streets, flat foot, exciting them by your smothered grunts. What, you male prostitute? Blameless dames with parcels of groceries. Turn about, source for the goose, my gander, oh. Bloom, they, I, bellow, cuttingly. Their heel marks will stamp the brusselet carpet you bought at Wren's auction. In their horseplay with Mull, the rump to find the buck flea in her breeches, they will deface the little statue you carried home in the rain for art for art's sake. They will violate the secrets of your bottom drawer. Pages will be torn from your handbook of astronomy to make them pipe spills, and they will spit in your ten-shilling brass fender from Hampton Leadums. Bloom, ten and six. The act of low scoundrels. Let me go. I will return. I will prove. A voice. Swear. Bloom clenches his fists and crawls forward, a bowie knife between his teeth. Bellow. As a paying guest or a kept man. Too late. You have made your second best bed, and others must lie in it. Your epitaph is written. You are down and out, and don't you forget it, old bean. Bloom. Justice. All Ireland versus one. Has nobody. He bites his thumb. Bellow, die and be damned to you if you have any sense of decency or grace about you. I can give you a rare old wine that'll send you skipping to hell and back. Sign a will and leave us any coin you have. If you have none, see you damn well get it, steal it, rob it. We'll bury you in our shrubbery jakes where you'll be dead and dirty with old Cook Cohen, my step-nephew I married, the bloody old gouty procurator and sodomite with a crick in his neck, and my other ten or eleven husbands, whatever the buggers' names were, suffocated in the one cesspool. He explodes in a loud, phlegmy laugh. We'll manure you, Mr. Flower! He pipes, scoffingly. Bye-bye, Paldy. Bye-bye, Papley. Bloom clasps his head. My willpower, memory, I have sinned, I have suff... He weeps tearlessly. Bello sneers. Cry, babby, crocodile tears. Bloom, broken, closely veiled for the sacrifice, sobs, his face to the earth. The passing bell is heard. Dark shawled figures of the circumcised, in sackcloth and ashes, stand by the wailing wall. M. Shalomovitz, Joseph Goldwater, Moses Herzog, Harris Rosenberg, M. Meisel, J. Citron, Minnie Watchman, P. Mastiansky, the Reverend Leopold Abramovitz, Chazen. With swaying arms they wail in Numa over the recreant bloom. The circumcised, in dark guttural chant as they cast dead sea fruit upon him, no flowers. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Voices sighing. So he's gone. 
Ah, yes. Yes, indeed. Bloom? Never heard of him. No? Queer kind of chap. There's the widow. That's so. Ah, yes. From the sooty pyre the flame of gun camphor ascends. The pall of incense smoke screens and disperses. Out of her oak frame a nymph with hair unbound, lightly clad in tea-brown art colours, descends from her grotto and, passing under interlacing yews, stands over bloom. The yews, their leaves whispering, Sister, our sister, shh! The nymph, softly, mortal, kindly, Nay, dost not weepest. Bloom crawls jellily forward under the boughs, streaked by sunlight with dignity. This position, I felt it was expected of me. Force of habit. The nymph, mortal, you found me in evil company. High kickers, coster picnic makers, pugilists, popular generals, immoral panto boys in flesh tights, and the nifty shimmy dancers, La Aurora and Carini, musical act, the hit of the century. I was hidden in cheap pink paper that smelt of rock oil. I was surrounded by the stale smut of clubmen, stories to disturb callow youth, ads for transparencies, trued-up dice and bust pads, proprietary articles, and why wear a truss with testimonial from ruptured gentlemen, useful hints to the married. Bloom lifts a turtle head towards her lap. We have met before, on another star. The nymph, sadly, rubber goods, never rip brand as supply to the aristocracy. Corsets for men, I cure fits or money refunded, unsolicited testimonials for Professor Waldman's wonderful chest exuber. My bust developed four inches in three weeks, reports Mrs. Gus Rublin with photo. Bloom, you mean photo bits? The nymph, I do. You bore me away, framed me in oak and tinsel, set me above your marriage couch. Unseen, one summer eve, you kissed me in four places, and with the loving pencil you shaded my eyes, my bosom, and my shame. Bloom humbly kisses her long hair. Your classic carves, beautiful, immortal. I was glad to look on you, to praise you, a thing of beauty, almost to pray. The nymph, during dark nights I heard your praise. Bloom. Quickly, yes, yes, you mean that I hear. Sleep reveals the worst side of everyone. Children, perhaps, excepted. I know I fell out of bed, or rather was pushed. Steel wine is said to cure snoring. For the rest, there is that English invention, pamphlet, of which I received some days ago, incorrectly addressed. It claims to afford a noiseless, inoffensive vent. He sighs, Twas ever thus. Frailty thy name is marriage. The nymph, her fingers in her ears, and words. They are not in my dictionary. Bloom, you understood them. The yews, shh. The nymph covers her face with her hands. What have I not seen in that chamber? What must my eyes look down on? Bloom, apologetically. I know. Soiled personal linen, wrong side up with care. The quites are loose, from Gibraltar by long sea long ago. The nymph, Bends her head, worse, worse. Bloom reflects precautiously that antiquated commode. It wasn't her weight. She scaled just eleven stone nine. She put on nine pounds after weaning. It was a crack and want of glue. Eh? And that absurd orange keyed utensil which has only one handle. The sound of a waterfall is heard in bright cascade. The waterfall. Pull a fuca, pull a fuca. Pula fuca, pula fuca. The ewes, mingling their boughs, listen, whisper. She is right, our sister. We grew by pula fuca waterfall. We gave shade on languorous summer days. John Wise Nolan, in the background, in Irish National Forester's uniform, doffs his plumed hat. Prosper, give shade on languorous days, trees of Ireland. The ewes, murmuring, who came to Pulafuca with the high school excursion? Who left his not questing classmates to seek our shade? Bloom, scared. High school of Pula. Nemo, not in full possession of faculties. Concussion, run over by tram. The echo, sham. Bloom, pigeon-breasted, bottle-shouldered, padded, in nondescript juvenile grey and black striped suit, too small for him, white tennis shoes, bordered stockings with turnover tops and a red school cap with badge. 
I was in my teens, a growing boy. A little then sufficed, a jolting care, the mingling odours of the ladies' cloakroom and lavatory, the throng penned tight on the old royal stairs, for they love crushes, instinct of the herd, and the dark sex-smelling theatre unbridled's vice, even a priceless of their hosiery. And then the heat. There were sunspots that summer, end of school, and tipsy cake. Halcyon days. Halcyon days, high school boys in blue and white football jerseys and shorts, Master Donald Turnbull, Master Abraham Chatterton, Master Owen Goldberg, Master Jack Meredith, Master Percy Apjohn, stand in a clearing of the trees and shout to Master Leopold Bloom. The Halcyon days, Mackerel, live us again, hooray! They cheer. Bloom, hobbledy high, warm gloved, Mama mufflered. Starred with spent snowballs, struggles to rise. Again, I feel sixteen. What a lark! Let's ring all the bells in Montague Street. He cheers feebly. Hooray for the high school. The echo, fool. The ewes, rustling. She is right, our sister. Whisper. Whispered kisses are heard in all the wood. Faces of hamadryads peep out from the bowls and among the leaves, and break, blossoming into bloom. Who profaned our silent shade? The nymph, coyly, through parting fingers. There, in the open air. The ewes, sweeping downward, sister yes, and on our virgin sward. The waterfall. Pula foca, pula foca, foca foca, foca foca. The nymph, with white fingers. Oh, infamy! Bloom, I was precocious. Youth, the fauna. I sacrificed to the god of the forest, the flowers that bloom in the spring. It was pairing time. Capillary attraction is a natural phenomenon. Lottie Clark, flaxen-haired, I saw at her night toilette through ill-closed curtains with poor papa's opera glasses. The wanton ate grass wildly. She rolled downhill at Rialto Bridge to tempt me with her flow of animal spirits. She climbed their crooked tree and I... A saint couldn't resist it. The demon possessed me. Besides, who saw? Staggering Bob, a white polled calf, thrusts a ruminating head with humid nostrils through the foliage. Staggering Bob, large teardrops rolling from his prominent eyes, snivels. Me, me see. Bloom, simply satisfying a need I... With pathos. No, girl would when I went girling. Too ugly, they wouldn't play. High on Ben Holt. Through rhododendrons, an anigoat passes, plump, othered, butty tailed, dropping currents. The nanny goat bleats, Mag gang gang gang, nanny. Bloom, hatless, flushed, covered with burls of thistledown and gorse spine. Regularly engaged, circumstances alter cases. He gazes intently downwards on the water, thirty two head over heels per second, press nightmare. Giddy Elijah, fall from cliff, sad end of government printer's clerk. Through silver silent summer air, the dummy of bloom, rolled in a mummy, rolls rotatingly from the lion's head cliff into the purple waiting waters. The dummy mummy, <coughs> far out in the bay between Bailey and Kish lights, the Erin's king sails, sending a broadening plume of coal smoke from her funnel towards the land. Councillor Nanetti, alone on deck, in dark alpaca, yellow kite-faced, his hand in his waistcoat opening, declaims, When my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have... Bloom. Done. Pfft. The nymph, loftily. We immortals, as you saw today, have not such a place and no hair there either. We are stone, cold, and pure. We eat electric light. She arches her body in lascivious crispation, placing her forefinger in her mouth. Spoke to me, heard from behind. How then could you? Bloom, pawing the heather abjectly. Oh, I have been a perfect pig. Enemas, too, I have administered. One third of a pint of quassia to which add a tablespoonful of rock salt. Up the fundament, with Hamilton Long syringe, the lady's friend. The nymph, in my presence, the powder puff. She blushes and makes a knee. And the rest. Bloom, 
dejected. Yes, Peck Harvey. I have paid homage on that living altar where the back changes name. With sudden fervor, for why should the dainty-scented jeweled hand, the hand that rules? Figures wind serpenting in slow woodland pattern around the tree stems, cooing. The voice of Kitty, in the thicket, show us one of them cushions. The voice of Flory, here. A grouse wings clumsily through the underwood. The voice of Lynch, in the thicket, whew, piping hot. The voice of Zoe, from the thicket, came from a hot place. The voice of Virag, a bird chief, blue-streaked and feathered in war panoply with his assegai, striding through a crackling cane break over beech mast and acorns. Hot, hot, where, sitting bull? Bloom, it overpowers me, the warm impress of her warm form, even to sit where a woman has sat, especially with divaricated thighs, as though to grant the last favors, most especially with previously well-uplifted white satin coat pans, so womanly, full, it fills me full. The Waterfall Filla fulla, pula fuka, pula fuka, pula fuka, the ewes, shh. Sister, speak. The nymph, eyeless, in nun's white habit, quaff and huge winged wimple, softly with remote eyes. Tranquilla convent, Sister Agatha, Mount Carmel, the apparitions of Knock and Lourdes, no more desire. She reclines her head, sighing, only the ethereal, where dreamy, creamy gull waves o'er the waters dull. Bloom half rises, his back trouser button snaps. The button, bip! Two slots of the comb dance rainily by, shawled, yelling flatly. The slots, oh, Leopold lost the pen of his drawers. He didn't know what to do to keep it up, to keep it up. Bloom, coldly, you have broken the spell, the last straw. If there were only ethereal, where would you all be? Postulants and novices, shy but willing like an ass pissing. The hues, their silver foil of leaves precipitating, their skinny arms aging and swaying, deciduously. The nymph, her features hardening, gropes in the folds of her habit. Sacrilege! To attempt my virtue! A large moist stain appears on her robe. Sully my innocence! You are not fit to touch the garment of a pure woman! She clutches again in her robe. Wait, Satan, you'll sing no more love songs. Amen, 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 amen. She draws a poniard and, clad in the sheet mail of an elected knight of nine, strikes at his lines. Nekum! Bloom starts up, seizes her hand. Hoy! Nabracada! Cat of nine lives! Fair play, madam! No pruning knife! The fox and the grapes, is it? What do you lack with your barbed wire? Crucifix not thick enough! He clutches her veil. A holy abbot you want, or Brophy the lame gardener, or the spoutless statue of the water carrier, or good mother Alphonsus, eh, Renard? The nymph, with a cry, flees from him, unveiled, her plaster cast cracking, a cloud of stench escaping from the cracks. Polly! Bloom calls after her, as if you didn't get it on the double yourselves. No jerks and multiple mucosities all over you. I tried it. Your strength, our weakness. What's our stud fee? What will you pay on the nail? You fee men dancers on the Riviera, I read. The fleeing nymph raises a keen. Eh? I have sixteen years of black slave labor behind me. And would a jury give me five shillings alimony tomorrow, eh? Fool someone else, not me. He sniffs. Rot. Onions. Stale. Sulphur. Grease. The figure of Bella Cohen stands before him. Bella, you'll know me the next time. Bloom, composed, regards her. Passe, mutton dressed as lamb, long in the tooth and superfluous hair. A raw onion the last thing at night would benefit your complexion. And take some double chin drill. Your eyes are as vapid as the glass eyes of your stuffed fox. They have the dimensions of your other features, that's all. I'm not a triple-screw propeller. Bella, contemptuously, you're not game, in fact. Her sow-cunt barks, fbracht. Bloom, contemptuously, clean your nailless middle finger first. Your bully's cold spunk is dripping from your coxcomb. Take a handful of hay and wipe yourself. Bella, I know you, canvasser, dead cod. Bloom, 
I saw him, Kip Keeper, Pox and Gleet Vendor. Bella turns to the piano. Which of you was playing the dead match from Saul? Zoe, me, mind your con flowers. She darts to the piano and bangs cords on it with crossed arms. The cats rambled through the slag. She glances back. Eh? Who's making love to my sweeties? She darts back to the table. What's yours is mine and what's mine is my own. Kitty, disconcerted, coats her teeth with the silver paper. Bloom approaches Zoe. Bloom, gently, give me back that potato, will you? Zoe, forfeits, a fine thing and a super fine thing. Bloom, with feeling, it is nothing but still, a relic of poor mamma. Zoe, give a thing and take it back. God'll ask you, where is that? You'll say you don't know. God'll send you down below. Bloom, there is a memory attached to it. I should like to have it. Stephen, to have or not to have, that is the question. Zoe, here. She hauls up a reef of her slip, revealing her bare thigh, and unrolls the potato from the top of her stocking. Those that hides knows where to find. Bella frowns. Here. This isn't a musical peep show. And don't you smash that piano. Who's paying here? She goes to the pianola. Stephen fumbles in his pocket and, taking out a banknote by its corner, hands it to her. Stephen, with exaggerated politeness, This silken purse I made out of the sow's ear of the public. Madam, excuse me, if you allow me. He indicates vaguely Lynch and Bloom. We are all in the same sweepstake, Kinch and Lynch. Dans ce bordel où tenons nostre da. Lynch calls from the hearth. Dedalus, give her your blessing for me. Stephen hands Bella a coin. Gold. She has it. Bella looks at the money, then at Stephen, then at Zoe, Flory, and Kitty. Do you want three gettles? It's ten shillings here. Stephen, delightedly. A hundred thousand apologies. He fumbles again and takes out and hands her two crowns. Permit, brevimano, my sight is somewhat troubled. Bella goes to the table to count the money, while Stephen talks to himself in monosyllables. Zoe bends over the table. Kitty leans over Zoe's neck. Lynch gets up, writes his cap, and, clasping Kitty's waist, adds his head to the group. Flory strives heavily to rise. Oh, my foot's asleep. She limps over to the table. Bloom approaches. Bella, Zoe, Kitty, Lynch, Bloom, chattering and squabbling. The gentleman, ten shillings, paying for the three. Allow me a moment. This gentleman pays separate. Who's touching it? Oh, Mind who you're pinching. Are you staying the night or a short time? Who did? You're a liar, excuse me. The gentleman paid down like a gentleman. Drink. It's long after eleven. Stephen, at the pianola, making a gesture of abhorrence. No bottles. What, eleven? A riddle. Zoe, lifting up her petty gown and folding a half-sovereign into the top of her stocking. Hard earned on the flat of my back. Lynch, lifting Kitty from the table. Come. Kitty, wait. She clutches the two crowns. Flory and me? Lynch. Hoopla! He lifts her, carries her, and bumps her down on the sofa. Stephen. The fox crew, the cocks flew, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for her poor soul to get out of heaven. Bloom quietly lays a half-sovereign on the table between Bella and Flory. So, allow me. He takes up the pound note. Three times ten were square. Bella, admiringly, you're such a sly boots, old cocky. I could kiss you. Zoe points. Hem, deep as a draw well. Lynch bends Kitty back over the sofa and kisses her. Bloom goes with the pound note to Stephen. Bloom, this is yours. Stephen, how is that? Le distrait or absent-minded beggar? He fumbles again in his pocket and draws out a handful of coins. An object fills. That fell. Bloom, stooping, picks up and hands a box of matches. This. Stephen. Lucifer. Thanks. Bloom. Quietly. You had better hand over that cash to me to take care of. Why pay more? Stephen. Hands him all his coins. Be just before you are generous. Bloom. I will, but is it wise? He counts. One, seven, eleven, and five. Six, eleven. I don't answer for what you may have lost. Stephen, why striking eleven? pro Moment before the next, Lessing says, thirsty fox. 
He laughs loudly. Burying his grandmother, probably he killed her. Bloom, that is one pound six and eleven. One pound seven, say. Stephen, doesn't matter a rambling dam. Bloom, no, but... Stephen, comes to the table. Cigarette, please. Lynch tosses a cigarette from the sofa to the table. And so Georgina Johnson is dead and married. A cigarette appears on the table. Stephen looks at it. Wonder. Parlor magic. Married. Hmm. He strikes a match and proceeds to light the cigarette with enigmatic melancholy. Lynch, watching him, you would have a better chance of lighting it if you held the match nearer. Stephen brings the match near his eye. Lynx eye. Must get glasses. Broke them yesterday. Sixteen years ago. Distance. The eye sees all flat. He draws the match away. It goes out. Brain thinks. Near. Far. Ineluctable modality of the visible. He frowns mysteriously. Hmm. Sphinx. The beast that has two backs at midnight. Married. Zoe. It was a commercial traveller married her and took her away with him. Flurry. Nods. Mr. Lamb from London. Stephen. Lamb of London who takest away the sins of our world. Lynch. Embracing Kitty on the sofa. Chants deeply. Dona nobis pacem. The cigarette slips from Stephen's fingers. Bloom picks it up and throws it in the grate. Bloom, don't smoke. You ought to eat. Cursed dog I met. To Zoe. You have nothing. Zoe. Is he hungry? Stephen extends his hand to her, smiling, and chants to the air of the blood oath in the dusk of the gods. Hang in the hunger, frag in the frau, macht uns alle kaputt. Zoe, tragically. Hamlet, I am thy father's gimlet. She takes his hand. Blue eyes, beauty, I'll read your hand. She points to his forehead. No wit, no wrinkles. She counts. Two, three. Mars, that's courage. Stephen shakes his head. No kid. Lynch, sheet, lightning, courage. The youth who could not shiver and shake. To Zoe. Who taught you palmistry? Zoe, Tuddens. Ask my bellocks that I haven't got. To Stephen. I see it in your face. The eye like that. She frowns with lowered head. Lynch, laughing, slaps Kitty behind twice. Like that. Pandy bat. Twice loudly a pandy bat cracks. The coffin of the pianola flies open. The barred little round jack-in-the-box head of Father Dolan springs up. Father Dolan. Any by one flogging? Broke his glasses? Lazy-eyed little schemer? See it in your eye. Mild, benign, rectorial, reproving, the head of Don John Conmy rises from the pianola coffin. Don John Conmy. Now, Father Dolan. Now, I'm sure that Stephen is a very good little boy. Zoe, examining Stephen's palm. Woman's hand. Stephen murmurs. Continue. Lie. Hold me. Caress. I never could read his handwriting except his criminal thumbprint on the haddock. Zoe. What day were you born? Stephen. Thursday. Today. Zoe. Thursday's child has far to go. She traces lines on his hand. Line of fate. Influential friends. Flurry. Pointing. Imagination. Zoe, Mount of the Moon, you'll meet with a... She peers at his hands abruptly. I won't tell you what's not good for you. Or do you want to know? Bloom detaches her fingers and offers his palm. More harm than good. Here, read mine. Bella, show. She turns up Bloom's hand. I thought so. Knobby knuckles for the women. Zoe, peering at Bloom's palm. Gridiron, travels beyond the sea and marry money. Bloom, wrong. Zoe, quickly. Oh, I see. Short little finger, henpecked husband. That wrong? Black Liz, a huge rooster hatching in a chalked circle, rises, stretches her wings and clucks. Black Liz. Gah, cluck, cluck, cluck. She sidles from her new laid egg and waddles off. Bloom points to his hand. That wheel there is an accident. Fell and caught it twenty-two years ago. I was sixteen. Zoe, I see, says the blind man. Tell us news. Stephen, see, moves to one great goal. I am twenty-two. Sixteen years ago he was twenty-two, too. Sixteen years ago I, twenty-two, tumbled. Twenty-two years ago he, sixteen, fell off his hobby horse. He winces. Hurt my hand somewhere. Must see a dentist. Money? Zoe whispers to Flurry. 
They giggle. Bloom releases his hand and writes idly on the table in backhand, penciling slow curves. Flurry. What? A hackney car, number 324, with a gallant buttocked mare, driven by James Barton, Harmony Avenue, Donnybrook, trots past. Blazes Bylan and Lenehan sprawl swaying on the side seats. The Ormond Boots crouches behind on the axle. Sadly, over the cross-blind Lydia Deuce and Mina Kennedy gaze. The Boots, jogging, mocks them with thumb and wriggling warm fingers. Ha, ha, have you the horn? Bronze by gold, they whisper. Zoe, to Flory, whisper. They whisper again. Over the well of the car, Blazes Boylan leans, his boater straw set sideways, a red flower in his mouth. Lenehan in yachtsman's cap and white shoes officiously detaches a long hair from Blazes Boylan's coat shoulder. Lenehan, ho, oh, what do I here behold? Were you brushing the cobwebs off a few quims? Boylan, seated, smiles, plucking a turkey. Lenehan, a good night's work. Boylan, holding up four thick, blunt, ungulated fingers, winks. Blazes, Kate, up to sample or your money back. He holds out a forefinger. Smell that. Lenehan smells gleefully. Ah, lobster and mayonnaise. Ha! Ah. Zoe and Flory laugh together. Ha, 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 ha. jumps surely from the car and calls loudly for all to hear. Hello, Bloom. Mrs. Bloom, dressed yet? Bloom, in flunky's poon plush coat and knee breeches, buff stockings and powdered wig. I'm afraid not, sir. The last articles. Bylan tosses him sixpence. Here, to buy yourself a gin and splash. He hangs his hat smartly on a peg of Bloom's antlered head. Show me in. I have a little private business with your wife, you understand? Bloom, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Madam Tweedy is in her bath, sir. Marion, he ought to feel himself highly honoured. She plops splashing out of the water. Raoul, darling, come and dry me. I'm in my pelt. Only my new hat and a carriage sponge. Boylan, a merry twinkle in his eye. Topping. Bella, what? What is it? Zoe whispers to her. Marion, let him look, the pshog, pimp, and sc- Scourge himself, I'll write to a powerful prostitute, or Bartholomona, the bearded woman, to raise wheels out on him an inch thick and make him bring me back a signed and stamped receipt. Boylan clasps himself. Here, I can't hold this little lot much longer. He strides off on stiff cavalry legs. Bella, laughing. Ho, 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 ho. Boylan, to bloom over his shoulder, you can apply your eye to the keyhole and play with yourself while I just go through her a few times. Bloom, thank you, sir. I will, sir. May I bring two men chums to witness the deed and take a snapshot? He holds out an ointment jar. Vaseline, sir. Orange flower. Lukewarm water. Kitty, from the sofa. Tell us, Flory. Tell us. What? Flory whispers to her. Whispering love words, murmur, lip lapping loudly. Poppies make plop slop. Mina Kennedy, her eyes upturned. Oh, it must be like the scent of geraniums and lovely peaches. Oh, he simply idolises every bit of her, stuck together, covered with kisses. Lydia Deuce, her mouth opening, yum yum, oh, he's carrying her round the room, doing it, ride a cock horse. You could hear them in Paris and New York, like mouthfuls of strawberries and cream. Kitty, laughing, he he he, Bylan's voice, sweetly, hoarsely, in the pit of his stomach, ah, goblas, quark, brackets, crushed. Marion's voice, hoarsely, sweetly, rising to her throat. Oh, wish-washed, kissing, napuist, napuhuk. Bloom, his eyes wildly dilated, clasps himself. Show, hide, show, flower, more, shoot. Bella, Zoe, Flory, Kitty, hoo-hoo, ha-ha, hee-hee. Lynch, points, the mirror up to nature. He laughs. <laughs> Stephen and Bloom gaze in the mirror. The face of William Shakespeare, beardless, appears there, rigid in facial paralysis, crowned by the reflection of the reindeer antlered hat rack in the hall. Shakespeare, in dignified ventriloquy, tis the loud laugh bespeaks the vacant mind. To Bloom, thou thoughtest as how thou wastest invisible gaze. He crows with a black capon's laugh. 
Here go, go. How my old fellow chuck it is Thursday morning. Here go, go. Bloom smiles yellowly at the three whores. When will I hear the joke? Zoe, before you're twice married and once a widower. Bloom, lapses are condoned. Even the great Napoleon, when measurements were taken next the skin after his death. Mrs. Dynam, widow woman, her snub nose and cheeks flushed with death talk, tears and tunnies tawny sherry, hurries by in her weeds, her bonnet awry, rouging and powdering her cheeks, lips and nose, a pen chivying her brood of signets. Beneath her skirt appear her late husband's everyday trousers and turned up boots, large eights. She holds a Scottish widow's insurance policy and a large marquee umbrella under which her brood run with her. Patsy hopping on one shod foot, his collar loose, a hank of pork steaks dangling, Freddy whimpering, Susie with a crying cod's mouth, Alice struggling with the baby. She cuffs them on, her streamers flaunting aloft. Freddy, Ah, oh, ma, you're dragging me along. Susie, Mama, the beef tea is fizzing over. Shakespeare, with paralytic rage, What a sucker, who kill a fast? The face of Martin Cunningham, bearded, re-features Shakespeare's beardless face. The marquee umbrella sways drunkenly, the children run aside. Under the umbrella appears Mrs. Cunningham in merry widow hat and kimono gown. She glides, sidling and bowing, twirling Japaneseily. Mrs. Cunningham sings, and they call me the Jewel of Asia. Martin Cunningham gazes on her impassive, immense, most bloody awful demi rep. Stephen, et exaltabunto conua justi, queens lay with prize bulls. Remember Pasiphae, for whose lust my grand old gross father made the first confession box. Forget not Madame Grizzle Stevens, nor the suine scions of the house of Lambert. And Noah was drunk with wine, and his ark was open. Bella, none of that here. Come to the wrong shop. Lynch, let him alone. He's back from Paris. Zoe runs to Stephen and links him. Ah, go on. Give us some parlez-vous. Stephen claps hat on head and leaps over to the fireplace where he stands with shrugged shoulders, finny hands outspread, a painted smile on his face. Lynch, oh, mulling on the sofa. Rum, 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 rum. Stephen. Gabbles with marionette jerks. Thousand places of entertainment to expense your evenings with lovely ladies, sailing gloves and other things. Perhaps hers, heart, beer chops, perfect fashionable house, very eccentric, where lots cockots, beautiful dressed much about princesses like, are dancing can-can and walking their Parisian clowneries, extra foolish for bachelors, foreigns, the same if talking a poor English, how much smart they are on things love and sensations voluptuous. Mr.'s very Selects for his pleasure must to visit heaven and hell, show with mortuary candles, and they tear silver which occur every night. Perfectly shocking, terrific of religions, things, mockery seen in universal world. All chic women's which arrive full of modesty, then disrobe and squeal loud to see vampire man debauch none, very fresh young with dessous troublant. He clacks his tongue loudly. Ho oh, la la! Sapif killa! Lynch, vive le vampire! The whores. Bravo! Parlez-vous! Stephen, grimacing with head back, laughs loudly, clapping himself. Great success of laughing. Angels much prostitutes like, and holy apostles big damn ruffians. Demi-mondaines, nicely handsome sparkling of diamonds, very amiable costumed. Or do you are fond better what belongs they modern's pleasure torpitude of old man's? He points about him with grotesque gestures, which Lynch and the whores reply to. Co-chuck statue, woman reversible, our life-size, Tom Peep, Tom of virgins, nudities, very lesbic, the kiss five, ten times. Enter, gentlemen, to see in mirror every position's trapezes, all that machine there, besides, also, if desire, act awfully, bestial butchers by pollutes in warm veal liver, or omelette on the belly, pièce de Shakespeare. Bella, clapping her belly, sinks back on the sofa with a shout of laughter. An omelette on the... Oh, 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 I'm not under. Stephen, mincingly, I love you, sir darling. Speak your Englishman tongue for double entente cordiale. Oh, yes, mon loup. How much cost? Waterloo, water closet. 
He ceases suddenly and holds up a forefinger. Bella, laughing. Harmless. The whores, laughing. Encore! Encore! Stephen, mark me, I dreamt of a watermelon. Zoe, go abroad and love a foreign lady. Lynch, across the world for a wife. Flory, dreams goes by contraries. Stephen extends his arms. It was here, street of harlots. In Serpentine Avenue, Beelzebub showed me her, a fubsy widow. Where's the red carpet spread? Bloom, approaching Stephen. Look, Stephen, no, I flew. My foe is beneath me, and ever shall be, world without end. He cries, Peter, free! Bloom, I say, look, Stephen, break my spirit, will he? Oh, merde alors! He cries, his vulture talons sharpened. Hola! Hilly-o! Simon Dedalus' voice hillows in answer, somewhat sleepy but ready. Simon, that's all right. He swoops uncertainly through the air, wheeling, uttering cries of heartening on strong, ponderous, buzzard wings. Ho, oh, boy! Are you going to win? Hoop! Shut! Stable with those half-casts. Wouldn't let them within the ball of an ass. Head up! Keep our flag flying. An eagle ghoul vallon in a field urgent displayed. Ulster king at arms. Hey, hup! He makes the beagle's call, giving tongue. Bull, bull! Bull, 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 Hi, boy! The fronds and spaces of the wallpaper file rapidly across country. A stout fox, drawn from covert, brush-pointed, having buried his grandmother, runs swift for the open, bright-eyed, seeking badger earth under the leaves. The pack of staghounds follows, nose to the ground, sniffling their quarry, beagle-baying, burble-burling to be blooded. Ward Union huntsmen and huntswomen, live with them, hot for a kill. From six mile point, flat house, nine mile stone, follow the foot people with knotty sticks, hay forks, salmon gaffs, lassos, flock masters with stock whips, bear baiters with tom toms, toriadors with bull swords, grey negroes waving torches. The crowd balls of dicers, crown and anchor players, thimble riggers, broadsmen. Crows and touts, horse bookies in high wizard hats, clamour deafeningly. The crowd. Card of the races. Racing card. Ten to one the field. Tommy on the clay here. Tommy on the clay. Ten to one bar one. Ten to one bar one. Try your luck on spinning, Jenny. Ten to one bar one. Sell the monkey, boys. Sell the monkey. I'll give ten to one. Ten to one bar one. A dark horse, riderless, bolts like a phantom past the winning post, his mane moon-foaming, his eyeballs stars. The field follows, a bunch of bucking mounts, skeleton horses, scepter, Maximum the Second, Zinfandel, the Duke of Westminster shot over, repulse, the Duke of Beaufort Ceylon, Prix de Paris, dwarfs ride them, rusty armoured, leaping, leaping in there, in their saddles. Last in a drizzle of rain on a broken-winded Isabel Nag, Cock of the North, the favourite, honey cap, green jacket, orange sleeves, Garrett DC up, gripping the reins, a hockey stick at the ready. His nag on spavined, white, gaitered feet jogs along the rocky road. The orange lodges, jeering, Get down and push, muster, last lap, you'll be home the night. Garrett DC, bolt upright, his nail-scraped face plastered with postage stamps, brandishes his hockey stick, his blue eyes flashing in the prism of the chandelier as his mount lopes by at schooling gallop. Per vias rectus. A yoke of buckets leopards all over him, and his rearing nag a torrent of mutton broth with dancing kinds of carrots, barley, onions, turnips, potatoes. The green lodges. Soft day, Sir John, soft day, Your Honour. Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey pass beneath the windows, singing in discord. Stephen, hark, our friend noise in the street. Zoe holds up her hand. Stop! Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey, yet I've a sort of Yorkshire relish for Zoe, that's me. She claps her hands. Dance, dance! She runs to the pianola. Who has tuttons? Bloom, who'll lynch? Handing her coins. Here. Stephen, cracking his fingers impatiently. Quick, quick, where's my auger's rod? He runs to the piano and takes his ash plant, beating his foot in tripudium. Zoe turns the drum handle. There. She drops two pennies in the slot. Gold, pink, and violet lights start forth. The drum turns, purring in low, hesitation waltz. 
Professor Goodwin, in a bow-knotted periwig, in court dress, wearing a stained Inverness cape, bent in two from incredible age, totters across the room, his hands fluttering. He sits tinily on the piano stool, and lifts and beats handless sticks of arms on the keyboard, nodding with damsel's grace, his bow knot bobbing. Zoe twirls round herself, heel-tapping. Dance! Anybody here for there? Who'll dance? Clear the table! The pianola with changing lights plays in waltz time the prelude of My Girl's a Yorkshire Girl. Stephen throws his ash plant on the table and seizes Zoe round the waist. Flory and Bella push the table towards the fireplace. Stephen, arming Zoe with exaggerated grace, begins to waltz her round the room. Bloom stands aside. Her sleeve, filling from grazing arms, reveals a white flesh flower of vaccination. Between the curtains, Professor McGinney inserts a leg on the toe point of which spins a silk hat. With a deft kick, he sends it spinning to his crown and jaunty hatted skates in. He wears a slate frock coat with claret silk lapels, a gorget of cream tulle, a green low-cut waistcoat, stock collar with white kerchief, tight lavender trousers, patent pumps and canary gloves. In his buttonhole is an immense dahlia. He twaddles in reverse directions a clouded cane, then wedges it tight in his oxter. He places a hand lightly on his breastbone, bows, and fondles his flower and buttons. McGinney, the poetry of motion, art of calisthenics, no connection with Madame Leggett Burdens or Levinston's, fancy dress balls arranged, deportment, the catty lanner's step, so, watch me, my top's accordion abilities. He minuets forward three paces on tripping bee's feet. Tout le monde, en avant, reverence, tout le monde en place. The prelude ceases. Professor Goodwin, beating vague arms, shrivels, sinks, his live cape filling about the stool. The air in firmer waltz time sounds. Stephen and Zoe circle freely. The lights change, glow. Fied gold, rosy violet. The pianola. Two young fellows were talking about their girdles, 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 sweethearts they left behind. From a corner the morning hours run out, gold-haired, slim-sandaled, in girlish blue, wasp-waisted with innocent hands. Nimbly they dance, twirling their skipping ropes. The hours of noon follow in amber gold. Laughing, linked, high hair combs flashing, they catch the sun in mocking mirrors, lifting their arms. McGinney, clip claps, glove silent hands. Carré, avant de, breathe evenly, balance. The morning and noon hours waltz in their places, turning, advancing to each other, shaping their curves, bowing vis a vis. Cavaliers behind them arch and suspend their arms, with hands descending to, touching, rising from their shoulders. Hours, you may touch my cavaliers. May I touch your hours? Oh, but lightly. Cavaliers, oh so lightly. The pianola, my little shy little lass has a waist. Zoe and Stephen turn boldly with looser swing. The twilight hours advance from long land shadows, dispersed, lagging, languid-eyed, their cheeks delicate with cypria and false faint bloom. They are in grey gauze with dark bat sleeves that flutter in the land breeze. McGinney, avant oui, traversé, salut, cure de main, croisé. The night hours, one by one, steal to the last place. Morning, noon, and twilight hours retreat before them. They are masked with daggered hair and bracelets of dull bells. Weary, they corchy, corchy under veils. The bracelets, hey ho, hey ho. Zoe, twirling her hand to her brow, oh. McGinney, let you voir. Chambre de dame, la corbeille, dos à dos. Arabesquing wearily, they weave a pattern on the floor, weaving, unweaving, curtsying, twirling, simply swirling. Zoe, I'm giddy. She frees herself, droops on a chair. Stephen seizes Florian, turns with her. McGinney, boulangère, le ronde, le pont, chevaux de bois, escargot. Twining, receding, with interchanging hands, the night hours link each, each with arching arms in a mosaic of movements. Stephen and Flory turn cumbrously. McGinney, dansez avec vos dames, changez de dame. Donnez le petit bouquet à votre dame, remerciez. The pianola, best, best of all, barabam.
Kitty jumps up. Oh, they played that on the hobby horses at the Myra's Bazaar. She runs to Stephen. He leaves Flurry brusquely and seizes Kitty. A screaming bittern's harsh high whistle shrieks. Groan, gross, gurgling tufts, cumbersome whirligig turn slowly the room right round about the room. The pianola. My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Zoe. Yorkshire through and through. Come on all. She seizes Flurry and waltzes her. Stephen. Basel. He wheels Kitty into Lynch's arms, snatches up his ash plant from the table and takes the floor. All wheel, whirl, waltz, twirl. Bloom, Bella, Kitty Lynch, Flurry, Zoe, Jujubi women. Stephen with hat ash plant frog splits in middle high kicks with sky kicking mouth shut, hand clasp part under thigh. With clang, tinkle, boom, hammer, tally how horn blower, blue, green, yellow flashes, tufts, cumbersome tons with hobby horse riders from gilded snakes dangled, bowls, fandango, leaping, spotting, soil, foot, and fall again. The pianola. Though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. Close clutched, swift, swifter, with glare, blare, flare, scudding, they scoot, loot, shoot, lumbering by. Barabam! Tooty! Encore! Bis bravo! Encore! Simon, think of your mother's people. Stephen, dance of death. Bang, fresh, barang, bang of lackey's bell. Horse, nag, steer, piglings. Con me on Christ ass, lame crutch and leg sailor in cockboat, arm folded rope pulling, hitching stamp hornpipe through and through. Bara bum, a nags, hogs, bell horses, gathering swine, cornean coffin, steel shark stone, one handled Nelson, two trickies, frown zimmer plum stain from pram filling bawling gum, he's a champion, fuse blue pier from barrel rev, even song love. Von Hackney jaunt, blazes blind, cod doubled bicyclers, dilly with snow cake, no fancy clothes. Then in last switchback, lumbering up and down, bump mash tub sort of viceroy, and rain relish for tub lumber bump she rose. Barabam! The couples fall aside. Stephen whirls giddily. Room whirls back. Eyes closed, he totters. Red rails fly spacewards. Stars all around suns turn round about. Bright midges dance on walls. He stops dead. Stephen. Ho! Stephen's mother, emaciated, rises stark through the floor, in leper grey with a wreath of faded orange blossoms and a torn bridal veil. Her face worn and noseless, green with grave mould. Her hair is scant and lank. She fixes her blue-circled, hollow eye sockets on Stephen, and opens her toothless mouth, uttering a silent word. A choir of virgins and confessors sing voicelessly. The choir. Lilia tarutilantium te confessorum, jubilantium te virginum. From the top of a tower, Buck Mulligan, in party-coloured jester's dress of puce and yellow, and clown's cap with curling bell, Stands gaping at her, a smoking buttered split scone in his hand. Buck Mulligan, she's beastly dead. The pity of it. Mulligan meets the afflicted mother. He upturns his eyes. Mercurial Malachy. The mother, with the subtle smile of death's madness. I was once the beautiful May Goulding. I am dead. Stephen, horror struck. Lemoore, who are you? No, what bogeyman's trick is this? Buck Mulligan shakes his curling cap bell. The mockery of it. Kinch dog's body killed her bitch body. She kicked the bucket. Tears of molten butter fall from his eyes onto the scum. Our great sweet mother. Epi I know ponton. The mother comes nearer, breathing upon him softly her breath of wetted ashes. All must go through it, Stephen. More women than men in the world. You too. Time will come. Stephen, choking with fright, remorse, and horror. They say I killed you, mother. He offended your memory. Cancer did it, not I. Destiny. The mother, a green rill of bile trickling from a side of her mouth. You sang that song to me. Love's bitter mystery. Stephen, eagerly, tell me the word, mother, if you know now. The word known to all men. The mother. Who saved you the night you jumped into the train at Darkey with Paddy Lee? 
who had pity for you when you were sad among the strangers. Prayer is all-powerful. Prayer for the suffering souls in the Ursuline Manual and forty days' indulgence. Repent, Stephen. Stephen, the ghoul. Hyena, the mother. I pray for you in my other world. Get Dilly to make you that boiled rice every night after your brain work. Years and years I loved you, O oh, my son, my firstborn, when you lay in my womb. Zoe, fanning herself with the great fan, I'm melting. Flurry points to Stephen. Look, he's white. Bloom goes to the window to open it more. Giddy, the mother, with smouldering eyes, repent. Oh, the fire of hell. Stephen, panting, his non-corrosive sublimate, the corpse chewer, raw head and bloody bones. The mother, her face drawing near and nearer, sending out an ashen breath. Beware! She raises her blackened, withered right arm slowly towards Stephen's breast with outstretched finger. Beware God's hand! A green crab with malignant red eyes sticks deep its grinning claws in Stephen's heart. Stephen, strangled with rage, shite! His features grow drawn, grey and old. Bloom at the window. What? Stephen, ah non, par exemple, the intellectual imagination, with me all or not at all, non serviam. Flurry, give him some cold water. Wait. She rushes out. The mother wrings her hand slowly, moaning desperately, O oh, sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on him! Save him from hell, O oh, divine sacred heart! Stephen, no, no, no! Break my spirit, all of you, if you can! I'll bring you all to heal! The mother, in the agony of her death rattle, Have mercy on Stephen, Lord, for my sake! Inexpressible was my anguish when expiring with love, grief, and agony on Mount Calvary! Stephen, no tongue! He lifts his ash plant high with both hands and smashes the chandelier. Time's livid final flame leaps and, in the following darkness, ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry. The gas jet... <laughs> Bloom, stop! Lynch rushes forward and seizes Stephen's hand. Here, hold on, don't run amok! Bella, police! Stephen, abandoning his ash plant, his head and arms thrown back stark, beats the ground and flies from the room, past the whores at the door. Bella screams, After him! The two whores rush to the hall door. Lynch and Kitty and Zoe stampede from the room. They talk excitedly. Bloom follows, returns. The whores, jammed in the doorway, pointing, Down there! Zoe, pointing, There! There's something up! Bella, who pays for the lamp? She seizes Bloom's coat-tail. Here, you were with him. The lamp's broken. Bloom rushes to the hall, rushes back. What lamp, woman? A whore. He tore his coat. Bella, her eyes hard with anger and cupidity points. Who's to pay for that? Ten shillings. You're a witness. Bloom snatches up Stephen's ash plant. Me? Ten shillings? Haven't you lifted enough off him? Didn't he? Bella, loudly. Here, none of your tall talk. This isn't a brothel. A ten-shilling house. Bloom, his head under the lamp, pulls the chain. Puling, the gas jet lights up a crushed mauve purple shade. He raises the ash plant. Only the chimney's broken. Here is all he... Bella shrinks back and screams, Jesus, don't! Bloom, warding off a blow, to show you how he hit the paper. There's not six months worth of damage done. Ten shillings. Flurry, with a glass of water, enters. Where is he? Bella, do you want me to call the police? Bloom, oh, I know, bulldog on the premises. But he's a Trinity student, patrons of your establishment, gentlemen that pay the rent. He makes a Masonic sign. Know what I mean? Nephew of the Vice-Chancellor. You don't want a scandal. Bella, angrily, Trinity. Coming down here, ragging after the boat races, and paying nothing. Are you my commander here, or... Where is he? I'll charge him. Disgrace him, I will. She shouts, Zoe, Zoe. Bloom, urgently, and if it were your own son in Oxford. Warningly, I know. Bella, almost speechless. Who are? Incog. Zoe, in the doorway. There's a row on. Bloom, what? Where? He throws a shilling on the table and starts. That's for the chimney. Where? I need mountain air. He hurries out through the hall. The whores point. 
Flurry follows, spilling water from her tilted tumbler. On the doorstep, all the whores clustered talk volubly, pointing to the right where the fog has cleared off. From the left arrives a jingling hackney car. It slows, too, in front of the house. Bloom at the hall door perceives Corny Kelleher, who is about to dismount from the car with two silent lechers. He averts his face. Bella from within the hall urges on her whores. They blow icky, licky, sticky, yum, yum kisses. Corny Kelleher replies with a ghastly, lewd smile. The silent lechers turn to pay the jarvey. Zoe and Kitty still point right. Bloom, parting them swiftly, draws his caleb's hood and poncho and hurries down the steps with sideways face. Incog Harun al-Rashid, he flits behind the silent lechers and hastens on by the railings with fleet step of a pad strewing the drag behind him, torn envelopes drenched in aniseed. The ash plant marks his stride. A pack of bloodhounds, led by a horn blower of Trinity, brandishing a dog whip in tally ho cap and an old pair of grey trousers, follow from far, picking up the scent, nearer, baying, panting, at fault, breaking away, throwing their tongues, biting his heels, leaping at his tail. He walks, runs, zigzags, gallops, logs laid back. He is pelted with gravel, cabbage stumps, biscuit boxes, eggs, potatoes, dead codfish, woman slipper slappers. After him, fresh found, the hue and cry zigzag gallops in hot pursuit to follow my leader. 65C, 66C, Nightwatch, John Henry Menton, Wisdom Healy, V.B. Dillon, Councillor Nanetti, Alexander Keyes, Larry O'Rourke, Joe Cuff, Mrs. O'Dowd, Pisser Burke, the nameless one, Mrs. Reardon, the citizen, Gary Owen, who do you call him, strange face, fellow that's so like, saw him before? Chap with the Wen, Chris Callanan, Sir Charles Cameron, Benjamin Dollard, Lenehan, Bartell Darcy, Joe Hines, Red Murray, Editor Braden, T. M. Healy, Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, John Howard Parnell, the Reverend Tinned Salmon, Professor Jolie, Mrs. Breen, Dennis Breen, Theodore Purify, Mina Purify, the Westland Row Postmistress, C. P. McCoy, Friend of Lions, Happy Hollahan, Man in the Street, Other Man in the Street, Football boots, pug nosed driver, rich Protestant lady, Davy Button, Mrs. Ellen McGuinness, Mrs. Joe Gallagher, George Lidwell, Jimmy Henry on Cons, Superintendent Larrisy, Father Cowley, Crofton out of the Collector Generals, Dan Dawson, Dental Surgeon Bloom with tweezers, Mrs. Bob Dawden, Mrs. Kennefick, Mrs. Wise Nolan, John Wise Nolan, Handsome married woman rubbed against wide, behind in Clonskeithram, the bookseller of sweets of sin. Miss Dubedat and she did bedad. Madame Geraldine Stanislaus Morden of Roebuck, the managing clerk of Drimmies, Weatherup, Colonel Hayes, Mastiansky, Citron, Penrose, Aaron Figatner, Moses Herzog, Michael E. Geraghty, Inspector Try, Mrs. Galbraith, the constable of Eccles Street Corner, old Dr. Brady with stethoscope, the mystery man on the beach, a retriever, Mrs. Miriam Dandred, and all her lovers. The hue and cry, helter skelter pelter welter, he's bloom, stop bloom, stop a bloom, stop a rubber, hi, hi, stop him on the corner. At the corner of Beaver Street beneath the scaffolding, Bloom, panting, stops on the fringe of the noisy, quarrelling knot, a lot not knowing a jot what high, high, row and wrangle round the who, what, brawl altogether. Stephen, with elaborate gestures, breathing deeply and slowly, You are my guests, uninvited, by virtue of the fifth of George and seventh of Edward, history to blame, fabled by mothers of memory. Private car, to Sissy Caffrey. Was he insulting you? Stephen, Addressed her invocative feminine, probably neuter, ungenitive. Voices. No, he didn't. I seen him. The girl there. He was in Mrs. Cowan's. What's up? Soldier and civilian. Sissy Caffrey. I was in company with the soldiers and they left me to do, you know, and the young man run up behind me. But I'm faithful to the man that's treating me, though I'm only a shilling whore. Stephen. Catches sight of Lynch's and Kitty's heads. Hail Sisyphus. He points to himself and the others. Poetic. Euro-poetic. Voices. She's faithful the man. Sissy Caffrey. Yes, to go with him, and me with the soldier friend. Private Compton. He doesn't half want a thick air to blatter. Biff him one, Harry. Private Care. To Sissy. Was he insulting you while me and him was having a piss? Lord Tennyson. 
Gentlemen, poet in Union Jack blazer and cricket flannels, bareheaded, flowing bearded, there's not to reason why. Private Compton. Biff him, Harry. Stephen to Private Compton. I don't know your name, but you are quite right. Dr. Swift says one man in armor will beat ten men in their shirts. Shirt is synecdoche, part for the whole. Sissy Caffrey to the crowd. No, I was with the privates. Stephen, amiably. Why not? The bold soldier boy. In my opinion, every lady, for example, private Carr, his cap eye, advances to Stephen. Say, how would it be, Governor, if I was to bash in your jaw? Stephen looks up to the sky. How? Very unpleasant. Noble art of self-pretense. Personally, I detest action. He waves his hand. Hand hurts me slightly. Enfin, ce sont vos wagnons. To Sissy Caffrey, some trouble is on here. What is it precisely? Dolly Gray, from her balcony, waves her handkerchief, giving the sign of the heroine of Jericho. Rahab, cook, son, goodbye. Save home to Dolly. Dream of the girl you left behind, and she will dream of you. The soldiers turn their swimming eyes. Bloom, elbowing through the crowd, plucks Stephen's sleeve vigorously. Come now, Professor, that carman is waiting. Stephen turns. Eh? He disengages himself. Why should I not speak to him or to any human being who walks upright upon this oblate orange? He points his finger. I'm not afraid of what I can talk to if I see his eye. Retaining the perpendicular. He staggers a pace back. Bloom, propping him. Retain your own. Stephen laughs emptily. My center of gravity is displaced. I have forgotten the trick. Let us sit down somewhere and discuss. Struggle for life is the law of existence. But, but, human philiranists, notably the Tsar and the King of England, have invented arbitration. He taps his brow. But in here it is I must kill the priest and the king. Pity the clap. Did you hear what the professor said? He's a professor out of the college. Conti Kate, I did, I heard that. Biddy the Clap, he expresses himself with such marked refinement of phraseology. Conti Kate, indeed, yes, and at the same time with such apposite trenchancy. Private Carr pulls himself free and comes forward. What's that you're saying about my king? Edward VII appears in an archway. He wears a white jersey on which an image of the Sacred Heart is stitched with the insignia of Gatter and Thistle, Golden Fleece, Elephant of Denmark, Skinner's and Probine's Horse, Lincoln's Inn Venture and Ancient and Honourable Artillery Company of Massachusetts. He sucks a red jujube. He is robed as a grand elect prefect and sublime mason with trowel and apron, marked Made in Germany. In his left hand he holds a plasterer's bucket on which is printed Defense du Rhine. A roar of welcome greets him. Edward the Seventh. Slowly, solemnly, but indistinctly, peace, perfect peace, for identification, bucket in my hand. Cheerio, boys, he turns to his subjects. We have come here to witness a clean, straight fight, and we heartily wish both men the best of good luck. Mahak Makarabak. He shakes hands with Private Carr, Private Compton, Stephen, Bloom, and Lynch. General applause. Edward the Seventh lifts his bucket graciously in acknowledgment. Private Carr, to Stephen. Say it again. Stephen, nervous, friendly, pulls himself up. I understand your point of view, though I have no king myself for the moment. This is the age of patent medicines. A discussion is difficult down here. But this is the point. You die for your country. Suppose. He places his arm on Private Carr's sleeve. Not that I wish it for you. But I say, let my country die for me. Up to the present, it has done so. I didn't want it to die. Damn death. Long live life. Edward the Seventh levitates over heaps of slain in the garb and with the halo of joking Jesus, a white jubi in his phosphorescent face. My methods are new and are causing surprise. To make the blind see, I throw dust in their eyes. Stephen. Kings and unicorns. He fills back a pace. Come somewhere and we'll... What was that kettle saying? Private Compton. Hey, Harry, give him a kick in the knackers. Stick one into Jerry. Bloom to the privates, softly. He doesn't know what he's saying. Taking a little more than is good for him. Absinthe, green-eyed monster. I know him. He's a gentleman, a poet. It's all right. Stephen nods, smiling and laughing. Gentleman, patriot, scholar and judge of impostors. Private Care. I don't give a bugger who he is. Private Compton. We don't give a bugger who he is. Stephen. I seem to annoy them. 
Green rag to a bull. Kevin Egan of Paris, in black Spanish tasseled short and peep-a-day boy's hat, signs to Stephen. Kevin Egan. Hello, bonjour, the VA ogress with the donjon. Patrice Egan peeps from behind, his rabbit face nibbling a quince leaf. Patrice. Socialiste. Don Emil Patrizio Franz Rupert Pope Hennessy. In medieval Hoburg, two wild geese volant on his helm, with noble indignation, points a mailed hand against the privates. Where those ikes to footboden, big grand procourse of John Yella Todos covered of gravy. Bloom to Stephen, come home, you'll get into trouble. Stephen, swaying, I don't avoid it, he provokes my intelligence. Biddy the clap, one immediately observes that he is of patrician lineage. The virago, green above the red, says he, wolf tone. The bard, the red's as good as the green, and better, up the soldiers, up King Edward. A rough, laughs, oi, hands up to de vet. The citizen, with the huge emerald muffler and shillelagh calls, may the god above send down a dove with teeth as sharp as razors to slit the throats of the English dogs that hanged our Irish leaders. The croppy by. The rope noose round his neck, grapes in his issuing bowels with both hands. I bear no hate to a living thing, but I love my country beyond the king. Rumbold, demon barber, accompanied by two black-masked assistants, advances with Gladstone bag which he opens. Ladies and gents, cleaver purchased by Mrs. Piercy to slay Mog, knife with which Voisin dismembered the wife of a compatriot and hid remains in a sheet in the cellar, the unfortunate female's throat being cut from ear to ear, file containing arsenic retrieved from body of Miss Barron which sent Seddon to the gallows. He jocks the rope. The assistants leap at the victim's legs and drag him downward, grunting the croppy boy's tongue protrudes violently. The croppy boy... Her hot her, 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 hest. He gives up the ghost. A violent erection of the hanged sends gouts of sperm spouting through his death clothes onto the cobblestones. Mrs. Bellingham, Mrs. Yelverton Barry, and the Honourable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys rush forward with their handkerchiefs to sop it up. Rumbold, I'm near it myself. He undoes the noose. Rope which hanged the awful rebel, ten shillings a time, as applied to her royal highness. He plunges his head into the gaping belly of the hanged, and draws out his head again, clotted with coiled and smoking entrails. My painful duty has now been done. God save the king! Edward the Seventh dances slowly, solemnly, rattling his bucket, and sings with soft contentment, On coronation day, on coronation day, oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine? Private Care. Here, what are you saying about my king? Stephen. Throws up his hands. Oh, this is too monotonous. Nothing. He wants my money and my life. The want must be his master for some brutish empire of his. Money I haven't. He searches his pockets vaguely. Gave it to someone. Private care. Who wants your bleeding money? Stephen tries to move off. Will someone tell me where I am least likely to meet these necessary evils? Ça se voit à Paris. Not that I... But by St. Patrick... The women's heads coalesce. Old gummy granny in sugarloaf hat appears seated on a toadstool, the death flower of the potato blight on her breast. Stephen, aha, I know you, Gower. Hamlet, revenge, the old sow that eats her farrow. Old gummy granny, rocking to and fro. Ireland, sweetheart, the king of Spain's daughter, Alana, strangers in my house, bad manners to them. She keens with banshee woe. Or chone, or chone, silk of the kind. She wails. You met with poor old Ireland, and how does she stand? Stephen. How do I stand you? The hat-trick. Where's the third person of the blessed trinity? Sagadaroon. The reverend Carrion Crow. Sissy Caffrey. Shrill. Stop them from fighting. A rough. Our men retreated. Private Carr, tugging at his belt, I'll wring the neck of any fucker says a word against my fucking king. Bloom, terrified, he said nothing, not a word, a pure misunderstanding. The citizen, Angobra! Major Tweedy and the citizen exhibit to each other medals, decorations, trophies of war, wounds, both salute with fierce hostility. Private Compton, go it, Harry, do him one in the eye, he's a pro-boar. Stephen, did I? When? 
Bloom to the Redcoats. We fought for you in South Africa. Irish missile troops. Isn't that history? Royal Dublin Fusiliers, honoured by our monarch. The Navy, staggering past. Oh, yes. Oh, God, yes. I'll make the core a crowar. Oh, boy. Casked halberdiers in armor thrust forward a pentis of gutted spear points. Major Tweedy, moustached like Turco the Terrible in bearskin cap with hackle plume and accoutrements, with epaulets, gilt chevrons and sabre tashes, his breast bright with medals, toes the line. He gives the pilgrim warrior sign of the Knights Templars. Major Tweedy growls gruffly, Rocks drift up guards and at them, Maharshalal Hashbaz. Private Carr, I'll do him in. Private Compton waves the crowd back. Fair play here, make a bleeding butcher shop at a bugger. Mast bands blare Gary Owen and God Save the King. Sissy Caffrey, they're going to fight for me. Conti Kate, the brave and the fair. Biddy the clap, me thinks yon sable knight will joust it with the best. Conti Kate, blushing deeply. Nay, madam, the gold's doublet and merry St. George from me. Stephen, the harlots cry from street to street shall weave old Ireland's winding sheet. Private Carr, loosening his belt, shouts, I'll wring the neck of any fucking bastard says a word against my bleeding fucking king. Bloom shakes Sissy Caffrey's shoulders. Speak, you. Are you struck dumb? You are the link between nations and generations. Speak, woman, sacred life-giver. Sissy Caffrey, alarmed, seizes Private Carr's sleeve. Am I with you? Am I your girl? Sissy's your girl. She cries, Police! Stephen, ecstatically to Sissy Caffrey, White thy fambles, red thy gan, and thy quarons dainty is. Voices. Police! Distant voices. Dublin's burning! Dublin's burning! On fire! On fire! Brimstone fires spring up. Dense clouds roll past. Heavy gatling guns boom. Pandemonium. Troops deploy. Gallop of hoofs. Artillery. Horse commands. Bells clang. Backers shout. Drunkards brawl. Whores screech. Fog horns hoot. Cries of valour, shrieks of dying, pikes clash on cuirasses. Thieves rob the slain, birds of prey winging from the sea, rising from marshlands, swooping from eyries, hover screaming, gannets, cormorants, vultures, goshawks, climbing woodcocks, peregrines, merlins, black grouse, sea eagles, gulls, albatrosses, barnacled geese. The midnight sun is darkened, the earth trembles, the dead of Dublin from Prospect and Mount Jerome, in white sheepskin overcoats and black goat felt cloaks, arise and appear to many. A chasm opens with a noiseless yawn. Tom Rochford, winner in athlete singlet and breeches, arrives at the head of the National Hurdle Handicap and leaps into the void. He is followed by a race of runners and leapers. In wild attitudes they spring from the brink, their bodies plunge. Factory lasses with fancy clothes toss red-hot Yorkshire barabooms. Society ladies lift their skirts above their heads to protect themselves. Laughing witches in red cutty sacks ride through the air on broomsticks. Quaker lister plasters blisters. It rains dragon's teeth. Armed heroes spring up from furrows. They exchange in amity the pass of knights of the Red Cross and fight duels with cavalry sabres. Wolf Tone against Henry Grattan, Smith O'Brien against Daniel O'Connell, Michael Davitt against Isaac Butt, Justin McCarthy against Parnell, Arthur Griffith against John Redmond, John O'Leary against Lear O'Johnny, Lord Edward Fitzgerald against Lord Gerald Fitzedward, the O'Donoghue of the Glens against the Glens of the O'Donoghue, on an eminence, the centre of the earth, rises the felled altar of St. Barbara. Black candles rise from its gospel and epistle horns. From the high barbicans of the tower, two shafts of light fall on the smoke-palled altar stone. On the altar stone, Mrs. Mina Purify, goddess of unreason, lies naked, fettered, a chalice resting on her swollen belly. Father Malachy O'Flynn, in a lace petticoat and reverse chasuble, his two left feet back to the front, celebrates camp mass. The Reverend Mr. Hugh C. Haynes, Love, M.A., in a plain cassock and mortar board, his head and collar back to the front, holds over the celebrant's head an open umbrella. Father Malachy O'Flynn, in Troibo ad altare diaboli, the Reverend Mr. Haynes, Love, to the devil with chath made glad my young days. 
Father Malachi O'Flynn takes from the chalice and elevates a blood-dripping host, Corpus Meum. The Reverend Mr. Haynes Love raises high behind the celebrant's petticoat, revealing his grey bare hairy buttocks between which a carrot is stuck. My body, the vice of all the damned, had ten cheer ten at a pinmo dog drill et rough ayulela. From on high, the vice of Adonai calls, Adonai, dog. The vice of all the blessed. Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. From on high, the voice of Adonai calls. Adonai, God. In strident discord, peasants and townsmen of orange and green factions sing, kick the Pope, and daily, daily sing to Mary. Private care, with ferocious articulation. I'll do him in so help me fucking Christ. I'll ring that bastard fucker's bleeding blasted fucking windpipe. Old Gummy Granny thrusts a dagger towards Stephen's hand. Remove him, a cushla, at 8.35 a.m. You will be in heaven and Ireland will be free, she prays. Oh, good God, take him. The retriever, nosing on the fringe of the crowd, barks noisily. Bloom runs to Lynch. Can't you get him away? Lynch, he likes dialectic, the universal language. Kitty, to Bloom, get him away, you. He won't listen to me. He drags Kitty away. Stephen, points. Exit Judas, et lacqueo say suspend it. Bloom runs to Stephen. Come along with me now before worse happens. Here's your stick. Stephen, stick. No. Reason. The feast of pure reason. Sissy Caffrey, pulling private care. Come on, you're boozed. He insulted me, but I forgive him. Shouting in his ear, I forgive him for insulting me. Bloom, over Stephen's shoulder. Yes, go. You see, he's incapable. Private care breaks loose. I'll insult him. He rushes towards Stephen, fist outstretched, and strikes him in the face. Stephen totters, collapses, falls, stunned. He lies prone, his face to the sky, his hat rolling to the wall. Bloom follows and picks it up. Major Tweedy, loudly, Carmine in bucket, cease fire, salute! The retriever, barking furiously, Ute, 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 ute! The crowd, let him up! Don't strike him when he's down! Air? Who? The soldier hit him. He's a professor. Is he hurted? Don't manhandle him. He's fainted. A hag. What call had the red coat to strike the gentleman and he under the influence? Let them go and fight the boars. The bard. Listen to who's talking. Hasn't the soldier a right to go with his kettle? He gave him the coward's blow. They grab at each other's hair, claw at each other and spit. The retriever, barking, whoa, whoa, whoa. Bloom shoves them back loudly. Get back, stand back. Private Compton, tugging his comrade. Here, bugger off, Harry. Here's the cops. Two rain-caped watch, tall, stand in the group. First watch, what's wrong here? Private Compton, where we're with this lady, and he insulted us and assaulted my chum. The retriever barks. Who owns the bleeding tyke? Sissy Caffrey, with expectation. Is he bleeding? A man, rising from his knees, no, gone off, he'll come to our right. Bloom glances sharply at the man, leave him to me, I can easily. Second watch, who are you, do you know him? Private car, lurches towards the watch, he insulted my lady friend. Bloom, angrily, you hit him without provocation, I'm a witness, constable, take his regimental number. Second watch, I don't want your instructions in the discharge of my duty. Private Compton, pulling his comrade. Here, bugger off, Harry, or Bennett'll shove you in the lock-up. Private Care, staggering as he is pulled away. God fuck, old Bennett, he's a white-arsed bugger. I don't give a shit for him. First watch, takes out his notebook. What's his name? Bloom, peering over the crowd. I just see a car there. If you give me a hand a second, Sergeant. First watch, name and address. Corny Kelleher, weepers round his hat, a death wreath in his hand, appears among the bystanders. Bloom, quickly, oh, the very man, he whispers, Simon Dedalus' son, a bit sprung, get those policemen to move those loafers back. Second watch, nice, Mr. Kelleher. Corny Kelleher, to the watch, withdrawing eye, 
That's all right. I know him. Won a bit on the races. Gold cup. Throw away. He laughs. Twenty to one. Do you follow me? First watch. Turns to the crowd. Here, what are you all gaping at? Move on out of that. The crowd disperses slowly, muttering down the lane. Corny Kelleher. Leave it to me, Sergeant. That'll be all right. He laughs, shaking his head. We were often as bad ourselves. I or worse. What? Eh, what? First watch. Laughs. I suppose so. Corny Kelleher nudges the second watch. Come and wipe your name off the slate. He lifts, wagging his head, with my turaloom, 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 turaloom. What? Eh? Do you follow me? Second watch. Genially. As sure we were too. Corny Kelleher, winking. Boys will be boys. I've a car round there. Second watch. All right, Mr. Kelleher. Good night. Corny Kelleher. I'll see to that. Bloom shakes hands with both of the watch in turn. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. He mumbles confidentially. We don't want any scandal, you understand. Father is a well-known, highly respected citizen. Just a little wild oats, you understand. First watch. Oh, I understand, sir. Second watch. That's all right, sir. First watch. It was only in case of corporal injuries I'd have to report it at the station. Bloom nods rapidly. Naturally. Quite right. Only your bounden duty. Second watch. It's our duty. Corny Kelleher. Good night, men. The watch, saluting together. Night, gentlemen. They move off with slow, heavy tread. Bloom blows. Providential you came on the scene. You have a car? Corny Kelleher laughs, pointing his thumb over his right shoulder to the car brought up against the scaffolding. Two commercials that were standing fizz and jammets, like princes, faith. One of them lost two quid on the race, drowning his grief, and were on for a go with the jolly gettles. So I landed them up on Bean's car and down to Night Town. Bloom, I was just going home by Gardner Street when I happened to... Corny Kelleher laughs. Should they wanted me to join in with the Moes? No, by God, says I, not for old steerages like myself and yourself. He laughs again and leers with lacklustre eye. Thanks be to God we have it in the house. What, eh? Do you follow me? <laughs> Bloom tries to laugh. <laughs> yes, matter of fact, I was just visiting an old friend of mine there. Virag, you don't know him. Poor fellow, he's laid up for the past week. And we had a liquor together and I was just making my way home. The horse neighs. The horse. Ho, 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 Corny Kelleher. Sure it was being our Jerry there that told me after we left the two commercials in Mrs. Cohen's and I told him to pull up and got off to sea. He laughs. Sober hearse driver's a speciality. Will I give him a lift home? Where does he hang out? Somewhere in Cabra. What? Bloom. No, in Sandy Cove, I believe, from what he let drop. Stephen, prone, breathed to the stars. Corny Kelleher, a squint, draws at the horse. Bloom in gloom looms down. Corny Kelleher scratches his nape. Sandy Cove. He bends down and calls to Stephen. Eh? He calls again. Eh? He's covered with shavings, anyhow. Take care they didn't lift anything off him. Bloom. No, no, no. I have his money and his hat here and stick. Corny Kelleher. Ah, well, he'll get over it. No bones broken. Well, I'll shove along. He laughs. I've a rendezvous in the morning. Burying the dead. Safe home. The horse neighs. Ho, 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 home. Bloom. Good night. I'll just wait and take him along in a few. Corny Kelleher returns to the outside car and mounts it. The horse harness jingles. Corny Kelleher, from the car, standing. Nice. Bloom. Nice. The Jarvey chucks the reins and raises his whip encouragingly. The car and horse back slowly, awkwardly and tudden. Corny Kelleher on the side seat sways his head to and fro in sign of mirth at Bloom's plight. The Jarvey joins in the mute pantomimic merriment, nodding from the father seat. Bloom shakes his head in mute, mirthful reply. With thumb and palm, Corny Kelleher reassures that the two bobbies will allow the sleep to continue for what else is to be done. With a slow nod, Bloom conveys his gratitude, as that is exactly what Stephen needs. The car jingles Turalum round the corner of the Turalum Lane. Corny Kelleher again reassurelooms with his hand. Bloom with his hand assurelooms Corny Kelleher that he is reassurelooms, 
The tinkling of hoofs and jingling of harness grow fainter with their tura lu 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 lay. Bloom, holding in his hand Stephen's hat, festooned with shavings and ash plant, stands irresolute. Then he bends to him and shakes him by the shoulder. Bloom, eh, hey, ho! There is no answer. He bends again. Mr. Dedalus. There is no answer. The name, if ye call, somnambulist. He bends again and, hesitating, brings his mouth near the face of the prostrate form. Stephen! There is no answer. He calls again. Stephen! Stephen groans. Oh, black panther, vampire! He sighs and stretches himself, then murmurs thickly with prolonged vowels, Who drive Fergus now and pierce wood's woven shade? He turns on his left side, sighing, doubling himself together. Bloom, poetry, well-educated, pity. He bends again and undoes the buttons of Stephen's waistcoat, to breathe. He brushes the wood shavings from Stephen's clothes with light hand and fingers. One pound seven. Not hurt, anyhow. He listens. What? Stephen murmurs. Shadows, the woods, white breast, dim sea. He stretches out his arms, sighs again and cuddles his body. Bloom, holding the hat and ash plant, stands erect. A dog barks in the distance. Bloom tightens and loosens his grip on the ash plant. He looks down on Stephen's face and form. Bloom communes with the night. Face reminds me of his poor mother. In the shady wood, the deep white breast. Ferguson, I think I caught. A kettle, some kettle. Best thing could happen him. He murmurs, Swear that I will always hail, ever conceal, never reveal, any part or parts, art or arts. He murmurs, In the rough sands of the sea, a cable toes length from the shore where the tide ebbs and flows. Silent, thoughtful, alert, he stands on guard, his fingers at his lips in the attitude of secret master. Against the dark wall a figure appears slowly, a fairy boy of eleven, a changeling, kidnapped, dressed in an eaten suit with glass shoes and a little bronze helmet, holding a book in his hand. He reads from right to left inaudibly, smiling, kissing the page. Bloom, wonderstruck, calls inaudibly. Rudy. Rudy gazes unseeing into Bloom's eyes and goes on reading, kissing, smiling. He has a delicate mauve face. On his suit he has diamond and ruby buttons. In his free left hand he holds a slim ivory cane with a violet bow knot. A white lambkin peeps out of his waistcoat pocket. Chapter 3 Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Bloom brushed off the greater bulk of the shavings and handed Stephen the hat and ash plant and bucked him up generally in orthodox Samaritan fashion, which he very badly needed. His, Stephen's, mind was not exactly what you would call wandering, but a bit unsteady, and on his expressed desire for some beverage to drink, Mr. Bloom, in view of the hour it was, and there being no pump of vathry water available for their ablutions, let alone drinking purposes, hit upon an expedient by suggesting, half the real, the propriety of the cabman's shelter, as it was called, hardly a stone's throw away near Bot Bridge, where they might hit upon some drinkables in the shape of a milk and soda or a mineral. But how to get there was the rub. For the nonce he was rather nonplussed, but inasmuch as the duty plainly devolved upon him to take some measures on the subject, he pondered suitable ways and means during which Stephen repeatedly yawned. So far as he could see, he was rather pale in the face, so that it occurred to him as highly advisable to get a conveyance of some description which would answer in their then condition, both of them being E.D. Ed, particularly Stephen, always assuming that there was such a thing to be found. Accordingly, after a few such preliminaries as brushing, in spite of his having forgotten to take up his rather soap-sorry handkerchief after it had done yeoman service in the shaving line, they both walked together along Beaver Street, or, more properly, Lane, as far as the farriers and the distinctly fetid atmosphere of the livery stables at the corner of Montgomery Street, where they made tracks to the left, from thence debouching into Amiens Street, round by the corner of Dan Bergen's. 
but as he confidently anticipated, there was not a sign of a Jehu playing for hire anywhere to be seen, except a four-wheeler, probably engaged by some fellows inside on the spree, outside the North Star Hotel, and there was no symptom of its budging a quarter of an inch, when Mr. Bloom, who was anything but a professional whistler, endeavoured to hail it by emitting a kind of a whistle, holding his arms arched over his head twice. This was a quandary, but, bringing common sense to bear on it, evidently there was nothing for it but put a good face on the matter and foot it, which they accordingly did. So, bevelling around by mullets and the signal house, which they shortly reached, they proceeded perforce in the direction of Amiens Street Railway Terminus, Mr. Bloom being handicapped by the circumstance that one of the back buttons of his trousers had, to vary the time-honoured adage, gone the way of all buttons, though, entering thoroughly into the spirit of the thing, he heroically made light of the mischance. So as neither of them were particularly pressed for time, as it happened, and the temperature refreshing since it cleared up after the recent visitation of Jupiter Pluvius, they dandered along past by where the empty vehicle was waiting without a fare or a jarvey. As it so happened, a Dublin United Tramways Company's sandstrewer happened to be returning, and the elder man recounted to his companion, apropos of the incident, his own truly miraculous escape of some little while back. They passed the main entrance of the great northern railway station, the starting point for Belfast, where of course all traffic was suspended at that late hour, and passing the back door of the morgue, a not very enticing locality, not to say gruesome to a degree, more especially at night, ultimately gained the Dock Tavern, and in due course turned into Store Street, famous for its Sea Division police station. Between this pint and the high at present unlit warehouses of Beresford Place, Stephen thought to think of Ibsen, associated with Baird's the stone cutters in his mind, somehow in Talbot Place, first turning on the right, while the other, who was acting as his Fidus Arcates, inhaled with internal satisfaction the smell of James Rourke's city bakery, situated quite close to where they were, the very palatable odour, indeed, of our daily bread, of all commodities of the public, the primary and most indispensable. Bread, the staff of life, earn your bread, oh, tell me where is fancy bread, at Rourke's the baker's, it is said. En route to his taciturn and, not to put too fine a point on it, not yet perfectly sober companion, Mr. Bloom, who at all events was in complete possession of his faculties, never more so, in fact, disgustingly sober, spoke a word of caution, read the dangers of night town, women of ill fame and swell mobsmen, which, barely permissible once in a while, though not as a habitual practice, was of the nature of a regular death-trap for young fellows of his age, particularly if they had acquired drinking habits under the influence of liquor, unless you knew a little jiu-jitsu for every contingency, as even a fellow on the board of his back could administer a nasty kick if you didn't look out. Highly providential was the appearance on the scene of Corney Kelleher when Stephen was blissfully unconscious, but for that man in the gap turning up at the eleventh hour, the finny might have been that he might have been a candidate for the accident ward, or, failing that, the bridewell and an appearance in the court next day before Mr. Tobias, or, he being the solicitor, rather, old wall, he meant to say, or Mahoney, which simply spelt ruin for a chap when it got brooted about. The reason he mentioned the fact was that a lot of those policemen, whom he cordially disliked, were admittedly unscrupulous in the service of the Crown, and, as Mr. Bloom put it, recalling a case or two in the A Division in Clan Brassel Street, prepared to swear a hold through a ten-gallon pot, never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example, the guardians of the law were well in evidence, the obvious reason being they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or sidearms of any description, liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to inciting them against civilians, should by any chance they fall out over anything. You frittered away your time, he very sensibly maintained, and health and also character, besides which the squander mania of the thing, fast women of the demimond ran away with a lot of pounds, shillings and pence into the bargain, and the greatest danger of all was who you got 
drunk with, though, touching the much-vexed question of stimulants, he relished a glass of choice old wine in season, as both nourishing and blood-making, and possessing apparent virtues, notably a good burgundy which he was a staunch believer in, still never beyond a certain point where he invariably drew the line, as it simply led to trouble all round to say nothing of your being at the tender mercy of others practically. Most of all, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pub-hunting confrères but one, a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother medicos under all the cirques. And that one was Judas, Stephen said, who up to then had said nothing whatsoever of any kind. Discussing these and kindred topics, they made a beeline across the back of the custom house and passed under the loop line bridge where a brazier of coke burning in front of a sentry box, or something like one, attracted their rather lagging footsteps. Stephen, of his own accord, stopped for no special reason to look at the heap of barren cobblestones, and by the light emanating from the brazier, he could just make out the darker figure of the corporation watchman inside the gloom of the sentry box. He began to remember that this had happened, or had been mentioned as having happened, before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognized in the sentry a quondam friend of his father's, Gumley. To avoid a meeting, he drew nearer to the pillars of the railway bridge. Someone saluted you, Mr. Bloom said. A figure of middle height on the prowl, evidently under the arches, saluted again, calling, Night! Stephen, of course, started rather dizzily and stopped to return the compliment. Mr. Bloom, actuated by motives of inherent delicacy, inasmuch as he always believed in minding his own business, moved off, but nevertheless remained on the qui vive with just a shade of anxiety, though not funkyish in the least. Though unusual in the Dublin area, he knew that it was not by any means unknown for desperadoes, who had next to nothing to live on, to be abroad waylaying and generally terrorising peaceable pedestrians by placing a pistol at their head in some secluded spot outside the city proper, famished loiterers of the Thames embankment category, they might be hanging about there, or simply marauders ready to decamp with whatever boodle they could in one fell swoop at a moment's notice, your money or your life, leaving you there to point a moral gagged and garroted. Stephen, that is when the accosting figure came to close quarters, though he was not in an over-sober state himself, recognised Corley's breath redolent of rotten corn juice. Lord John Corley, some called him, and his genealogy came about in this wise— he was the eldest son of Inspector Corley of the G Division, lately deceased, who had married a certain Catherine Brophy, the daughter of a lout farmer. His grandfather, Patrick Michael Corley of New Ross, had married the widow of a publican there, whose maiden name had been Catherine, also Talbot. Rumour had it, though not proved, that she descended from the house of the Lords Talbot de Malahide, in whose mansion, really an unquestionably fine residence of its kind and well worth seeing, her mother or aunt or some relative, a woman, as the tale went, of extreme beauty, had enjoyed the distinction of being in service in the wash kitchen. This, therefore, was the reason why the still comparatively young, though dissolute man who now addressed Stephen, was spoken of by some with facetious proclivities as Lord John Corley. Taking Stephen on one side, he had the customary doleful ditty to tell, not as much as a farthing to purchase a night's lodgings. His friends had all deserted him. Furthermore, he had a row with Lenin and called him the Stephen a mean bloody swab with a sprinkling of a number of other uncalled-for expressions. He was out of a job and implored of Stephen to tell him where on God's earth he could get something, anything at all, to do. No, it was the daughter of the mother in the wash kitchen that was foster sister to the heir of the house, or else they were connected through the mother in some way, both occurrences happening at the same time, if the whole thing wasn't a complete fabrication from start to finish. Anyhow, he was all in. I wouldn't ask you only, pursued he, on my solemn oath, and God knows I'm on the rocks. There'll be a job tomorrow or next day, Stephen told him, in a boy's school at Dalky for a gentleman usher. Mr. Garrett D.C., try it. You may mention my name. Ah, God, Carly replied. Sure I couldn't teach in a school, man. I was never one of your bright ones, he added with half a laugh. I got stuck twice in the junior at the Christian Brothers. I have no place to sleep myself, 
Stephen informed him. Corley, at the first go-off, was inclined to suspect it was something to do with Stephen being fired out of his digs for bringing in a bloody tart off the street. There was a doss house in Marlborough Street, Mrs. Maloney's, but it was only a tanner touch and full of undesirables. But McConaughey told him you got a decent enough do in the brazen head over in Wine Tavern Street, which was distantly suggestive to the person addressed of Friar Bacon for a bob. He was starving, too, though he hadn't said a word about it. Though this sort of thing went on every other night, or very near it, still Stephen's feelings got the better of him. In a sense, though, he knew that Corley's brand new rigmarole on a par with the others was hardly deserving of much credence. However, haud ignarus malorum miseris succurare disco, etc., as the Latin poet remarks, especially as luck would have it, he got paid his screw after every middle of the month, on the 16th, which was the date of the month, as a matter of fact, though a good bit of the wherewithal was demolished. But the cream of the joke was nothing would get it out of Corley's head that he was living in affluence, and hadn't a thing to do but hand out the needful. Whereas, he put his hand in a pocket anyhow, not with the idea of finding any food there, but thinking he might lend him anything up to a bob or so in lieu, so that he might endeavour at all events, and get sufficient to eat. But the result was in the negative, for to his chagrin he found his cash missing. A few broken biscuits were all the result of his investigation. He tried his hardest to recollect for the moment whether he had lost, as well he might have, or left, because in that contingency it was not a pleasant lookout, very much the reverse, in fact. He was altogether too fagged out to institute a thorough search, though he tried to recollect. About biscuits he dimly remembered— who now exactly gave them, he wondered, or where was, or did he buy? However, in another pocket he came across what he surmised in the dark were pennies, erroneously, however, as it turned out. Those are half-crowns, man, Carly corrected him. And so in point of fact they turned out to be. Stephen anyhow lent him one of them. Thanks, Carly answered. You're a gentleman. I'll pay you back one time. Who's that with you? I saw him a few times in the bleeding horse in Camden Street with Bylan, the bill sticker. You might put in a good word for us to get me taken on there. I'd carry a sandwich board, only the girl in the office told me they're full up for the next three weeks, man. God, you've to book a head, man. You'd think it was for the car, Rosa. I don't give a shite anyway so long as I get a job, even as a crossing sweeper. Subsequently, being not quite so down in the mouth, after the two and six he got, he informed Stephen about a fellow by the name of Bags Comiskey, that he said Stephen knew well out of Fulham's, the ship chandlers, bookkeeper there that used to be often round in Nagel's, back with O'Mara, and a little chap with a stutter the name of Ty. Anyhow, he was lagged the night before last and fined ten bob for a drunken disorderly and refusing to go with the constable. Mr. Bloom, in the meanwhile, kept dodging about in the vicinity of the cobblestones near the brazier of coke in front of the corporation watchman's sentry-box, who evidently a glutton for work, it struck him, was having a quiet forty winks for all intents and purposes on his own private account while Dublin slept. He threw an odd eye at the same time now and then at Stephen's anything but immaculately attired interlocutor, as if he had seen that nobleman somewhere or other, though where he was not in a position to truthfully state, nor had he the remotest idea when. Being a level-headed individual who could give points to not a few in point of shrewd observation, he also remarked on his very dilapidated hat and slouchy wearing apparel, generally testifying to a chronic impecuniosity. Palpably he was one of his hangers-on, but for the matter of that it was merely a question of one preying on his next-door neighbour all round, in every deep, so to put it, a deeper depth, and for the matter of that if the man in the street chanced to be in the dock himself, penal servitude with or without the option of a fine would be a very rara avis altogether. In any case he had a consummate amount of cool assurance intercepting people at that hour of the night or morning. Pretty thick that was, certainly. The pair parted company, and Stephen rejoined Mr. Bloom, who, with his practised eye, was not without perceiving that he had succumbed to the blandiloquence of the other parasite. Alluding to the encounter, he said, laughingly, Stephen, that is, he is down on his luck. He asked me to ask you to ask somebody named Boylan, a bill sticker, to give him a job as a sandwich man. 
At this intelligence, in which he seemingly evinced little interest, Mr. Bloom gazed abstractedly for the space of a half a second or so in the direction of a bucket dredger, rejoicing in the far-famed name of Eblana, moored alongside Custom House Key and quite possibly out of repair, whereupon he observed evasively, Everybody gets their own ration of luck, they say. Now you mention it, his face was familiar to me. But leaving that for the moment, how much did you part with? he queried, if I am not too inquisitive. Half a crown, Stephen responded. I dare say he needs it to sleep somewhere. Needs, Mr. Bloom ejaculated, professing not the least surprise at the intelligence. I can quite credit the assertion, and I guarantee he invariably does. Everyone according to his needs, or everyone according to his deeds. But talking about things in general, where, added he with a smile, will you sleep yourself? Walking to Sandy Cove is out of the question, and even supposing you did, you won't get in after what occurred at Westland Row Station. Simply fag out there for nothing. I don't mean to presume to dictate to you in the slightest degree, but why did you leave your father's house? To seek misfortune, was Stephen's answer. I met your respected father on a recent occasion, Mr. Bloom diplomatically returned, today in fact, or to be strictly accurate, on yesterday. Where does he live at present? I gathered in the course of conversation that he had moved. I believe he is in Dublin somewhere, Stephen answered unconcernedly. Why? A gifted man, Mr. Bloom said of Mr. Dedalus Sr., in more respects than one, and a born raconteur, if ever there was one. He takes great pride, quite legitimate, out of you. You could go back, perhaps, he hazarded, still thinking of the very unpleasant scene at Westland Row Terminus, when it was perfectly evident that the other two, Mulligan, that is, and that English tourist friend of his, who eventually euchred their third companion, were patently trying, as if the whole valley station belonged to them, to give Stephen the slip in the confusion, which they did. There was no response forthcoming to the suggestion, however, such as it was, Stephen's mind's eye being too busily engaged in repicturing his family hearth, the last time he saw it with his sister Dilly sitting by the ingle, her hair hanging down, waiting for some weak Trinidad shell cocoa that was in the soot-coated kettle to be done, so that she and he could drink it with the oatmeal water for milk, after the Friday herrings they had eaten at two a penny, with an egg apiece for Maggie, Booty, and Katie. The cat, meanwhile, under the mangle, devouring a mess of eggshells and charred fish heads and bones on a square of brown paper, in accordance with the third precept of the church to fast and abstain on the days commanded, it being quarter tense, or if not, ember days, or something like that. No, Mr. Bloom repeated again, I wouldn't personally repose much trust in that boon companion of yours, who contributes the humorous element, Dr. Mulligan, as a guide, philosopher, and friend, if I were in your shoes. He knows which side his bread is buttered on, though in all probability he never realized what it is to be without regular meals. Of course, you didn't notice as much as I did, but it wouldn't occasion me the least surprise to learn that a pinch of tobacco or some narcotic was put in your drink for some ulterior object. He understood, however, from all he heard, that Dr. Mulligan was a versatile all-round man, by no means confined to medicine only, who was rapidly coming to the fore in his line and, if the report was verified, bad fare to enjoy a flourishing practice in the not-too-distant future as a tony medical practitioner, drawing a handsome fee for his services, in addition to which professional status, his rescue of that man from certain drowning by artificial respiration, and what they call first aid at Skerries, or Malahide was it, was, he was bound to admit, an exceedingly plucky deed, which he could not too highly praise, so that frankly he was utterly at a loss to fathom what earthly reason could be at the back of it, except he put it down to sheer cussedness or jealousy, pure and simple. Except it simply amounts to one thing, and he is what they call picking your brains, he ventured to throw out. The guarded glance of half-solicitude, half-curiosity, augmented by friendliness, which he gave at Stephen's at present morose expression of features, did not throw a flood of light, none at all, in fact, on the problem as to whether he had let himself be badly bamboozled, to judge by two or three low-spirited remarks he let drop, or the other way about, saw through the affair, and for some reason or other best known to himself, allowed matters to more or less. 
Grinding poverty did have that effect, and he more than conjectured that, high educational abilities though he possessed, he experienced no little difficulty in making both ends meet. Adjacent to the men's public urinal, they perceived an ice-cream car round which a group of presumably Italians, in heated altercation, were getting rid of voluble expressions in their vivacious language, in a particularly animated way, there being some little differences between the parties. Putana Madonna, che ci dia il quattrini, o ragione coloroto. Intendiamoci, mezzo sovrano più, dice lui, però, mezzo, farabutto, mortacci sui, ma ascolta, cinque la testa più. Mr. Bloom and Stephen entered the cabman's shelter, an unpretentious wooden structure, where, prior to then, he had rarely, if ever, been before the former having previously whispered to the latter a few hints anent the keeper of it, said to be the once famous Skin the Goat Fitzharris, the Invincible, though he could not vouch for the actual facts, which quite possibly there was not one vestige of truth in. A few moments later saw our two noctambules safely seated in a discreet corner, only to be greeted by stares from the decidedly miscellaneous collection of waifs and strays and other nondescript specimens of the genus Homo, already there engaged in eating and drinking, diversified by conversation, for whom they seemingly formed an object of marked curiosity. Now, touching a cup of coffee, Mr. Bloom ventured to plausibly suggest, to break the ice, it occurs to me you ought to sample something in the shape of solid food, say, a roll of some description. Accordingly, his first act was with characteristic sans froid to order these commodities quietly. The high poli of Jarvis or Stevedores or whatever they were, after a cursory examination, turned their eyes apparently dissatisfied away, though one red-bearded bibulous individual, portion of whose hair was greyish, a sailor probably, still stared for some appreciable time before transferring his rapt attention to the floor. Mr. Bloom, availing himself of the right of free speech, he having just a bowing acquaintance with the language in dispute, though, to be sure, rather in a quandary over Voglio, remarked to his protégé in an audible tone of voice, apropos of the battle royal in the street, which was still raging fast and furious, a beautiful language, I mean for singing purposes. Why do you not write your poetry in that language? Bella poetria. It is so melodious and full. Bella donna, Voglio. Stephen, who was trying his dead best to yawn if he could, suffering from lassitude generally, replied, to fill the ear of a cow elephant. They were haggling over money. Is that so? Mr. Bloom asked. Of course, he subjoined pensively at the inward reflection of there being more languages to start with than were absolutely necessary. It may be only the southern glamour that surrounds it. The keeper of the shelter in the middle of this tete-a-tete -tete put a boiling swimming cup of a choice concoction, labelled coffee, on the table, and a rather antediluvian specimen of a bun, or so it seemed, after which he beat a retreat to his counter, Mr. Bloom determining to have a good square look at him later on, so as not to appear to, for which reason he encouraged Stephen to proceed with his eyes, while he did the honours by surreptitiously pushing the cup of what was temporarily supposed to be called coffee, gradually nearer him. "'Sounds are impostures,' Stephen said, after a pause of some little time, like names, Cicero, Podmore, Napoleon, Mr. Goodbody, Jesus, Mr. Doyle, Shakespeare's were as common as Murphy's. What's in a name?' "'Yes, to be sure,' Mr. Bloom unaffectedly concurred. "'Of course. Our name was changed, too,' he added, pushing the so-called roll across. The red-bearded sailor, who had his weather-eye on the newcomers, boarded Stephen, whom he had singled out for attention in particular, squarely, by asking, "'And what might your name be?' Just in the nick of time, Mr. Bloom touched his companion's boot, but Stephen, apparently disregarding the warm pressure from an unexpected quarter, answered, "'Deadless.' The sailor stared at him heavily from a pair of drowsy baggy eyes, rather bunged up from excessive use of booze, preferably good old Hollands and water. "'You know Simon Dedlis?' he asked at length. "'I've heard of him,' Stephen said. Mr. Bloom was all at sea for a moment, seeing the others evidently eavesdropping too. "'He's Irish,' 
the seaman bold affirmed, staring still in much the same way and nodding. All Irish. All too Irish, Stephen rejoined. As for Mr. Bloom, he could neither make head or tail of the whole business, and he was just asking himself what possible connection, when the sailor of his own accord turned to the other occupants of the shelter with the remark, I seen him shoot two eggs off two bottles at fifty yards over his shoulder, the left hand dead shot. Though he was slightly hampered by an occasional stammer, and his gestures being also clumsy, as it was, still he did his best to explain. Bottles out there, say, fifty yards measured. Eggs on th the bottles. Cox's gun over his shoulder. Ames. He turned his body half round, shut up his right eye completely. Then he screwed his features up some way sideways, and glared out into the night with an unprepossessing cast of countenance. Pum! he then shouted once. The entire audience waited, anticipating an additional detonation, there being still a further egg. Pum! he shouted twice. Egg two evidently demolished, he nodded and winked, adding blood thirstily. Buffalo Bill shoots to kill, never miss, nor he never will. A silence ensued till Mr. Bloom, for agreeableness' sake, just felt like asking him whether it was for a marksmanship competition like the Bisley. Beg pardon, the sailor said. Long ago, Mr. Bloom pursued without flinching a hair's breadth. Why, the sailor replied, relaxing to a certain extent under the magic influence of diamond cut diamond, it might be a matter of ten years. He toured the wide world with Hangler's Royal Circus. I seen him do that in Stockholm. Curious coincidence, Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen unobtrusively. Murphy's my name, the sailor continued. D. B. Murphy of Carrigaloe. Know where that is? Queenstown Harbour, Stephen replied. That's right, the sailor said. Fort Camden and Fort Carlisle. That's where I hails from. I belongs there. That's where I hails from. My little woman's down there. She's waiting for me, I know. For England, home and beauty. She's my own true wife I haven't seen for seven years now, sailing about. Mr. Bloom could easily picture his advent on this scene, the home coming to the mariner's roadside, shielding after having diddled Davy Jones, a rainy night with a blind moon. Across the world for a wife. Quite a number of stories there were on that particular Alice Ben Bolt topic. Enoch Arden and Rip Van Winkle, and does anybody hereabouts remember Cack O'Leary, a favourite and most trying declamation piece by the way of poor John Casey, and a bit of perfect poetry in its own small way. Never about the runaway wife coming back, however much devoted to the absentee. The face at the window. Judge of his astonishment when he finally did breast the tape, and the awful truth dawned upon him, anent his better half, wrecked in his affections. You little expected me, but I've come to stay and make a fresh start. There she sits, a grass widow, at the self-same fireside. Believes me dead, rocked in the cradle of the deep. And there sits Uncle Chubb, or Tomkin, as the case might be, the publican of the crown and anchor in shirt-sleeves, eating rump-steak and onions. No chair for father. Brew. The wind, her brand-new arrival, is on her knee, post-mortem child, with a high row and a randy row, and my galloping, tearing, tandy, oh, bow to the inevitable, grin and bear it. I remain with much love your broken-hearted husband, D. B. Murphy. The sailor, who scarcely seemed to be a Dublin resident, turned to one of the Jarvies with the request, You don't happen to have such a thing as a spare char about you. The Jarvie addressed, as it happened, had not, but the keeper took a die of plug from his good jacket hanging on a nail, and the desired object was passed from hand to hand. Thank you, the sailor said. He deposited the quid in his gob, and chewing and with some slow stammers proceeded. Weak! Come up this morning, eleven o'clock. The three master rows of een from B Bridgewater with bricks. I shipped to get over. P paid off this afternoon. There's my discharge. See? D. B. Murphy. A. B. S.
in confirmation of which statement he extricated from an inside pocket and handed to his neighbor a not very clean-looking folded document. You must have seen a fair share of the world, the keeper remarked, leaning on the counter. Hoy, the sailor answered upon reflecting upon it, I've circumnavigated a bit since I first joined on. I was in the Red Sea. I was in China, North America, and South America. We was chased by pirates one voyage. I seen icebergs, plenty growlers. I was in Stockholm and the Black Sea, the Dardanelles under Captain Dalton, the best bloody man that ever scuttled a ship. I seen Russia, Gospody Pomelieu. That's how the Russians praise. You seen queer sights, don't be talking, put in a jarvy. Why, the sailor said, shifting his partially chewed plug, I seen queer things too, ups and downs. I seen a crocodile bite the fluke off an anchor same as I chew that quid. He took out of his mouth the pulpy quid, and, lodging it between his teeth, bit ferociously. Cah! Like that! And I seen man-eaters in Peru that eats corpses and the livers of horses. Look here! Here they are! A f friend of mine sent me! He fumbled out a picture postcard from his inside pocket, which seemed to be in its way a species of repository, and pushed it along the table. The printed matter on it stated, Cosa de Indios, Bene Bolivia. All focused their attention at the scene exhibited. A group of savage women in striped line cloths, squatted, blinking, suckling, frowning, sleeping amid a swarm of infants. There must have been quite a score of them, outside some primitive shanties of osier. Choose coca all day, the communicative tarpaulin added. Stomachs like bread graters cuts off their ditties when they ca can't bear no more children. See them sitting there, stark, bullock naked, eating a dead horse's liver raw. His postcard proved a centre of attraction for Messrs. the Greenhorns for several minutes, if not more. No, how to keep them off? He inquired generally. Nobody volunteering a statement. He winked, saying, "Glass." That's bogglesome, glass. Mr. Bloom, without evincing surprise, unostentatiously turned over the card to peruse the partially obliterated address and postmark. It ran as follows. Tarjeta Postal, Señor E. Budin, Galeria Becce, Santiago, Chile. There was no message, evidently, as he took particular notice, though not an implicit believer in the lurid story narrated, or the egg-sniping transaction, for that matter, despite William Tell and the Lazarillo Don César de Bazan incident depicted in Maritana, on which occasion the former's ball passed through the latter's hat, having detected a discrepancy between his name, assuming he was the person he represented himself to be, and not sailing under false colours, after having boxed the compass on the strict QT somewhere, and the fictitious addressee of the missive, which made him nourish some suspicions of our friend's bona fides. Nevertheless, it reminded him, in a way, of a long-cherished plan he meant to one day realise, some Wednesday or Saturday, of travelling to London via long sea, not to say that he had ever travelled extensively to any great extent, but he was at heart a born adventurer, though by a trick of fate he had consistently remained a landlubber, except you call going to Hollyhead, which was his longest. Martin Cunningham frequently said he would work a pass through Egan, but some deuced hitch or other eternally cropped up with the net result that the scheme fell through. But even suppose it did come to planking down the needful and breaking Boyd's heart, it was not so dear, purse permitting, a few guineas at the outside, considering the fare to Mullingar, where he figured on going, was five and six, there and back, the trip would benefit health on account of the bracing ozone, and be in every way thoroughly pleasurable, especially for a chap whose liver was out of order, seeing the different places along the route, Plymouth, Falmouth, Southampton, and so on, culminating in an instructive tour of the sites of the great metropolis, the spectacle of our modern Babylon, where doubtless he would see the greatest improvement, tower, abbey, wealth of Park Lane to renew acquaintance with— Another thing just struck him as a by no means bad notion was, he might have a gaze around on the spot, to see about trying to make arrangements about a concert tour of summer music, embracing the most prominent pleasure resorts. 
Margate, with mixed bathing and first-rate hydros and spas. Eastbourne, Scarborough, Margate, and so on. Beautiful Bournemouth, the Channel Islands, and similar bijou spots, which might prove highly remunerative. Not, of course, with a hole and corner scratch company or local ladies on the job. Witness Mrs. C. P. McCoy type. Lend me your valise, and I'll post you the ticket. No, something top-notch. An all-star Irish cast. The Tweedy Flower Grand Opera Company with his own legal consort as leading lady as a sort of counterblast to the Elster Grimes and Moody Manors. Perfectly simple matter, and he was quite sanguine of success. Providing puffs in the local papers could be managed by some fellow with a bit of bounce who could pull the indispensable wires and thus combine business with pleasure. But who? That was the rub. Also, without being actually positive, it struck him a great field was to be opened up in the line of opening up new routes to keep pace with the times, apropos of the Fishgad Ross Lair route, which, it was mooted, was once more on the tapas in the circumlocution departments, with the usual quantity of red tape and dilly-dallying of a feet fogydom and dunderheads generally. A great opportunity there certainly was for push and enterprise to meet the travelling needs of the public at large, the average man, i.e. Brown, Robinson and Company. It was a subject of regret and absurd as well on the face of it, and no small blame to our vaunted society that the man in the street, when the system really needed toning up, for the matter of a couple of paltry pounds, was debarred from seeing more of the world they lived in, instead of being always and ever cooped up since my old stick in the mud took me for a wife. After all, hang it! They had their eleven and more humdrum months of it, and merited a radical change of venue after the grind of city life in the summertime. For choice, when Dame Nature is at her spectacular best, constituting nothing short of a new lease of life, there were equally excellent opportunities for vacationists in the whole island. Delightful sylvan spots for rejuvenation, offering a plethora of attractions as well as a bracing tonic for the system in and around Dublin and its picturesque environs even, Pola Fuca, to which there was a steam tram, but also farther away from the madding crowd in Wicklow, rightly termed the Garden of Ireland. An ideal neighbourhood for elderly wheelmen, so long as it didn't come down, and in the wilds of Donegal, where if report spoke true, the coup d'oeil was exceedingly grand, though the last-named locality was not easily get atable, so that the influx of visitors was not as yet all that it might be, considering the signal benefits to be derived from it, while Hout, with its historic associations and otherwise, Silken Thomas, Grace O'Malley, George the Fourth, rhododendrons, several hundred feet above sea level, was a favourite haunt, with all sorts and conditions of men, especially in the spring, when young men's fancy, though it had its own toll of deaths by falling off the cliffs, by design or accidentally, usually, by the way, on their left leg, it being only about three-quarters of an hour's run from the pillar, because, of course, up-to-date tourist travelling was as yet merely in its infancy, so to speak, and the accommodation left much to be desired. Interesting to fathom, it seemed to him, from a motive of curiosity, pure and simple, was whether it was the traffic that created the route, or vice versa, or the two sides, in fact. He turned back the other side of the card, picture, and passed it along to Stephen. I seen a Chinese one time, related the doughty narrator, that had little pills like putty, and he put them in the water and they opened, and every pill was something different. One was a ship, another was a house, another was a flower. Cooks rats in your soup, he appetizingly added, the chinks does. Possibly perceiving an expression of dubiosity on their faces, the globe trotter went on, adhering to his adventures. And I seen a man killed in Trieste by an Italian chap, knife in his back, knife like that. Whilst speaking, he produced a dangerous looking clasp knife, quite in keeping with his character, and held it in the striking position. In a knocking shop it was, count of a tryon between two smugglers. Fellow hid b behind a door, come up behind him, like that. Prepare to meet your god, says he. Chuck! It went into his back up to the butt. 
His heavy glance, drowsily roaming about, kind of defied their further questions, even should they by any chance want to. That's a good bit of steel, repeated he, examining his formidable stiletto. After which harrowing denouement, sufficient to appall the stoutest, he snapped the blade to and stowed the weapon in question away, as before, in his chamber of horrors, otherwise pocket. They're great for the cold steel, somebody who was evidently quite in the dark said for the benefit of them all. That was why they thought the park murders of the Invincibles was done by foreigners, on account of them using knives. At this remark, passed obviously in the spirit of where ignorance is bliss, Mr. B. and Stephen, each in his own particular way, both instinctively exchanged meaning glances, in a religious silence of the strictly entre nous variety, however, towards where Skin the Goat, alias the Keeper, not turning a hair, was drawing spurts of liquid from his boiler affair. His inscrutable face, which was really a work of art, a perfect study in itself, beggaring description, conveyed the impression that he didn't understand one jot of what was going on. Funny, very. There ensued a somewhat lengthy pause. One man was reading in fits and starts a stained by coffee evening journal, another the card with the natives, just a day, another the seaman's discharge. Mr. Bloom, so far as he was personally concerned, was just pondering in pensive mood. He vividly recollected when the occurrence alluded to took place, as well as yesterday, roughly some score of years previously in the days of the land troubles, when it took the civilized world by storm, figuratively speaking, early in the eighties, eighty-one to be correct, when he was just tudden fifteen. Eh, boss, the sailor broke in, give us back them papers. The request being complied with, he clawed them up with a scrape. Have you seen the Rock of Gibraltar? Mr. Bloom inquired. The sailor grimaced, chewing, in a way that might be read as yes, eh, or no. Ah, you've touched there, too, Mr. Bloom said, Europa Point. Thinking he had, in the hope that the rover might possibly, by some reminiscences, but he failed to do so, simply letting spurt a jet of spew into the sawdust, and shook his head with a sort of lazy scorn. What year would that be about? Mr. B. interrogated. Can you record the boats? Our soi-disant sailor munched heavily a while hungrily before answering, I'm tired of all them rocks in the sea, he said, and boats and ships, salt junk all the time. Tired seemingly, he ceased, his questioner perceiving that he was not likely to get a great deal of change out of such a wily old customer, fell to wool gathering on the enormous dimensions of the water about the globe. Suffice it to say that, as a casual glance at the map revealed, it covered fully three-fourths of it, and he fully realized, accordingly, what it meant to rule the waves. On more than one occasion, a dozen at the lowest, near the North Pole at Dolly Mount, he had remarked a superannuated old salt, evidently derelict, seated habitually near the not particularly redolent sea on the wall, staring quite obliviously at it, and it at him, dreaming of fresh woods and pastures new, as someone somewhere sings, and it left him wondering why. Possibly he had tried to find out the secret for himself, floundering up and down the antipodes, and all that sort of thing, and over and under, well, not exactly under, tempting the fates, and the odds were twenty to nil, there was really no secret about it at all. Nevertheless, without going into the minutiae of the business, the eloquent fact remained that the sea was there in all its glory, and in the natural course of things somebody or other had to sail on it and fly in the face of providence, though it merely went to show how people usually contrive to load that sort of onus onto the other fellow, like the hell idea, and the lottery, and insurance, which were run on identically the same lines, so that for that very reason, if no other, Lifeboat Sunday was a highly laudable institution, to which the public at large, no matter where living, in land or seaside, as the case might be, having it brought home to them like that, should extend its gratitude also to the harbour masters and coast guard service, who had to man the rigging and push off and out amid the elements, whatever the season, when duty called, Ireland expects that every man, and so on, and sometimes had a terrible time of it in the winter time, not forgetting the Irish lights, 
Kish, and others, liable to capsize at any moment, rounding which he once with his daughter had experienced some remarkably choppy, not to say stormy, weather. There was a fellow sailed with me in the rover. The old sea dog, himself a rover, proceeded, went ashore and took up a soft job as gentleman's valet at six quid a month. Them are his trousers I've on me, and he gave me an oil skin and that jackknife. I'm game for that job, shaving and brush up. I hate roaming about. There's my son now, Danny, run off to sea, and his mother got him tucking a draper's in cork where he could be drawing easy money. What age is he? queried one hearer, who, by the way, seen from the side, bore a distant resemblance to Henry Campbell, the town clerk, away from the carking cares of office, unwashed, of course, and in a seedy get-up, and a strong suspicion of nose-paint about the nasal appendage. Why? the sailor answered with a slow, puzzled utterance. My son, Danny, he'd be about eighteen now, way I figure it. The skibberine father hereupon tore open his grey or unclean anyhow short with his two hands, and scratched away at his chest, on which was to be seen an image tattooed in blue Chinese ink intended to represent an anchor. There was lice in that bunk in Bridgewater, he remarked, sure as nuts. I must get a wash tomorrow or next day. It's them black lads I object to. I hate those buggers. Suck your blood dry, they does. Seeing they were all looking at his chest, he accommodatingly dragged his shot more open, so that on top of the time-honoured symbol of the mariner's hope and rest, they had a full view of the figure sixteen, and a young man's side face looking frowningly, rather. Tattoo, the exhibitor explained, that was done when we were lying becalmed off Odessa in the Black Sea under Captain Dalton. Fellow, the name of Antonio, done that. There he is himself, a Greek. Did it hurt much doing it? one asked the sailor. That worthy, however, was busily engaged in collecting round the, some way in his, squeezing her. See here, he said, showing Antonio. There he is, cursing the mate. And there he is now, he added, the same fellow, pulling the skin with his fingers, some special knack evidently, and he laughing at a yarn. And in point of fact, the young man named Antonio's livid face did actually look like forced smiling, and the curious effect excited the unreserved admiration of everybody, including Skin the Goat, who this time stretched over. Eh, sighed the sailor, looking down on his manly chest. He's gone too. It's by sharks after. Eh, ye. He let go of the skin so that the profile resumed the normal expression of before. Neat bit of work, one longshoreman said. And what's the number for? Loafer number two queried. Eaten alive? A third asked the sailor. Eh, sighed again the latter personage, more cheerily this time with some sort of a half-smile, for a brief duration only in the direction of the questioner about the number. Es, a Greek he was. And then he added with rather gallows bard humour, considering his alleged end, as bad as old Antonio, for he left me on my own, yo. The face of a streetwalker glazed and haggard under a black straw hat peered askew round the door of the shelter, palpably reconnoitring on her own with the object of bringing more grist to her mill. Mr. Bloom, scarcely knowing which way to look, turned away on the moment, flusterfied but outwardly calm, and picking up from the table the pink sheet of the Abbey Street organ, which the Jarvey, if such he was, had laid aside, he picked it up and looked at the pink of the paper, though why pink? His reason for so doing was he recognised on the moment, round the door, the same face he had caught a fleeting glimpse of that afternoon on Ormond Key, the partially idiotic female, namely, of the lane, who knew the lady in the brown costume does be with you, Mrs. B., and begged the chance of his washing. Also, why washing, which seemed rather vague than not your washing? Still candor compelled him to admit he had washed his wife's undergarments when soiled in Holly Street, and women would, and did, too, a man's similar garments, initialed with Bewley and Draper's marking ink. Hers were, that is, if they really loved him, that is to say, love me, love my dirty shirt. 
Still, just then, being on tenter hooks, he desired the female's room more than her company, so it came as a genuine relief when the keeper made her a rude sign to take herself off. Round the side of the evening telegraph he just caught a fleeting glimpse of her face round the side of the door, with a kind of demented glassy grin showing that she was not exactly all there, viewing with evident amusement the group of gazers round Skipper Murphy's nautical chest, and then there was no more of her. The gunboat, the keeper said. It beats me, Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen. Medically, I am speaking, how a wretched creature like that from the Lock Hospital, reeking with disease, can be barefaced enough to solicit, or how any man in his sober senses, if he values his health in the least. Unfortunate creature. Of course, I suppose some man is ultimately responsible for her condition. Still, no matter what the cause is from. Stephen had not noticed her, and shrugged his shoulders, merely remarking, in this country people sell much more than she ever had, and do a roaring trade. Fear not them that sell the body, but have not power to buy the soul. She is a bad merchant. She buys dear and sells cheap. The elder man, though not by any manner of means an old maid or a prude, said it was nothing short of a crying scandal that ought to be put a stop to instanter, to say that women of that stamp, quite apart from any old maidish squeamishness on the subject, a necessary evil, were not licensed and medically inspected by the proper authorities, a thing, he could truthfully state, he, as a pater familias, was a stalwart advocate of from the very first start. Whoever embarked on a policy of the sort, he said, and ventilated the matter thoroughly, would confer a lasting boon on everybody concerned. You, as a good Catholic, he observed, talking of body and soul, believe in the soul. Or do you mean the intelligence, the brain power as such, as distinct from any outside object, the table, let us say, that cup? I believe in that myself because it has been explained by competent men as the convolutions of the grey matter. Otherwise we would never have such inventions as X-rays, for instance. Do you? Thus cornered, Stephen had to make a superhuman effort of memory to try and concentrate and remember before he could say, They tell me on the best authority, it is a simple substance, and therefore incorruptible. It would be immortal, I understand, but for the possibility of its annihilation by its first cause, who, from all I can hear, is quite capable of adding that to the number of his other practical jokes, corruptio per se and corruptio per accidens, both being excluded by court etiquette. Mr. Bloom thoroughly acquiesced in the general gist of this, though the mystical finesse involved was a bit out of his sublunary depth. Still, he felt bound to enter a demurrer on the head of simple, promptly rejoining, Simple? I shouldn't think that is the proper word. Of course I grant you, to concede a point, you do knock across a simple soul once in a blue moon. But what I am anxious to arrive at is, it is one thing, for instance, to invent those rays Röntgen did, or the telescope like Edison, though I believe it was before his time Galileo was the man, I mean, and the same applies to the laws, for example, of a far-reaching natural phenomenon such as electricity, but it's a horse of quite another colour to say you believe in the existence of a supernatural god. Of oh, that... Stephen expostulated, has been proved conclusively by several of the best-known passages in Holy Writ, apart from circumstantial evidence. On this knotty point, however, the views of the pair, poles apart as they were both in schooling and everything else, with the marked difference in their respective ages, clashed. Has been, the more experienced of the two objected, sticking to his original point with a smile of unbelief. I'm not so sure about that. That's a matter for every man's opinion, and, without dragging in the sectarian side of the business, I beg to differ with you in toto there. My belief is, to tell you the candid truth, that those bits were genuine forgeries, all of them, put in by monks most probably, or it's the big question of our national poet over again, who precisely wrote them, like Hamlet and Bacon, as you who know your Shakespeare infinitely better than I, of course I needn't tell you. Can't you drink that coffee, by the way? Let me stir it, and take a piece of that bun. It's like one of our skipper's bricks disguised. Still no one can give what he hasn't got. Try a bit. Couldn't. Stephen contrived to get out, his mental organs for the moment refusing to dictate further.
Fault-finding being a proverbially bad hat, Mr. Bloom thought well to star, or try to, the clotted sugar from the bottom, and reflected with something approaching acrimony on the coffee palace and its temperance and lucrative work. To be sure it was a legitimate object, and beyond yea or nay did a world of good. Shelters such as the present one they were in, run on teetotal lines for vagrants at night, concerts, dramatic evenings and useful lectures, admittance free, by qualified men for the lower orders. On the other hand, he had a distinct and painful recollection they paid his wife, Madame Marion Tweedy, who had been prominently associated with it at one time, a very modest remuneration indeed for her piano playing. The idea, he was strongly inclined to believe, was to do good and net a profit, there being no competition to speak of. Sulfate of copper poison SO4, or something in some dried peas, he remembered reading of in a cheap eating house somewhere, but he couldn't remember when it was or where. Anyhow, inspection, medical inspection, of all eatables seemed to him more than ever necessary, which possibly accounted for the vogue of Dr. Tibble's Vi Coco on account of the medical analysis involved. Have a shot at it now, he ventured to say of the coffee after being stirred. Thus prevailed on to, at any rate, taste it, Stephen lifted the heavy mug from the brown puddle it clopped out of, when taken up by the handle and took a sip of the offending beverage. Still, it's solid food, his good genius urged. I'm a stickler for solid food, his one and only reason being not gormandizing in the least, but regular meals as the sine qua non for any kind of proper work, mental or manual. You ought to eat more solid food. You would feel a different man. Liquids I can eat, Stephen said, but oh, oblige me by taking away that knife. I can't look at the point of it. It reminds me of Roman history. Mr. Bloom promptly did as suggested and removed the incriminated article, a blunt horn-handled ordinary knife with nothing particularly Roman or antique about it to the lay eye, observing that the point was the least conspicuous point about it. Our mutual friend's stories are like himself, Mr. Bloom, apropos of knives, remarked to his confidant, sotto voce. Do you think they are genuine? He could spin those yarns for hours on end all night long and lie like old boots. Look at him. Yet still, though his eyes were thick with sleep and sea air, life was full of a host of things and coincidences of a terrible nature, and it was quite within the bounds of possibility that it was not an entire fabrication, though at first blush there was not much inherent probability in all the spoof he got off his chest being strictly accurate gospel. He had been meantime taking stock of the individual in front of him, and Sherlock Holmesing him up ever since he clapped eyes on him. Though a well-preserved man of no little stamina, if a trifle prone to baldness, there was something spurious in the cut of his jib that suggested a jail delivery, and it required no violent stretch of imagination to associate such a weird-looking specimen with the oakum and treadmill fraternity. He might even have done for his man, supposing it was his own case, he told, as people often did about others, namely, that he killed him himself and had served his four or five good-looking years in durance vile to say nothing of the Antonio personage, no relation to the dramatic personage of identical name who sprang from the pen of our national poet, who expiated his crimes in the melodramatic manner above described. On the other hand, he might be only bluffing, a pardonable weakness because meeting unmistakable mugs, Dublin residents, like those Jarvies waiting news from abroad, would tempt any ancient mariner who sailed the ocean seas to draw the long bow about the schooner Hesperus and etc. And when all was said and done, the lies a fellow told about himself couldn't probably hold a proverbial candle to the wholesale whoppers other fellows kind about him. Mind you, I'm not saying that it's all a pure invention, he resumed. Analogous scenes are occasionally, if not often, met with. Giants, though that is rather a far cry, you see, once in a way, Marcella the Midget Queen. In those waxworks in Henry Street, I myself saw some Aztecs, as they are called, sitting bow-legged. They couldn't straighten their legs if you paid them, because the muscles here, you see— he proceeded, indicating on his companion the brief outline of the sinews, or whatever you like to call them, behind the right knee, were utterly powerless from sitting that way, so long cramped up, being adored as gods. 
there's an example again of simple souls. However, reverting to Fen Sinbad and his horrifying adventures, who reminded him a bit of Ludwig, alias Ledwidge, when he occupied the boards of the gaiety, when Michael Gunn was identified with the management in The Flying Dutchman, a stupendous success, and his host of admirers came in large numbers, everyone simply flocking to hear him, though ships of any sort, phantom or the reverse, on the stage, usually fell a bit flat, as also did trains. There was nothing intrinsically incompatible about it, he conceded. On the contrary, that stab-in-the-back touch was quite in keeping with those Italianos, though, candidly, he was nonetheless free to admit those ice-creamers and friars in the fish way, not to mention the chip potato variety and so forth, over in Little Italy there, near the coom, were sober, thrifty, hard-working fellows, except perhaps a bit too given to pot-hunting the harmless, necessary animal of the feline persuasion of others at night, so as to have a good old succulent tuck-in with garlic de rigueur off him or her next day on the quiet, and, he added, on the cheap. Spaniards, for instance, he continued, passionate temperaments like that, impetuous as old Nick, are given to taking the law into their own hands, and give you your quietus double-quick with those poignards they carry in the abdomen. It comes from the great heat, climate, generally. My wife is, so to speak, Spanish, half, that is. Point of fact, she could actually claim Spanish nationality if she wanted, having been born in, technically, Spain, i.e. Gibraltar. She has the Spanish type, quite dark, regular brunette, black. I, for one, certainly believe climate accounts for character. That's why I asked you if you wrote your poetry in Italian. The temperaments at the door, Stephen interposed with, were very passionate about ten shillings. Roberto ruba roba sua. Quite so, Mr. Bloom dittoed. Then... Stephen said, staring and rambling on to himself, or some unknown listener somewhere, we have the impetuosity of Dante, and the isosceles triangle Miss Portinari he fell in love with, and Leonardo and San Tommaso Mastino. It's in the blood, Mr. Bloom acceded at once. All are washed in the blood of the sun. Coincidence, I just happened to be in the Kildare Street Museum today, shortly prior to our meeting, if I can so call it, and I was just looking at those antique statues there, the splendid proportions of hips, bosom. You simply don't knock against those kind of women here. An exception here and there. Handsome, yes, pretty in a way, you find, but what I'm talking about is the female form. Besides, they have so little taste in dress, most of them, which greatly enhances a woman's natural beauty, no matter what you say. Rumpled stockings, it may be, possibly is, a foible of mine, but still it's a thing I simply hate to see. Interest, however, were starting to flag somewhat all round, and then the others got on to talking about accidents at sea, ships lost in a fog, goo collisions with icebergs, all that sort of thing. Ship Ahoy, of course, had his own say to say. He had doubled the Cape a few odd times, and weathered the monsoon, a kind of wind, in the China Seas, and through all those perils of the deep there was one thing, he declared, stood to him, or words to that effect, a pious medal he had that saved him. So then after that they drifted on to the wreck of Daunt's Rock, wreck of that ill-fated Norwegian bark, nobody could think of her name for the moment, till the Jarvey, who had really quite a look of Henry Campbell, remembered it, Palma, on Booterstown Strand. That was the talk of the town that year. Albert William Quill wrote a fine piece of original verse of distinctive merit on the topic for the Irish Times. Breakers running over her, and crowds and crowds on the shore in commotion, petrified with horror. Then someone said something about the case of the S.S. Lady Cairns of Swansea, run into by the Mona, which was on an opposite tack in rather muggyish weather, and lost with all hands on deck. No aid was given. Her master, the Mona's, said he was afraid his collision bulkhead would give way. She had no water, it appears, in her hold. At this stage an incident happened. It having become necessary for him to unfurl a reef, the sailor vacated his seat. Let me cross your bows, mate, he said to his neighbour, who was just gently dropping off into a peaceful doze. He made tracks heavily, slowly, 
with a dumpy sort of a gait to the door, stepped heavily down the one step there was out of the shelter, and bore due lift. While he was in the act of getting his bearings, Mr. Bloom, who noticed when he stood up that he had two flasks of presumably ship's rum, sticking one out of each pocket for the private consumption of his burning interior, saw him produce a bottle and uncork it or unscrew, and, applying its nozzle to his lips, take a good old delectable swig out of it with a gargling noise. The irrepressible Bloom, who also had a shrewd suspicion that the old stager went out on a manoeuvre after the counter-attraction in the shape of a female, who, however, had disappeared to all intents and purposes, could by straining just perceive him when duly refreshed by his rum punch and exploit, gaping up at the piers and girders of the loop line, rather out of his depth, as of course it was all radically altered since his last visit and greatly improved. Some person or persons invisible directed him to the male urinal, erected by the cleansing committee all over the place for the purpose. But after a brief space of time, during which silence reigned supreme, the sailor, evidently giving it a wide berth, eased himself closer at hand, the noise of his bilge water some little time subsequently splashing on the ground, where it apparently awoke a horse of the cab rank. A huff scooped anyway for a new foothold after sleep and harness jingled. Slightly disturbed in his sentry box by the brazier of live coke, the watcher of the corporation stones, who, though now broken down and fast breaking up, was none other in stern reality than the Gumley, aforesaid, now practically on the parish rates, given the temporary job by Pat Tobin, in all human probability, from dictates of humanity, knowing him before shifted about and shuffled in his box before composing his limbs again into the arms of Morpheus, a truly amazing piece of hard lines in its most virulent form on a fellow most respectably connected and familiarised with decent home comforts all his life, who came in for a cool hundred pounds a year at one time, which, of course, the double-barrelled ass proceeded to make general ducks and drakes of, and there he was at the end of his tether, after having often painted the town tolerably pink, without a beggarly stiver. He drank, needless to be told, and it pointed only once more a moral, when he might quite easily be in a large way of business, if, a big if, however, he had contrived to cure himself of his particular partiality. All, meantime, were loudly lamenting the falling off in Irish shipping, coastwise and foreign as well, which was all part and parcel of the same thing. A palgrave Murphy boat was put off the ways at Alexandra Basin, the only launch that year. Right enough the harbours were there, only no ships ever called. There were wrecks and wreckers, the keeper said, who was evidently au fait. What he wanted to ascertain was why that ship ran bang against the only rock in Galway Bay when the Galway Harbour scheme was mooted by a Mr. Wardington, or some name like that, eh? Ask the then captain, he advised them, how much palm oil the British government gave him for that day's work, Captain John Lever of the Lever Line. Am I right, skipper? he queried of the sailor, now returning after his private potation and the rest of his exertions. That wordy, picking up the scent of the fag-end of the song, or words, growled in would-be music, but with great vim, some kind of chanty or other in seconds or thirds. Mr. Bloom's sharp ears heard him, then expectorate the plug, probably, which it was, so that he must have lodged it for the time being in his fist, while he did the drinking and making water jobs, and found it a bit sour after the liquid fire in question. Anyhow, in he rode after his successful libation compotation, introducing an atmosphere of drink into the soiree, boisterously trolling like a veritable son of a sea cook. The biscuits was as hard as brass, and the beef as salt as Lot's wife's arse. Oh, Johnny Lever, Johnny Lever, oh! After which effusion the redoubtable specimen duly arrived on the scene, and regaining his seat, he sank, rather than sat, heavily on the form provided. Skin the goat, assuming he was he, 
evidently with an axe to grind, was airing his grievances in a forcible, feeble, philippic anent the natural resources of Ireland, or something of that sort, which he described in his lengthy dissertation as the richest country bar none on the face of God's earth, far and away superior to England, with coal in large quantities, six million pounds worth of pork exported every year, ten millions between butter and eggs, and all the riches drained out of it by England levying taxes on the poor people that paid through the nose always, and gobbling up the best meat in the market and a lot more surplus steam in the same vein. Their conversation accordingly became general, and all agreed that that was a fact. You could grow any mortal thing in Irish soil, he stated, and there was that Colonel Everard down there in Navan growing tobacco. Where would you find anywhere the like of Irish bacon? But a day of reckoning, he stated crescendo, with no uncertain voice, thoroughly monopolising all the conversation, was in store for mighty England, despite her power of pelf on account of her crimes. There would be a fall, and the greatest fall in history. The Germans and the Japs were going to have their little look in, he affirmed. The Boers were the beginning of the end. Brummagem England was toppling already, and her downfall would be Ireland, her Achilles' heel, which he explained to them about the vulnerable point of Achilles, the Greek hero, a point his auditors at once seized, as he completely gripped their attention by showing the tendon referred to on his boot. His advice to every Irishman was, stay in the land of your birth, and work for Ireland, and live for Ireland. Ireland, Parnell said, could not spare a single one of her sons. Silence all round marked the termination of his finale. The impervious navigator heard these lurid tidings undismayed. Take a bit of doing, boss, retaliated that rough diamond palpably, a bit peeved in response to the foregoing truism. To which cold douche, referring to downfall and so on, the keeper concurred, but nevertheless held to his main view. Who's the best? Troops in the army, the grizzled old veteran irately interrogated, and the best jumpers and racers, and the best admirals and generals we've got. Tell me that. The Irish for choice, retorted the cabby like Campbell, facial blemishes apart. That's right, the old tarpaulin corroborated, the Irish Catholic peasant. He's the backbone of our empire. You know Jim Mullins. While allowing him his individual opinions, as every man... The keeper added he cared nothing for any empire, ours or his, and considered no Irishman worthy of his salt that served it. Then they began to have a few irascible words when it waxed hotter, both, needless to say, appealing to the listeners who followed the passage of arms with interest, so long as they didn't indulge in recriminations and come to blows. From inside information extending over a series of years, Mr. Bloom was rather inclined to poo-poo the suggestion as egregious balderdash, for, pending that consummation devoutly to be or not to be wished for, he was fully cognizant of the fact that their neighbours across the channel, unless they were much bigger fools than he took them for, rather concealed their strength than the opposite. It was quite on a par with the quixotic idea in certain quarters that in a hundred million years the coal seam of the sister island would be played out, and if, as time went on, that turned out to be how the cat jumped, all he could personally say on the matter was that, as a host of contingencies equally relevant to the issue, might occur ere then it was highly advisable in the interim to try to make the most of both countries, even though poles apart. Another little interesting point, the amours of whores and chummies, to put it in common parlance, reminded him Irish soldiers had as often fought for England as against her, more so, in fact. And now, why? So the scene between the pair of them, the licensee of the place rumoured to be or have been Fitzharris, the famous Invincible, and the other, obviously bogus, reminded him forcibly as being on all fours with the confidence trick, supposing, that is, it was prearranged as the looker-on, a student of the human soul, if anything, the others seeing least of the game. And as for the lessee or keeper, who probably wasn't the other person at all, he, 
B, couldn't help feeling, and most properly, it was better to give people like that the goby, unless you were a blithering idiot altogether and refused to have anything to do with them as a golden rule in private life and their felon setting. There'd always been the off chance of a Danny man coming forward and turning Queen's evidence, or King's now, like Dennis or Peter Carey, an idea he utterly repudiated quite apart from that he disliked those careers of wrongdoing and crime on principle. Yet, though such criminal propensities had never been an inmate of his bosom in any shape or form, he certainly did feel, and no denying it, while inwardly remaining what he was, a certain kind of admiration for a man who had actually brandished a knife, cold steel, with the courage of his political convictions, though personally he would never be a party to any such thing, off the same bat as those love vendettas of the South have her or swing for her, when the husband frequently, after some words passed between the two concerning her relations with the other lucky mortal, he having had the pair watched, inflicted fatal injuries on his adored one as a result of an alternative post-nuptial liaison by plunging his knife into her, until it just struck him that fits nicknamed Skin the Goat, merely drove the car for the actual perpetrators of the outrage, and so was not, if he was reliably informed, actually party to the ambush, which, in point of fact, was the plea some legal luminary saved his skin on. In any case, that was very ancient history by now, and as for our friend, the pseudo Skin the etc., he had transparently outlived his welcome. He ought to have either died naturally or on the scaffold high. Like actresses, always farewell, positively last performance, then come up smiling again. Generous to a fault, of course, temperamental, no economizing or any idea of the sort, always snapping at the bone for the shadow. So, similarly, he had a very shrewd suspicion that Mr. Johnny Lever got rid of some pound shillings and pence in the course of his perambulations round the docks, in the congenial atmosphere of the old Ireland tavern, come back to Eden, and so on. Then, as for the other, he had heard not so long before the same identical lingo as he told Stephen how he simply but effectually silenced the offender. He took umbrage at something or other, that much injured but on the whole even-tempered person declared. I let slip. He called me a Jew, and in a heated fashion offensively. So I, without deviating from plain facts in the least, told him his God, I mean Christ, was a Jew too, and all his family like me, though in reality I'm not. That was one for him. A soft answer turns away wrath. He hadn't a word to say for himself, as everyone saw. Am I not right? He turned a long, you are wrong gaze on Stephen of timorous dark pride at the soft impeachment, with a glance also of entreaty, for he seemed to glean in a kind of a way that it wasn't all exactly. Exquibus, Stephen mumbled in a non-committal accent, their two or four eyes conversing. Christus, or Bloom, his name is, or after all any other, Secundum Carnem. Of course, Mr. B. proceeded to stipulate, you must look at both sides of the question. It is hard to lay down any hard and fast rules as to right and wrong, but room for improvement all round there certainly is, though every country, they say, our own distressful included, has the government it deserves, but with a little good will all round. It's all very fine to boast of mutual superiority, but what about mutual equality? I resent violence and intolerance in any shape or form. It never reaches anything or stops anything. A revolution must come on the due installments plan. It's a patent absurdity on the face of it to hate people because they live round the corner and speak another vernacular in the next house, so to speak. Memorable bloody bridge battle and seven minutes war, Stephen assented, between Skinner's Alley and Ormond Market. Yes, Mr. Bloom thoroughly agreed, entirely endorsing the remark, that was overwhelmingly right, and the whole world was full of that sort of thing. You just took the words out of my mouth, he said, a hocus-pocus of conflicting evidence that candidly you couldn't remotely. All those wretched quarrels, in his humble opinion, 
stirring up bad blood from some bump of combativeness or gland of some kind, erroneously supposed to be about a punctilio of honour and a flag, were very largely a question of the money question, which was at the back of everything, greed and jealousy, people never knowing when to stop. They accuse, remarked he audibly. He turned away from the others who probably, and spoke nearer too, so as the others in case they... Jews, he softly imparted in an aside in Stephen's ear, are accused of ruining. Not a vestige of truth in it, I can safely say. History, would you be surprised to learn, proves up to the hilt Spain decayed when the Inquisition hounded the Jews out, and England prospered when Cromwell, an uncommonly able ruffian who in other respects has much to answer for, imported them. Why? Because they are imbued with the proper spirit. They are practical and are proved to be so. I don't want to indulge in any, because you know the standard works on the subject and then orthodox as you are. But in the economic, not touching religion domain, the priest spells poverty. Spain again, you saw in the war, compared with go-ahead America. Turks, it's in the dogma. Because if they didn't believe they'd go straight to heaven when they die, they'd try to live better. At least so, I think. That's the juggle on which the P.P.'s raise the wind on false pretenses. I'm, he resumed with dramatic force, as good an Irishman as that rude person I told you about at the outset. And I want to see everyone, concluded he, all creeds and classes, pro rata, having a comfortable, tidy-sized income, in no niggard fashion either, something in the neighbourhood of three hundred pounds per annum. That's the vital issue at stake, and it's feasible and would be provocative of friendlier intercourse between man and man. At least that's my idea for what it's worth. I call that patriotism. Ubi patria, as we learned, a smattering of in our classical days in alma mater vita bene. Where you can live well, the sense is, if you work. Over his untastable apology for a cup of coffee, listening to this synopsis of things in general, Stephen stared at nothing in particular. He could hear, of course, all kinds of words changing colour, like those crabs about Ring's End in the morning, burrowing quickly into all colours of different sorts of the same sand, where they had a home somewhere beneath, or seemed to. Then he looked up and saw the eyes that said or didn't say the words the voice he heard said, if you work. Count me out, he managed to remark, meaning work. The eyes were surprised at this observation because, as he, the person who owned them pro tem, observed, or rather his voice speaking did, all must work, have to, together. I mean, of course, the other hastened to affirm, work in the widest possible sense, also literary labour, not merely for the kudos of the thing. Writing for the newspapers, which is the readiest channel nowadays, that's work too, important work. After all, from the little I know of you, after all the money expended on your education, you are entitled to recoup yourself and command your price. You have every bit as much right to live by your pen in pursuit of your philosophy as the peasant has. What? You both belong to Ireland, the brain and the brawn. Each is equally important. You suspect, Stephen retorted with a sort of a half-laugh, that I may be important because I belong to the Faubourg Saint Patrice, called Ireland for short. I would go a step farther, Mr. Bloom insinuated. But I suspect, Stephen interrupted, that Ireland must be important because it belongs to me. What belongs? queried Mr. Bloom, bending, fancying he was perhaps under some misapprehension. Excuse me, unfortunately I didn't catch the latter portion. What was it you— Stephen, patently cross-tempered, repeated and shoved aside his mug of coffee, or whatever you like to call it, none too politely, adding, We can't change the country. Let us change the subject. At this pertinent suggestion, Mr. Bloom, to change the subject, looked down but in a quandary, as he couldn't tell exactly what construction to put on belongs to which sounded rather a far cry. The rebuke of some kind was clearer than the other part. Needless to say, the fumes of his recent orgy spoke then with some asperity in a curious, bitter way foreign to his sober state. Probably the home life to which Mr. B. attached the utmost importance had not been all that was needful, or he hadn't been familiarised with the right sort of people. With a touch of fear for the young man beside him, whom he furtively scrutinised with an air of some consternation, 
Remembering he had just come back from Paris, the eyes more especially reminding him forcibly of father and sister. Failing to throw much light on the subject, however, he brought to mind instances of cultured fellows that promised so brilliantly nipped in the bud of premature decay and nobody to blame but themselves. For instance, there was the case of O'Callaghan, for one, the half-crazy faddist, respectably connected, though of inadequate means, with his mad vagaries among whose other gay doings, when rotto and making himself a nuisance to everybody all round, he was in the habit of ostentatiously sporting in public a suit of brown paper. A fact. And then the usual denouement, after the fun had gone on fast and...